Recording in progress. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, day two for September uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting. Before we start off, I'll turn to Executive Director Burden for uh, any comments on the day. So, Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Council members. Um, very nice work yesterday, working through a full agenda. We have a full agenda in general this week. Um, so, encourage you to keep making uh, appropriate progress. Um, other than that, uh, no no uh, remarks this morning, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand the gavel over to uh, Vice Chair Hasmer to start us off on uh, E1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is item agenda item E1, current habitat issues, and I will look to Kerry Griffin to give us the overview. Kerry, it's all yours. Yes, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. This is E1, Habitat Issues. 
the Habitat Committee met for two days this week, uh, yesterday and the day before, and um, considered several uh, agenda items that are on the council's uh, agenda for this week and submitted uh, several reports. But this morning, what you'll hear is the Habitat Committee report, and so that's for items that are not otherwise covered. Um, and we have Dr. Corey Green here who will read the Habitat Committee report for you. Thank you very much, Carrie. Are there questions on the overview? Not seeing any questions, I will ask Dr. Green to come forward. Good morning, Corey. And you know the drill, push the button, turn on the <laughs> mic. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. Uh, I'm Corey Green. Chair of the Habitat Committee, and I'm reading agenda item E1A, Habitat Committee Report on Habitat Issues. The Habitat Committee discussed a number of issues of interest to the Pacific Fishery Management Council. And so here's a bit of a list. The first one is the National Marine Fisheries Service recommends 106.1 million through Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund. Under its Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is recommending 106 million, including 34 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law and 7.5 million from the Inflation Reduction Act to fund state and tribal salmon recovery projects, programs and projects across the West Coast. Funding for 16 new and continuing programs and projects will support conservation efforts in California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska. Application for unallocated funding varies from by state and program. The next item uh, is based on some recent uh, legis um, judicial over oversight of wetlands protections. These were removed from Clean Water Act. The Environmental Protection Agency and Department of the Army issued a final rule on August 29th amending the definition of protected waters of the United States in response to the Supreme Court's May 2023 decision, which narrowly, which narrowed the scope of the Clean Water Act and the agency's ability to regulate waterways and wetlands. The Supreme Court's decision reversed its 2006 decision that set the standard for wetland protection, that a wetland has a significant nexus with a major waterway, such as subsurface connectivity or waters separated by dikes and levees. The decision removes the significant nex nexus test from consideration when identifying tributaries and other waters as federally protected. The EPA has amended the definition of protected waters to include only streams, oceans, rivers, and lakes, and wetlands with a continuous surface connection to major waterways. Effective immediately, more than half of previously regulated wetland acreage and thousands of miles of small streams are no longer regulated under the Clean Water Act. Of note, state regulations related to wetland protection remain in place. Regardless, the implications for habitat protection for salmon are of special concern. The EPA and the Corps of Engineers will host a series of public webinars in September 2023 to provide updates on the definition of waters of the United States. While the webinars have reached Registration capacity, the agency will post a recording of the webinar to the EPA's website. The agency also plans to host listening sessions this fall with co-regulators and stakeholders focused on identifying issues that may arise outside this limited rule to conform the definition of waters of the United States with the Sackett versus EPA decision. And there's more information on the listed website. And we have several items related to uh, Columbia River. Uh, first one is about Columbia Basin mediation. The Federal Mediation and Conciliation Services is leading mediation for parties working to find long-term and durable solutions to restoring salmon populations in the Columbia River Basin while honoring federal commitments to tribal nations, delivering affordable and reliable clean powder, power, and meeting the many resilience needs of regional stakeholders. The mediation process included a stay in litigation among parties to a decades long lawsuit around operations of the federal dams on the Snake and Columbia River so that they could dis discuss solutions balancing dam operations and salmon recovery. 
The parties were granted an additional 60 day pause, see motion to stay in litigation. And the new deadline is October 31st, 2023 to continue discussions around potential solutions. The HC will continue to track this issue. Next item is Lower Columbia River Dredge Material Management Plan, 20 year update. The HC briefed the council on the DMMP in November, noting that the Corps has determined that in-river dredge material disposal sites are nearing capacity and that new disposal sites and strategies are needed for the next 20-year DMMP. The draft environmental impact statement was anticipated in late September of 2023. However, the draft EIS is now anticipated to be completed in December 2023. The HC will continue to monitor EIS development and the opportunity to provide comments. Timing could require implementation of the quick response process if the schedule goes as planned. Next is the Hell's Canyon Hydro Relicensing. The timeline for the Federal, Federal Energy Regulation, Regulatory Commission's completion of a supplemental EIS for the Hell's Canyon Hydro Project, evaluating Idaho Power's project proposal and alternatives remains unknown. The HC will continue to monitor EIS development and the opportunity to provide comments. Again, this one, this timing could re require implementation of a quick response process if it occurs after November. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions on the Habitat Committee report? John North. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Question, just a clarification from um, Dr. Green on that lower Columbia Ridge River dredge material plan. It, does anyone know what the public comment period might be when that comes out? Uh, no, uh, I think there's been talk of either a 60 day or 90 day comment period once it's released, but uh, both, both of the issues are it's, it's it's still unclear a when the when it will come out and b when the what how long the public comment period will be. Thank you. And if I may, yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, second follow up, Dr. Green. Um, on the Hills Canyon EIS is, I guess it's more of a procedural question. I'm I'm still learning, but does the committee need any kind of uh, approval to use the uh, expedited process if that was needed or uh I, i'm perhaps not the best person to uh, um uh, provide that maybe uh someone else can provide some input i'll ask uh, executive director burden to weigh in on that uh, <clears throat> yes thank you mr vice chairman and uh, appreciate the question mr north uh, our quick response process is something we've been using I would say rather extensively since I became ED. Um, and I would, I guess I would suggest that uh, if we're looking at a timeline that um, would, would ask for comments in between a uh, council meeting, that should that come out, I would consult with the uh, chair and vice chair about the appropriateness of a QR letter. And uh, if that does seem appropriate, we would draft one and then circulate it um, to the council for approval or disapproval. Um, if there's a, a, a better way that you would like to see that done, I'm, I'm happy to. But uh, generally, what we require is uh, one person from each state to give approval to that letter. Um, but in between council meetings, is uh, it's a little bit fuzzy sometimes. But that's what I would propose we do. No, that, that sounds great. I just wanted to make sure we didn't get caught uh, in between. But thank you. All right. Thank you. Further questions? on the Habitat Committee report. Not seeing any hands, so thank you, Corey. Thank you very much. That completes our management entity and advisory body reports, public comment. We have none, so that will take us into council discussion on the habitat issues. I'll look and see if there are any hands. Yes, as we heard in the report, there are just uh, two places where there's a potential 
quick response needed. You heard the process there. And I'm not seeing any other hands. So Carrie, anything else we should do here? Well, uh, there's no requested action. And uh, if your discussion is finished, then I think that concludes this agenda item. Thank you very much. So we'll close out this agenda item. And that will move us into agenda item F1, ecosystem management, the uh, ecosystem and climate information progress report. I believe we're going to change a couple of chairs here and we're ahead of schedule. So let's do the musical chairs and we'll get back to business. Sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, you went too fast. I thought I had another 45 minutes. So just let me get my computer going oh. and then I'll launch into this. Go ahead. Just get set up sir, so you are ready. And I will note that uh, Mr. John Ugaritz is with us virtually. He will be online. Okay, thank you for your forbearance. Um, so I'll just read from the situation summary. It's brief uh, and uh, give you a rundown of the reports and so on that you have under this agenda item. So this is initiative four, ecosystem and climate information. It's a progress report. The EWG presented a work plan for this initiative in March of this year, reference to that report. The purpose of this initiative is to develop on-ramps for integrating ecosystem and climate information into council fishery management plan decision-making with a focus on harvest specifications processes. The EWG provided a short update on its work at your June meeting. Again, a reference to that report. Agenda item F1A, EWG report one, re reports on work completed to date. It describes a process for choosing species to receive climate information. FMP, FMP specific ecosystem and climate information on ramps for harvest setting and species specific ecosystem information products. To demonstrate the species selection methodology, uh, that's the first item I mentioned. The EWG provides a proposed process, draft set of criteria, an example application to seven previously identified species. It requests the council to circulate the proposed processing criteria for public review and support of, uh, this is, I think, not quite right. In sort of, it says in support of council adoption in March 2024, but I think actually the EWG is proposing um, formal adoption of that process in September of next year. Uh, to demonstrate potential ecosystem information products, that's the third thing I mentioned. The report includes a risk assessment matrix uh, or 
I think the EWGS started calling it a rubric, and it uh, has a demonstration application to two ground fish species, petrali sole and sable fish. Um, and, and those, I, I'll just say on an aside, those uh, applications in the form of risk assessment tables are in uh, the EWG supplemental report two. The council should decide whether to use these evaluations as part of finalizing harvest specifications for these two species at the November council meeting. Uh, in its report, the EWG also provides additional recommendations on topics for workshops. Uh, the, the Nature Conservancy has offered to sponsor with the council. Um, and it also lays out an updated schedule for initiative completion. And I guess I'll just extemporize in terms of that second to last thing in terms of the, uh, I guess we're, they're jointly sponsored by the Nature Conservancy and, the, and you, the council. Um, that uh, the Ms. Gway Kirchner uh, with the Nature Conservancy organized a steering committee. Uh, we met a couple times, um, made some progress on coming up with some logistical and um, substantive aspects of potential workshops. There's a, um, a letter in your public comment under this agenda item from the Nature Conservancy that that outlines uh, some of the ideas in terms of timing and location of the workshops and uh, potential topics, a sort of very preliminary conceptual agenda for, for those workshops. So um, just to let you know, and I also was asked, the um, EWG took a look at that letter and that proposal on there. They had a webinar meeting um, last week on Tuesday, and they just want to let you know they um, endorsed the ideas that are presented in that letter from the Nature Conservancy. So that's that. Um, I guess running down, you have a number of advisory body reports. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if I can recite them from memory, but um, I will try to work through them. So you have a report from your ecosystem advisory sub panel. And uh, there is our reports from both of your two CPS advisory bodies, both of your groundfish advisory bodies, and the um, Habitat, Habitat Committee um, as well. And if I missed anybody, uh, I'm sure you will correct me. Um, I guess uh, I'd also mention, since I mentioned one of the public comment letters, there's also a second public comment letter in there just to for the good of the order, just to mention that, that's a, a letter from a group of NGOs with some uh, recommendations and ideas around this initiative. So with that, just the council action here, uh, such as it is, is council discussion and guidance as appropriate. So that concludes my overview. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. Dahl on the overview for this agenda item? And I'm not seeing any questions. So we will first turn to the two ecosystem work group reports, and we have a presentation from Yvonne de Rainier here. Good morning, Yvonne. When your presentation comes up, you can go ahead and start. There it is. Good morning. Mr. Chair, members of the council, thank you. So, uh, as you can see on the screen, we'll be working on agenda item F1. This is initiative four. It's got a rather long formal name, ecosystem and climate information for fish stocks, fisheries, and fishery management plans. So we tend to just call it initiative four. Uh, next slide, please. I'll be working from the two ecosystem workgroup reports in your briefing book, the first and larger one. Uh, we sent to the briefing book in early August, so you've probably had a good while to look at that. And then the second one we sent to your supplemental report deadline, so that's been available for about two weeks, I think. Next slide, please. 
You may recall that your fishery ecosystem plan, you began working on it in 2010, finally adopting it in 2013. And between 2012 and the present, you've had annual ecosystem status reports from the Northwest and Southwest Fishery Science Centers. You have, on the policy end of things, conducted three ecosystem initiatives, which are an invention of this council, and uh, they address policy questions across your multiple fish stocks and fisheries and fishery management plans. And in recent years, finally finishing in 2022, you updated your fishery ecosystem plan based a lot on the information that you learned through the ecosystem status reports and your ecosystem initiatives. And we only recently begun initiative four. Next slide, please. The uh, purpose of the initiative is to look at incorporating ecosystem and climate information into your harvest setting and fisheries management processes to determine the need and appropriate timing for additional fisheries management plan specific ecosystem and climate information and where there's a need for the additional information, develop some clear pathways or on ramps for that information to be used in the setting of scientific uncertainty and harvest policy. Next slide, please. In our main report, you'll see that we've broken the initiative down into a few um, tasks, if you will. And the first task is to draft species selection criteria for the process. So what does that mean? Uh, going forward into the future, if you have species or stocks that you want to have considered under the initiative for treatment, um, you will not just call out the names of those stocks and tell us to make it so. Um, you will go through a process of figuring out, well, we will, and then we'll report to you and you can decide. <laughs> um, go through a process of figuring out what kind of scientific information is available, how important are those stocks to different fishing communities, um, and what where we are in the stock substance processes, what type of council authority do you have? And the species draft species selection criteria is discussed in section two of our report and is provided in a table form in Appendix A. And we presented a draft of those criteria in a list form to you in March. We had a lot of really good comments from advisory bodies and we revised those criteria according to the comments of the advisory bodies and present them to you at this meeting. And we are recommending that you um, send those out for public review before the March council meeting and with any modifications you may make at this meeting, make them final in March. We then took seven species that, uh, that you had discussed and um, that also we knew would be familiar to different people across the different fishery management plans. Um, some of the species in our FMPs are relatively unknown, sometimes to people who work on those FMPs, sometimes to people across the FMPs. But the seven species, one of which is this particular salmon stock, um, should be familiar to most people in the council process. And we applied those uh, species selection criteria in an example to those seven species in Appendix B. So that's... Um, a useful suite of information gathered on those seven species. Next slide, please. And I, I think I just said what I should have said. Uh, so at any rate, uh, those are the seven species shown. Um, let's see, sardine, Klamath River Falls Chinook, Sablefish, Petrolli Sole, Pacific Whiting, Boccaccio, Rockfish, and uh, albacore. Next slide, please. So the next big question is, um, more on the policy side, what is the appropriate timing and where are the pathways where ecosystem and climate information can be incorporated into the harvest setting process under a coastal pelagic species, ground fish, and salmon fishery management plans. Since you do not set uh, the harvest levels for the highly migratory species, um, you had early on excluded those from this initiative. Next slide, please. So we have these, uh, these new diagrams of the um, management processes for ground fish, salmon, and coastal pelagic species. And we particularly asked the advisory bodies early on in our report to look at these diagrams, think about the 
with their applicability to their fishery management plans and to look at those red arrows, which we're calling um, information on ramps. So there are times in the uh, management process when new information on the ecosystem and climate might come into the council process. So for example, if you look at uh, groundfish, the red arrow in the bottom right of that circle, uh, we could use ecosystem and climate information during your stock assessment prioritization process. So if you were to be looking at a suite of species possibly up for stock assessment renewal or for new stock assessments, you might also consider is there or isn't there new scientific information on the effects of the ecosystem and climate on this species? So that would help you perhaps choose um, where to put those species higher or lower in your prioritization. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, ecosystem and climate information could also be brought into the stock assessment itself and our stock assessment authors and our STAR panel and SSC review are usually uh, quite able to consider where and when that might work into the stock assessment itself. And um, so that would not, that is an information on ramp, but that would probably not be part of the initiative for treatment. And then the third red arrow for groundfish is uh, you could consider increasing or reducing the ABC and or informing the annual catch limit for groundfish species uh, once the stock assessment has been completed, but uh, using perhaps different ecosystem and climate information uh, or new information that might not have come up in the stock assessment. Next slide, please. Coastal pelagic species has a few more red arrows because we have a little bit of a um, sort of one year, two year process with the CPS. Some species are on a two year cycle, some on a one year and there's regular check-ins. So you'll see similar to groundfish, I won't work through all of the red arrows, but you'll see similar to groundfish, there are um, a variety of different opportunities for bringing ecosystem and climate information into the CPS process. And um, I wanna, thank the CPS management team and advisory panel in advance. I haven't fully read your reports, but, um, and thank also the groundfish management team and the GAP both for reading and listening to the reports, but uh, this initiative, like all the others, is really run on um, careful and conscious engagement from the advisory body, so appreciation for that. The third, uh, next slide, please. The third diagram is for the salmon management cycle. And that is a one year cycle, as you know. And there are several inf opportunities for bringing ecosystem and climate information into the salmon cycle. <clears throat> and uh, we're already working on that right now with some of the um, salmon stoplight tables that you've seen in the past. So those red arrows are detailed there for salmon. And um, we are farther along on the species selection criteria process than we are on the on-ramp categorization process. So if other advisory bodies are not meeting until after this council meeting or wanna have an opportunity following this council meeting to talk to us more about the on-ramps and where they might and might not occur or where they might not be preferred, um, we are certainly open to hearing more comments later. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so then our, uh, first report concludes on page 28 with Appendix C, which is a risk classification table or risk classification rubric to, uh, that we're drafting across all species. We had given you a draft of this in March and you had asked, and if you look at the table, uh, the it was initially based on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council's table and um, they had, I think, four or five levels with the, the highest level for them being normal, and then um, three or four levels of increasingly uh, depressing levels of effects of the environment on their stocks. And in March, you had asked us to have a level one that was sort of, what if the environment is above or better than normal? So, um, so now we've got, we have, uh, normal at level two and level one better than normal for that species or stock. And then um, levels three and four for greater levels of concern for the stock. Uh, next slide, please. 
Then if you look at our uh, supplemental report, risk evaluation tables for trolley sole and sablefish. In this report, we provide tables C2 and C3. So that those are an application of this last page of our first report, an application of that evaluation rubric to what we know about petroleum sole and sable fish. So it's a lot of good information about how uh, we think the environment, the ecosystem, the climate uh, is affecting the petroleum sole and sable fish stocks. And um, we know that where it's already been part of the stock assessment, stock assessment authors have taken that into consideration. So this is information that is sort of in addition to or beyond the stock assessment, um, what, what's already in the stock assessment and includes a summary of stock assessment considerations. And again, this is based on a North Pacific model. So in section three of our first report, we give you some other ideas to think about if you decide you don't like the risk evaluation tables or you want some other process, then we've got a couple of other thoughts in section four of our main report. Next slide, please. So uh, we've had a lot of wondering speculation. Can we use the information in our supplemental report for your uh, 25, 26 ground fish harvest specifications and a management measures process um, if you want to? And so we're leaving that entirely up to you. It, it's, uh, you know, the information in our supplemental report is good and uh, has scientific backing behind it, but you may not have time in your process to have it reviewed through the SSC. The SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee is scheduled to meet on September 21st, and they'll be looking at these then and will let us know what they think about the tables themselves and about the whole process. So that might put a wrench in the works and um, then the SSC will decide whether to uh, whether to recommend these be part of your management process or not. But we still don't have a firm, um, we're not recommending, for example, increase your sable fish harvest by 0.23% because of onshore transport or something something like that. Um, we're just suggesting um, that you consider using this information in a way that I think the CPSMT may have suggested uh, for, uh, it might've been Pacific Sardine a year or so ago, just suggesting that um, the conditions in the ecosystem are good for both um, sablefish and petroleum sole. And so perhaps you can be a little less worried than you might normally be for those species. So with that, I want to move back to uh, next slide, please. The, our original report, we have um, workshop topic suggestions for the Nature Conservancy, um, beginning on page nine of our report, section five. I think uh, given, depending on what you do with Appendix A and the species selection criteria, I might want to strongly emphasize our first bullet. Um, you know, workshops for a couple of different large species groups might be a way to sort of get out a lot of information about a lot of species all at once. Um, but we also have other recommendations for uh, work to be done in those workshops. And I will say that our recommendations came out before the Nature Conservancy's letter came out. So um, I don't know whether they were responding to us or we're responding to them, but in this in our August report, we were acting without knowing what they were going to propose. So, and then um, on page 10, we have section six, the next steps for this initiative. Um, and again, these were written uh, and submitted in early August. We want time to consult with your advisory bodies to make sure that um, the processes that we've described make sense from their perspective. And um, as I, the last bullet emphasizes, we're looking for you to um, review the risk tables and uh, review the, the uh, species selection criteria. Um, next slide, please. Oh, 
this is sorry. So uh, we were expecting some blowback from you in uh, September through November period, and then have a lot of conversation in, with other advisory bodies in November through March, and then a final decision from you in March on the species selection criteria. Next slide, please. So then just to close and remind you, because uh, we try to be tidy, um, on page two of our main report, you will see that we have our um, request for guidance and our recommendations for this meeting. So when you're getting your um, comments and motion together, it would be great if you would take a look at those and think about um, sort of what recommendations you might have. And I think that's my last slide. Yes. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Yvonne. Are there questions on either of the ecosystem work group reports? I'm going to. And online, John Yurguritz. John, please go ahead. Thanks. And since this is the first time I'm speaking, just pause for a quick mic check. Perfectly clear. Thank you. And thanks, Yvonne, for the reports. And I appreciate the overview. I just realized in your slideshow that I have a question about the on-ramp uh, figures. And I'm wondering if there is a meaning to the direction of the red arrows, because what I'm just noticing is that for ground fish, they appear to be on-ramps into the process. And for the other two groups, they appear to be off-ramps. and. I, I just don't know if that's a matter of just how they were drawn or if there's a meaning to those directions. Uh, I think the red arrows are intended to move in the forward direction, forward in time, and they have no meaning beyond that. So if you look, for example, at groundfish and at CPS, you will see um, on the right-hand side a little black triangle that pushes the year forward. And then on the left-hand side, there's another little black triangle that pushes the year, the, the next year forward. Same with CPS. So um, it is a uh, liberty of the graphic designer. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Yvonne. Um, and thanks to the EWG for the reports. Uh, there's a lot in there and it's really appreciated. Um, one question I had when thinking through this and what we're trying to do here, the species selection criteria, think about how that comes together. And um, I was wondering if you could explain to me its relationship with like climate vulnerability assessments. I'm thinking about how we're not reinventing the wheel here. And I saw that the CVAs were cited in that. So clearly you thought about them, but I'm just looking for a little bit more information about how we can put those two things together. Um, and then also a little bit more background if you have it. I know in the past, the climate vulnerability assessments um, were talked about by NIMS as something that could be used specifically for this. Uh, it took quite a bit of time um, to get those to the point where the recently published one um, may have limited applicability and use by the council, which is a whole nother problem. Um, so as we think about this, is this helping solve that timing problem there? Um, hopefully that was clear. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so let's see. So in uh, Appendix A, we have the species selection criteria and uh, I think it was under ecological considerations or was it sign? I'm sorry for not remembering. Um, oh, yes. So under, so under ecological considerations, we have the question of what was the species rank under the climate vulnerability assessments? So we have these uh, recently published climate vulnerability assessments for all these different council-managed species. Um, and we've had 
for several years, the Crozier et al. on uh, salmon vulnerability assessments. And so this is just a quick check-in um, as one of many considerations under ecological considerations. Where does the species rank under the climate vulnerability assessment? And you'll see um, in the ecological considerations portion of Appendix B, which appears on pages 20 and 21, that each species, there's a note as to its uh, climate vulnerability. So that should just be shorthand for you so that you don't necessarily have to go back to the CVA to find that species. You'll just know is this um, highly uh, exposed and highly vulnerable, uh, medium level of exposure and vulnerability low. So, so I think it's a, it's a good quick use of the climate vulnerability assessment. Thank you. Further questions? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Juan. Good to see you. Thanks to the EWG for the great report. Um, I am looking at the salmon um, diagram and thinking about the process. Uh, let me, well, my, my thoughts are in the area North Falcon, so. Um, although it might apply to South Falcon as well. But I'm thinking about the process for doing the preseason forecasts for our stocks in that area, thinking about um, the number of management entities that uh, do those pre provide those preseason forecasts to the STT at their meeting, at their February meeting, that's generally in the I think it's third week of third week of February when the SDT meets, and probably up to twenty entities, tribal and state, bring those preseason forecasts to the SDT for inclusion in the preseason one document. Um, much different than how we do ground fish or CPS or, um, and so I'm, and then I, I'm looking here and uh, acknowledging that I'm, haven't spent a lot of time studying this yet. Um, but in March it has EWG presents species rankings there. Um, and uh, then it also has a role for the EWG presenting the uh, risk table candidate species in September. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how, given the number of independent and um, jurisdiction, well, entities, management entities that do the preseason forecasts, for the various salmon stocks that are contained in the FMP, where, how we, how the EWG integrates and does, performs at least those two activities, uh, uh, given the, com say, complexity of, in terms of the management entities that bring preseason salmon forecasts into the council process. So I think there's a question in there, um, but I'm just trying to think about salmon and how how all this fits together. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, um, through the chair. So uh, I think I can speak for the whole EWG and say that we do not wish to become deeply enmeshed in the salmon management cycle. And uh, nor do we wish to become one of the 20 entities, 20 plus entities who are um, presenting the STT with information. Our preference would be to um, the species rankings uh, refers to um, the species selection criteria. So at, in March, you would choose whether you want to have a new salmon stock uh, be subject to the initiative for treatment. So that's just a council decision for going forward. Do you want to think more about this stock and have it receive the initiative for treatment? 
And then in September, we would start to talk with the STT and the SSC about what kind of information is available and, and uh, either um, for salmon, since we have been working with the stoplight tables for several years now, um, they may or may not want to use risk evaluation tables. They may want to continue with the stoplight tables and and uh, the stoplight tables could lead into risk evaluation tables, but that may not be what the salmon management process is interested in. And then ultimately, hopefully we would be able to um, work with the science centers to have some sort of automated report on ecosystem conditions available to all of the salmon management process early in the calendar year so that as these 20 plus entities are thinking about their recommendations, they would also have that information available to think about. And something like that, I think, goes on in an informal way right now. The um, salmon information from the ecosystem status report goes out to uh, salmon managers and salmon scientists in that sort of January, February period and sort of a preview of the March ecosystem status report. So um, I think we would just want to, for salmon perhaps, um, make the informal process that now occurs um, more formal and apparent. Phil? I do think um, that there's a lot of value to be, to be had uh, from the work that's being done, particularly in the various categories that make up the stoplight table or if there's some other format to bring that information forward, make it available to those entities that are doing the forecasts um, and maybe formalizing that or, or making something that's more explicit about how they can gain access to that information when they're doing their preseason forecasts would be, would be valuable. So, all right, at least an initial discussion about how all that might work. Thanks. Thank you. Further questions on the EWG reports? No hands? Thank you, Yvonne. That will take us into our management entity advisory body reports. Um, just to give everyone a heads up, we'll start with the ecosystem advisory subpanel report. Gwei Kirshner is here for that. Um, that report will be followed by the uh, uh, CPSMT report. Good morning, Gwei. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Commissioners, for the record, my name is Gwei Kirchner, co-chair of the Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel. Today, I'll be reading from agenda item F1A, Supplemental EAS Report. The Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel met to discuss the progress reports provided by the Ecosystem Work Group on the status of the Ecosystem and Climate Information Initiative. We commend the EWG for providing a path forward to better link environmental drivers and the socioeconomic success of our coastal fishing communities, including climate sensitive species and would like to offer the following comments. In general, we felt there were two concepts being conflated. One, setting informed harvest limits based on environmental drivers. And two, identifying those stocks where nimble management could increase fish stock and fishery success. These two points have different response timeframes with one being part of the normal cycle of stock assessments and two being on a shorter time scale than the current ass assessment cycle. Inclusion of risk tables via the proposed framework may be too slow to adapt to rapid environmental change. Overall, the EAS felt that a key outcome of initiative four should be using the California current ecosystem science to inform Pacific Fishery Management Council fishery management decisions for the species stocks, species complexes that are more vulnerable or more likely to be impacted by oceanographic forecasts. 
related indicators would benefit from additional monitoring by council advisory bodies throughout the year, including when there are opportunities for potential management adjustments as appropriate. The analyses in the annual ecosystem status report increasingly link fisheries to the socioeconomic livelihood of our coastal communities, which are an integral part component of council decision making. We recommend that council use initiative four to pilot approaches that improve the nimbleness of council to respond to interannual variability and long term climate trends. The EWG asked for input from advisory bodies on the selection criteria for species that would be a focus for providing ecosystem and climate information within associated management processes. The EAS felt that the two key driving criteria in the selection methodology are the ecological considerations and social and economic considerations. Council authority seems like a prerequisite for choosing any species rather than a selection criterion for choosing a particular species. We also noted the following concerns. By choosing only species or stocks for which we have the most scientific knowledge, which is the scientific considerations criterion, climate sensitive stocks with limited data could be overlooked. An over ambitious and complicated risk table development and review process could result in a crushing workload. Conversely, only examining a low number of species could be insufficient to encompass climate sensitive taxa. It is possible that some risk assessments could result in continuous effort and risk table generation. Imagine you're running on a hamster wheel that you might not be able to get off, creating infinite work and focus on one species. It is our understanding that risk tables are intended to inform harvest setting or management measures with relevant and timely species or stock specific environmental trend information. However, there are trade offs associated with the inclusion of additional data or information that in introduces or increases uncertainty. And it should be noted that including climate and ecosystem information is no exception. The EAS also emphasizes the value of fishermen's on the water information and experience and the possible role of risk tables as an opportunity to incorporate that firsthand knowledge or other qualitative information into this process. Describing how the use of risk tables could influence socioeconomic outcomes within the actual risk tables could help the council understand the trade offs of using those risk tables. The annual ESR presents a number of fishing community related metrics that could support a more proactive approach in the risk assessment context and inform the equitable distribution of positive and negative outcomes across communities and stakeholders. Recognizing there is inherent risk associated with employing the methodology, the EAS suggests the council use of SSC endorsed petroleum and sable fish risk tables as a pilot process as part of the 2025 to 2026 harvest specifications. The idea is to test the use of risk tables through the existing process to facilitate a discussion about how they could be used and maybe modified or improved and identify the kinds of information that would be most helpful for council decision making. The intent is that the tables would be informative, but not affect harvest setting or management measures unless and until the council decides whether and how they would like to use them in future management cycles. Additionally, using historical or hindcast approaches to identify when a risk table action would have occurred would allow the council to evaluate how such tools can support climate robust fishery management. With the availability of IRA funding, there is a significant opportunity to develop this initiative and increase dedicated capacity. In particular, funding could be used to develop a council operating procedure in terms of reference and third party review. Additional funding could build and convene a multidisciplinary team required and outlined in the EWG F1A supplemental report composed of ecological ecologists, survey scientists, ecosystem modelers, stock assessors, and physiologists. To address the concerns expressed in this report, we propose that number one, taxa could be grouped by niche 
or and or climate oceanographic sensitivities as part of an initial evaluation to identify on ramps for multiple species in one analysis and reduce the number of risk assessments needed. Two, the EWG's proposed ground fish and coastal pelagic species selection process could be made more efficient by integrating it into the existing stock assessment prioritization process rather than creating a new process. Three, risk tables could be considered intermediaries that lead to A, inclusion in stock assessments if appropriate, and B, used to identify what environmental drivers would be considered triggers to evaluate whether mid-year management modifications may be necessary. Four, IRA funds are sought and leveraged to A, develop a council operating procedure focused on increasing the climate resilience of council managed species or stocks, and B, convening and building an interdisciplinary team dedicated to the risk assessment process. Five, Petrali sole and sablefish are used as test cases to evaluate the efficacy of the risk tables, potentially coupled with hindcast analysis of these or other species or stocks. And six, a risk reward approach is embraced to explicitly link risk table approaches to socioeconomic impacts, including benefits to coastal economies and people. The above suggestions could be an outcome of a risk assessment existing stock assessment, part of the on-ramping on approach, and or a topic for the Nature Conservancy workshops. This integration would reduce the workload while generating a product that will eventually link all stocks evaluated to variables within the ESR. Finally, the EAS is encouraged that the Council is leading the effort to increasingly incorporate environmental drivers into management and improving our nimbleness and responsiveness to climate change. This provides the mechanism to take the amazing work presented in the annual ESR into more healthy and resilient fishing stocks, fishing communities, and coastal economies. Thank you, Goy. Are there questions on the Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel Report? Frank Lockhart. Thank you, Goy, and the EAS for the... <coughs> For the report, you packed a lot into three uh, pages. Um, on the first page in the first section, just before you get on to species selection criteria and risk tables, you say, we recommend the council use initiative for the pilot approaches that approve the nimbleness of the council to respond to internal variability and long-term climate trends. Um, I'm wondering, did, did you guys talk about an example? Uh, uh, you know about how what do you mean by that what would if you had like a concrete example one species one process how what would that look like thank you mr vice chair mr lockhart so i don't think we really developed like an example that was very species focused but what we looked at is um with the idea of becoming more nimble to respond to changes if you're monitoring um, indicators throughout the year and you see a, a, something happening with an indicator, it's looking better, it's looking not as good, that you could use that information to inform um, actions throughout the year. For example, in season, right? It could be uh, something that could help inform an in season action um, if you see, like, like I said, an indicator looking better or an indicator looking not as good as you had anticipated. All right, thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Lynn Mattis. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Ms. Kirchner, in the uh, risk table application piece, the discussion about um, this being a, the risk tables could be a pilot project to test um, how they could be improved all that stuff. Was there any indication of who would be doing that work? I know the GMT is already overprescribed when it comes to harvest specifications and management measures. Um, and it says the council use, um, the people around this table aren't the ones who do the analysis. Uh, so I was just wondering if you had an idea of who would be doing that work. Thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer, um, Ms. Mattis. We did not discuss like who the actual appropriate people are to do that work. I think that, um, probably discussion needed 
by more than just the, the EAS to figure that out? Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Vice Chair. And then sort of a, a, a follow-up related. Um, I know ODFW staff, and I suspect the GMT have already been given guidance by NIMS about being very um, strategic and narrow focused on this current specs, um, 25, 26 spec cycle in terms of not adding a bunch of new things, very much focusing on the harvest specifications. Has there been any, any feedback from that part of NIMS on how this might be incorporated and affect that process that you know of? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, um, Ms. Mattis. Um, we we certainly did not talk talk with NIMS um, about it, and really, I think I would say we're we're responding to uh, the idea that these risk tables potentially be used fully in management in 2025 and 2026. And um, I. I would say it was the feeling of the group that they're not ready for that, but that this could be a good opportunity to see how a risk table could respond in a man in a management cycle um, and kind of put it through a test, but not not fully implement it and impact fisheries with it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification and I really appreciate the reference to a hamster wheel just for you. <laughs> Thank you. Further questions? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Gway. Thanks to the EAS for this report. Um, at the, in your conclusions, conclusion number two, uh, the EWU's proposed groundfish and CPS selection process could be made more efficient by integrating into the existing stock assessment prioritization process rather than creating a new process. Um, staying on the theme of not reinventing wheels. Um, could you provide a little bit more background uh, if the EAS had a discussion or ideas about how that could be done? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Ms. Ridings, um, yeah, wheels were a constant theme in our discussion. Um, but uh, I, th I think what we were thinking there is that we already have this um, pretty involved process to pick stocks for stock assessment. And this could be one more piece of information, one more maybe column in the giant spreadsheet. Maybe it takes more than, you know, maybe a couple of columns in the giant spreadsheet that could go in to help inform that process. Um, so you're looking at the kind of the bigger picture of stock assessment prioritization. Thank you. Uh, Executive Director Burden. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and good morning, Gwe. Um, I'm looking at a section of the EAS report. There's a paragraph right before Inflation Reduction Act funding. And uh, the concept in that paragraph, uh, I guess, resonates with me a bit. The idea of taking a process, in this case, uh, key, you're keying in on the 25, 26 harvest specifications, and then testing and saying, how would it look if we integrated the risk tables into that process? What would it look like? Um, so that concept makes sense to me, but then I back up and I think, okay, Kelly and I just worked through a ground fish workload exercise with our ground fish people. And as we go through our stock assessment process and our specs process, those folks are somewhere on the order of 160% of their time. So the crushing workload uh, is a terminology that's also in here. And I think we're at that point. So uh, did the EAS take any time to think about what, what would it look like or would there be any benefits or drawbacks to doing a hind cast and saying, all right, let's get through the 25, 26 process. And then pause and say, what would it have looked like had we tried this at that time? So that folks have a bit of a breather and they have the headspace to, to do that work. Thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer, Director Burden. Um, so we did, and and I'll have to say, initially in the statement, um, the paragraph read, read instead of additionally using high casts, that you could alternatively use hind casts to to do a similar a similar look um, at how the risk tables would have worked in previous years. 
So I think I, I in our discussion, I think we thought that was um, an almost equally good way to try to evaluate um, the risk tables and how they might work in the future. All right, thank you. Further questions? Not seeing any hands, so thank you, Gwei. Next, we'll have the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team report. That will be followed by the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel. For the management team, we have Kirk Lynn online. Kirk, the uh, microphone is yours. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Good morning. I'll be reading from Supplemental CPSM to Report 1. The Coastal Plastic Species Management Team, in general, supports the processes as described by the Ecosystem Workgroup Report on the Ecosystem and Climate Information Initiative regarding species selection and criteria, risk evaluation, and the proposed timeline for Council review and implementation. However, there are several sections in the report that were not clear and the team recommends appropriate revisions as follows. In Appendix A, selection criteria for choosing species stocks and groups to receive ecosystem and climate information under the ecological considerations and social and economic considerations criteria, <clears throat> the high, medium, and low categories are assigned corresponding likelihoods ranging from very high to low. A fuller explanation of what these likelihoods refer to and perhaps what they're based on with the metrics used to determine each likelihood category would be helpful. In Appendix B, applying selection criteria to sample species, stocks, and groups for the criteria scientific, ecological, and social and economic considerations, describing that the high, medium, and low levels represent the degree to which the species, stock, or group fit each criteria and clarify the tables. For starting in albacore under the scientific considerations table, high but mixed is used. This term should be defined as well. In addition, the rationale for starting classification under scientific considerations appears to be cut off in mid-sentence, and the species name for Japanese starting should be corrected to Sardinops melanostictus. Appendix C, table C1, the risk classification rubric, the level one above or better than normal row was added to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council's risk classification table per council direction. In the NPFMC, the risk table is used to qualitatively evaluate the range of concerns for three types of considerations, scientific, ecological, and social and economic, against known information that is not modeled analytically in the stock assessment. Clarification is requested on how a level one determination differs from a level two normal in relation to providing additional insight into risk in the decision making process outside of formal stock assessment related considerations. Specifically, the team would like to see more detail in the rubric on what factors for any given species would lead to a risk classification that would be used to consider increasing harvest allowances under the level one classification. The team also sees benefit in further discussing this initiative with the EWG between the September 2023 and the March 2024 Council meeting. The focus of this future meeting would be the CPS ecosystem and climate information on ramps used in harvest setting as depicted in the schematic for a potential process in Figure 2 of the EWG report. Additional topics could include risk classification as a C, other possible ways to use ecosystem and climate information, potential workshop topics and workload and scheduling issues. These topics could also be taken up as part of the proposed workshops that may be jointly supported by the council and the Nature Conservancy. That concludes our report. Thank you, Kirk. Are there questions for Mr. Lynn on the management team report? And I don't see any hands, so thank you again. You're welcome. Next, we'll have the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report. That will be followed by the GMT report for the CPSAS report. Anna Weinstein is online. Anna, the microphone is yours. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Council Members. I'm Anna Weinstein, uh, representing the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel, here to read our report on Ecosystem Work Group uh, report on the Ecosystem and Climate Information Initiative. The CPSAS appreciates the opportunity to comment on the Ecosystem Workgroup's report. 
Our responses to the EWG specific requests are as follows. Section two, species selection process and section three, FMP specific timelines and on-ramps for ecosystem and climate information used in harvest setting processes. Our comment is the species selection process in section two looks sound, including the schedule for public review in the coming months and final adoption in March, 2024. Section three, figure two, showing FMP specific entry points for information is a good start on a complex CPS FMP with different management schedules for different species. Figure two needs inclusion of the central sub subpopulation of Northern anchovy according to the schedule and council operating procedure nine. We also note we have questions about how the risk tables would complement or improve opportunities for introducing ecosystem information to the harvest specifications process for CPS that, that already exists in CPS specifications. We wish to ensure existing FMP specifications processes and the proposed risk tables are properly reconciled and avoid duplication in the use of ecosystem and climate information. In some CPSAS is ready to work with, with the management team and the EWG after this council meeting to discuss FMP specific timelines and on-ramps for ecosystem and climate specific information and the appropriate incorporation of uncertainty and risk into existing harvest setting processes for CPS. Appendix A, selection criteria for choosing species stocks and groups to receive ecosystem and climate information. We support Appendix A and appreciate the inclusion of ecological considerations as a key criteria for the council in prioritizing species and groups of species as we requested in our prior reports on this initiative. Appendix B, selection criteria applied to seven species. We recommend the EWG and Council consider if and how climate-driven rain, climate rain shifts should be added to the ecological as well as social and economic considerations criteria. For ecological considerations, the Climate Vulnerability Assessment, um, McClure et al. 2023, cited in EWG Report 1, found that CPS is one of the two species groups, along with HMS, most likely to change distribution in response to climate change. Many seabird and marine mammal species are central place foragers tied to Channel Islands and Farallon Islands in breeding season. We expect CPS rain shifts in response to changed ocean temperature and productivity to affect the productivity and population trajectory of these predators. For social and economic considerations, we note the sardine live bait fishery centered in Southern California and the major CPS ports and processing operations are in Central and Southern California. The dramatic rain shifts uh, for CPS predicted in the uh, 2023 Climate Vulnerability Assessment refer reference in the EWG Report 1 will impact fishers and dependent economies. This is an example where fisher and industry knowledge should be more explicitly integrated into this initiative to identify areas of risk and flexibility to better preserve the well-being of ecological and socioeconomic values and endpoints. That's, that concludes my report. I'd be our report. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Are there any questions? Frank Lockhart. Thanks, Anna, for the report and the uh, work of the uh, CPSAS. Uh, my question is in the middle of your section, uh, of your report on section two, right up at the front. I'm not quite sure what the, the middle sentence means in the middle there. We know we have questions about how the risk tables would complement or improve opportunities for yes. introducing ecosystem yes. information to the harvest specs process. Yes. And here's the part where that I don't understand. For CPS that may already exist in CPS specifications, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to tease out there. Could you explain a little bit more about what that is getting at? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Lockhart. Um, yes, uh, I also agree that um, we didn't. That sentence d definitely needed some er clarification, editing. But I think I can answer your overall question there. That that sentence and that actual second half of that paragraph refers to. So we had a robust discussion in our in our. Um, advisory body meeting about how um, this eco climate ecosystem information, like, like we say, will be reconciled with existing opportunities. Um, you know, under the CPS framework management, there uh, are a number of opportunities through, you know, uh, the annual specification of harvest guidelines, ACLs, ACTs, as well as sort of continuous review, um, the directed by the, the uh, FMP and the safe document for CPS stocks. So, there's different opportunities and routine under the point of concern framework, socioeconomic um, 
checkpoints uh, and there's, you know, under point of concern, there's four types of actions uh, where climate and uh, ecosystem information could be integrated to modify without going through an FMP amendment process. So the point of our discussion and kind of highlighting this, and this was touched on in other MT and, and you know, advisory body reports, was, um, you know, there are, and with the ground fish discussion, um, there are uh, opportunities that exist um, through routine and point of concern and socioeconomic um, uh, you know, uh, area parts of our FMPs. And so um, how will those opportunities uh, be taken advantage of for integrating this information? And what, you know, what additional ways are needed through this climate and communities initiative? So sorry, that was a little long winded, but I hope clarifies. And yes, we apologize for that unclear sentence. Thank you, that, it, that helped. Thank you. Further questions? on the advisory sub panel report. And I'm not seeing any hands here. Thank you, Anna. Next, we'll have the groundfish management team report that will be followed by the groundfish advisory sub panel report. And finally, the habitat committee, I'll just let everyone know, we'll be taking a short break after our reports are finished. So back to the groundfish management team report, we have Dr. Kate Richardson with us. Good morning, Dr. Richardson. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. For the record, my name is Kate Richardson and I will be reading from agenda item F1A, supplemental GMT report one, the groundfish management team report on the ecosystem and climate information initiative. The Groundfish Management Team reviewed the Ad Hoc Ecosystem Workgroup Report on the Ecosystem and Climate Information Initiative and Draft Risk Assessment Tables. The EWG requested advisory body feedback on the fishery management plan specific figures illustrating the timing and potential points of inclusion or on-ramps for ecosystem and climate information with the aim of formalizing the process within the FMP specific council operating procedures. The GMT thinks that figure one of agenda item F1A is useful for understanding potential groundfish on ramps and could inform a new COP. However, the red arrow in June, stock assessment prioritization final preferred action, does not seem to align at the point at which ecosystem information would be introduced to inform stock assessment prioritization if that is the intent of the red arrow. This information would ideally come in at the even year March council meeting to be considered during the stock assessment prioritization preliminary preferred action. The GMT also notes that the figure may not include all entry points and does not currently evaluate the relative challenges with each. The GMT anticipates that as we gain experience with incorporating ecosystem and climate information into the groundfish harvest setting process, the COP may require additional modification. The GMT appreciates the EWG request to meet before the November 2023 council meeting. The GMT thinks that meeting with the EWG and the Groundfish Advisory subpanel before November is essential to provide critical feedback and to have questions answered, which would be better addressed during a meeting versus in multiple advisory body reports. This timing is necessary for the GMT to consider whether and how the pilot risk tables for Petrali Sol and Sablefish could be used to inform management, given that the risk tables will be reviewed by the full SSC in November 2023. The GMT suggests that this gap slash GMT slash EWG meeting take place during the October, uh, the GMT October 16 to 20, 2023 meeting, which will be virtual. The GMT seeks council guidance on workload expectations for the GMT with regard to using the Petrali Sol and Sablefish risk tables to inform 2025-2026 harvest specifications and management measures, balancing those expectations with existing harvest specifications workload. In general, the GMT also seeks clarity on whether there are existing pathways to use the risk table information to inform harvest specifications or whether new pathways will need to be developed within the FMP. The GMT is willing to work on the development of future risk tables as proposed. 
However, this constitutes new work and is not on the council GMT workload prioritization list. Uh, in addition, the Nature Conservancy is scheduled to host two proposed workshops in January 2024 that would set the stage for the use of climate information in decision making and identify on ramps and fishery management processes. The best time to maximize GMT participation in developing a formal process for incorporating ecosystem information is after January because of the harvest specifications deadlines that take place mid January and because of the GMT overwinter meeting slated for January 29th through February 2nd, 2024. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Are the are there any questions on the ground fish management team report? And I don't see any hands. Thank you, Kate. Next, we'll go to the Groundfish Advisory subpanel report. Shems Judd is here for that. Good morning, Shems. How about now? All right. Uh, good morning, Vice Chair Hassamer, uh, members of the council. For the record, my name is Shems Judd. I'll be reading from agenda item F1A, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Initiative 4, Ecosystem and Climate Information Progress Report. The GAP thanks Kit Dahl, uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, and the Ecosystem Workgroup for their thinking on these issues and offers the following guidance and recommendations. Before offering guidance on the topics up for discussion at this meeting, uh, the GAP offers the following comments for consideration. In a world with perfect science, a structured process like that being developed by the EWG that provides actionable information for decision making based on the state of the ecosystem would be a tremendous asset to fishermen and the management process. Unfortunately, we don't live in that world. The gap is concerned that we may not have enough information to reliably apply ecosystem information in the setting of catch limits and other management measures, and that moving forward with this process before we have reliable and widely agreed upon information could result in negative unexpected consequences. The gap recommends a retrospective analysis to assess whether the process is ready for use in management. Alternatively, the Council could compare EWG recommendations, for example, high, medium, low, for select stocks to assessments and fishery results for a cycle or two in order to assess how well the process will, in fact, inform management. Process for choosing species, stocks, groups to receive ecosystem and climate information. The GAP recommends inclusion of advisory body members on the multidisciplinary risk assessment teams being contemplated by the EWG. Given timeline constraints, the proliferation of other important issues, uh, for example, wind energy, and challenges working through longstanding issues on the council agenda, the GAP is concerned about the workload implications of the process outlined by the EWG. While well, the GAP doesn't have specific input on the proposed meeting timelines, the GAP does recommend that the EWG schedule standalone meetings with advisory bodies outside of regular council meetings to provide adequate opportunity for input. Specifically, if the March-September meeting cycle stands, the GAP recommends a standalone meeting after the September council meeting that would focus on how the information might be used in harvest setting. Appendix A. Uh, with regard to Appendix A, the GAP agrees with the uh, Coastal Pelagic Species Management Report recommending additional clarity on what the high, medium, low likelihoods refer to and further explanation of what they are based on. And that ends our report. Thank you, Shams. Are there questions? Frank Lockhart. Um, I appear to be having problems with the first paragraphs of all reports. So anyway, I have a question on that one as well. Uh, it just, it's, it's just a, maybe if you could expand the gap uh, recommends a retrospective analysis for this retrospective, where you're talking about the process or whether or not climate information was incorporated. Could you explain, just maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Lockhart. Good, good question. So basically um, looking, I, I think what we were thinking about was looking at older assessments um, and how the fisheries performed through the lens of this high, medium, low that the EWG uh, reports are putting out to assess 
it, was there a good match between what we expected to happen and what actually happened to try to assess um, if this process can actually, in fact, be helpful in the harvest setting? Thank you. Further questions? Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair Hus Husmer. Thank you, Shems, for the report. Um, I had a question. Um, well, on the retrospective um, analysis, somewhat thinking about did the um, gap talk alternatively, and I know you sort of teed up workload concerns about uh, test flying the petroli and sablefish risk cables in this current cycle to really give you a feel for how that might work into the overwinter analysis. You, you have the information and so how to use it and then maybe looking back going, how did that work and how could we do it better in the future? Um, and then I'll just ask this other question because I think it's a little bit related. Um, is whether or not the gap talked about the opportunity that the GMT brought up um, for getting together after the September council meeting and before November at the um, GMT's October work session and maybe uh, fleshing that idea out a little bit more. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Hall. Um, on the second question first, um, I think that lines up well with the timing that we were thinking about. You know, we suggested, you know, after September, but outside the normal council process. And so I think that that could work well. Um, we, of course, didn't talk about that specifically, but I think that's in, in the ballpark of what we were thinking about. Um, on, on the first question, can I ask you to clarify a little bit? Yeah, I'm just thinking that the, the risk tables for petroleum and sablefish are, are available um, I know the GMT will be doing their overwinter analysis and developing alternatives and, and could that information from those risk tables help inform that analysis in thinking about um, getting, this is just a, like the alternative to a retrospective, but getting the process started in a kind of a pilot approach with that information that might help uh, look back the retrospective approach that the gap was thinking. I hope that helps. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Hall. We, we didn't talk about that specifically, but I think that could be um, a good alternative idea. Absolutely. Thank you, Sean. Further questions on the GMT report? Not seeing hands. So thank you, Shams. Thank you. And lastly, the Habitat Committee report, Dr. Green. Welcome back, Corey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. I'm gonna be reading agenda item F1A, Habitat Committee report on initiative four, the Ecosystem and Climate Information Progress Report. The Habitat Committee received a progress report from the Ecosystem Work Group on their work towards integration of ecosystem and climate information into the management and assessment process. There are some connections between the Ecosystem and Climate Information Initiative and Habitat, and the HC supports these efforts. The HC recommends that Klamath Falls should examine a species currently on the EWG candidate list and Sacramento Fall Chinook salmon are given priority in the next round of analysis. Klamath Fall Chinook salmon are recommended because of substantial impending changes to freshwater habitat and ecosystem due to dam removal, combined with data streams that will include pre, during, and post dam removal periods. Sacramento Fall Chinook are recommended because of their overall vulnerability to changing climate conditions in both freshwater and, I would say, ocean. Per our recommendation in March 2023, the HC also recommends that within the stock dynamics category, the addition of a criterion for indicator response to identify how well habitat and other ecosystem indicators might help explain stock dynamics. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. Questions on the Habitat Committee report? No hands? Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the management entity advisory body reports. We've got two public comment signups. We will come to those after 
our uh, first morning break. So let's take 15 minutes and be back here. Recording stopped.
<laughs> All right, let's uh, start moving back to our seats, please. Recording in progress. Right, I think we're fully populated here and ready to continue. Um, we are moving into our public comment. We have two signups and there they are. Wade Kirshner followed by Michelle Conrad. So, whoop, the switch that Michelle Conrad followed by Gway Kirshner. <laughs> Michelle, you're first, good morning. Good morning, Vice Chair Hasmer and Council Members. My name is Michelle Conrad, and I'm presenting comments on behalf of Ocean Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, and Wild Oceans. We sincerely appreciate the work of the Council, the EWG, and EAS, and the advisory bodies and the scientists that have been working on Initiative 4. With increasing climate variability and changing ocean conditions affecting West Coast fisheries and communities, it is critical the Council take action now to factor ecosystem considerations into your decision making to better prepare for the future. We remind the Council of the primary objective of Initiative 4, which is to develop clear pathways for ecosystem and climate information to be used in the setting of scientific uncertainty and harvest policy. Given the wide range of Council managed stocks across its four FMPs, with differences in stock biology, data robustness, and species specific environmental relationships, as well as FMP specific processes, there are likely different tools and methods by which to use the ecosystem and climate information that's provided to you to set scientific uncertainty and harvest policy for council managed stocks. While we appreciate the EWG's proposal to develop and use a risk assessment table as its preferred pathway, we want to ensure there is sufficient exploration and consideration of a variety of tools and methods to use ecosystem and climate information in council fisheries management, including for stocks that are not considered data rich and to test those through initiative four. In other words, we wouldn't want the council to deem initiative four to be complete once the species selection criteria for future risk table candidates is adopted, since risk tables would be limited in scope to category one stocks. To that end, we recommend the council request the SSC and EWG identify comprehensive and efficient methods to use climate and ecosystem information to set scientific uncertainty and harvest policy. We also recommend the council keep moving forward with considering the risk table approach for data rich stocks. Task the EWG with exploring methods for stocks in other information categories and to de develop pathways that will work for all FMPs and stocks and request the EWG identify and explore more efficient implementation mechanisms, such as through a comprehensive amendment for all or for multiple FMPs. With regard to the proposed species selection criteria, 
uh, and process, we agree with the EWG that the council should not wait for the production and delivery of risk tables to consider fishery performance and that further work is needed on how these products can be integrated into the groundfish harvest specification process and other FMP related processes such as stock assessment prioritization. We also agree with the EWG's observation that applying the Appendix A draft selection criteria to different species, stocks, or groups is time consuming and requires familiarity with species and fishery specific literature and data. On that note, we think that much of the work needed to complete the EWG's proposed species selection process would actually be duplicative of the Council's lengthy stock assessment prioritization process, with the exception of considering climate vulnerability. This could be rectified by adding a column to the stock assessment prioritization matrix and using the climate vulnerability assessments, or CVAs, to factor stock vulnerability to climate conditions into the prioritization score. We are also concerned that if a new process were added on top of the council's existing stock assessment processes, it would take about a dozen years to complete risk tables just for all of the category one groundfish stocks. We believe this is too long of a time frame if the intent is to be proactive in preparing council fisheries management to be responsive to changing climate conditions. Therefore, to save time and money, reduce workload by the council and related staff, and for ease of implementation, we recommend using the stock assessment prioritization process with the addition of the CVA factor and developing risk tables for each category one stock at the time it is being assessed, rather than creating and adding a new process. In reviewing the FMP specific timeline and on ramps for groundfish in figure one, we noted that the option to select an annual catch target or an ACT was missing. While using an ACT is optional, it is another harvest setting mechanism that the council could employ as a precautionary management measure, and we recommend adding ACTs as potential on ramps. As we mentioned previously, we believe it would be helpful if the council explored additional methods and pilot stocks across multiple FMPs and included non data rich stocks for the initiative for pilot. While we don't have specific species preferences, we recommend the council select a CPS stock, such as sardine or anchovy, and a Chinook stock, such as Klamath River Fall Chinook for its pilot. Finally, with regard to the draft risk tables for petroleum sole and sable fish, as we noted previously, most of the council's FEP related work has focused on providing more ecosystem science rather than translating and applying the science to council fisheries management. While initiative four sets the stage to take those steps, using the pathways identified to incorporate the climate and ecosystem information into setting scientific uncertainty, for example, through stock assessments, category assignments, or SIGMA, or accounting for management uncertainty, such as through adopting PSTAR or using a buffer to set an annual catch target, is the final and most critical step to achieving climate ready fisheries. We fully recognize that this is perhaps the most difficult as well as the most important step, but is necessary to move forward. Therefore, we recommend the council use the risk tables for petroleum sole and sable fish by considering them through the 2025 to 2026 biennial harvest specifications and management process. Again, we appreciate the work of the council, the EWG, the integrated ecosystem assessment team, all of the council advisory bodies and stakeholders through their work on initiative four. The council has a timely opportunity with this initiative to protect fisheries and fishing communities by incorporating climate and ecosystem science into fisheries management. And we urge the council to act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Are there questions for Michelle on her testimony? 
And I don't see any hands. Again, thank you. Thanks. And Gwei Kirshner. Welcome back to the table, Gwei. Thank you, Mr. Oh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Um, as was promised at the June meeting, I am back to give you an update on um, our work to put uh, the workshops together. Uh, there's a letter in your briefing book, and I'll just uh, go through that just real quickly. Um, we have a, a great steering committee that's come together that includes um, Ms. Jessica Watson, uh, Ms. Corey Writings, Dr. Kit Dahl, Dr. Tommy Moore, and Dr. Mary Huntsinger, Mr. Corey Niles, and myself. Um, I think it's really important that, that several of the steering committee members are also members of the ecosystem work group. So we're closely tied with the work that is happening there um, and closely coordinated with that. We've had uh, two meetings and in those two meetings, we looked at the uh, potential available dates uh, between uh, November and um, into February. And um, as we all know, there are not many available dates, but we did identify some. Um, and uh, looking to hold uh, one workshop on um, January 30th and 31st, and a second workshop now on February 13th to 14th. Uh, we've been looking, um, exploring locations in Southern Cal California, as well as in Portland, Oregon, and looking at locations that could help um, us with uh, providing a virtual option for the workshops. Um, it wouldn't be full participation virtually as breakout rooms are very hard to do in a virtual setting but um, or in a hybrid setting, but uh, folks could um, still listen and would have some level of participation. And then um, we looked at topics and uh, we were lucky to be able to get a sneak peek at the ecosystem work group uh, recommendations for topics in the report that they submitted for this meeting and um, utilize that information as well as, as recommendations that have come in the past to put together for you a, a agenda of what a workshop could look like. Um, this is all very draft and initial thinking. So what comes out the end might look a little bit different than this, but we thought it was important to give the council something to look at to, to see what these workshops might look like and how um, agenda items are included in those. Uh, we've been getting good uh, feedback uh, at this meeting and appreciate some of the um, input through um, the reports and have I've already started uh, taking notes on the agenda and how that might change based on information that we've been getting getting here. And with that, I'd take any questions. Thank you, Gwei. Are there questions for Gwei on her testimony? Uh, Lynn Mattis. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hesmer and Ms. Kirchner. I just wanted to say I appreciate the work that you and the um, steering committee have put into trying to develop the timeline and agenda for these work groups. I think that's helpful having us for us to have a starting place. Just wanted to say thanks. Thank you. Further questions? Not seeing any hands. Thank you, Gwei. That completes all of, our, all of our reports and public testimony count, takes us to council discussion. Um, as you can see, uh, action is provide council discussion and guidance as appropriate, maybe not to direct you, but just uh, some reminders. What we have, uh, the EWG work group or the EWG report one page two had a itemized list of uh, guidance they were looking for and recommendations. Um, you heard in the public comment, the steering committee for the workshop was meeting. There's a draft agenda in there. Uh, slide 14 in the EWG presentation had some potential topics. And then of course, um, all the uh, advisory body reports, there were recommendations in there. So I'm gonna look for 
a hand to start the discussion on this. Lots of information. Oh, sorry, John Ugaritz. Thanks, and yes, there's a lot of information here in front of us. Um, I definitely appreciate the work that the Ecosystem Work Group and everyone else has put in to date. I think Mr. Anderson's question regarding salmon uh, back when the Ecosystem Work Group was speaking sort of expresses my concern with where we are right now. And that is the Ecosystem Work Group has a lot of really good information on a starting point of when to insert ecosystem and climate information into our processes, but really not any of the details on how or what would come in. And that's where I see the need for work rather than focusing on broad FMP group discussions to flesh out details um, I really think that the, the near-term work should continue to focus on example species like petroleum and sablefish and better flesh out what it is we're actually providing and how it's provided and bring that back to the council prior to considering the details of annual council process and when we discuss certain things. Um, so for example, I think much of section two of, of the EWG report could be put on hold until we have a better feeling for, for where we're going with things. Um, I think some of the advisory panel groups essentially provide that same sort of guidance. Um, where you know the EAS report uh, talks about using petroleum sole and stable fish and to look at them as looking at the efficacy of the risk tables. I agree that we're not ready to actually use that in the 2025-26 process, but rather, uh, I think as Executive Director Burden mentioned, um, you know maybe using it as a as a look back. Um, and seeing how it would have worked. Um, I think the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team report points out some of the specific ways that the risk table process could be further developed, and we could use those example species to do that. Uh, the CPS advisory subpanel talks about how climate rain shifts could be included in this process, and that could be looked at with the example groups. I think the ground fish management team brings some of those same ideas of using the petroli and sable fish to further develop the on-ramp process. Um, the risk tables themselves, I think, need some work. I think in particular that uh, there's something missing there with regard to fishing pressure that if, if the council is going to focus on a species, it should be a species where the fishing pressure is great enough that our efforts could affect uh, the, the species as a whole in the face of climate change. So summing up, I, I think that the timelines in the ecosystem work group report are aggressive. I think there's a lot of work to be done before we get there. And I'd rather see it focus on the example species rather than getting into FMP groups at this point. Thank you, John. Further discussion, Frank Lockhart. Um, um, to me, I, I, it seems to me that we have been uh, well served by kind of, uh, kind of, uh, reminding ourselves of the specific asks of the EWG in the past and, and kind of going through that. And, and I'm wondering um, if it would be possible to put up on the screen the 
the the EWG asks for guidance to maybe guide our discussion a little bit. I don't want to presume, but for me, that would be useful to me. So I don't know if that's possible. So that would be page two of EWG report one, if you can display that sort of the second half of that page. I can tell the computer's working on it. <laughs> so there, is that what you were looking for, Frank? That uh, yes, it was. And so I guess um, kind of I thinking of this and then kind of comparing it to what John said, um, I'm not exactly sure how what John said kind of applies to this, but you know, the the EWG was asking us for um, you know providing guidance on uh, section two and uh, well all, all all of these things you know and um, I don't know if it would. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that maybe my question is back to John, you know, John, looking at this on the screen now, how, how does your comment kind of apply to this? If that's not too vague of a question for you, John, I see your hand up. So go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks Mr. Lockhart for the question. Absolutely. Uh, um, I think for bullet one, uh, my guidance on section two of the report would be to hold those recommendations until we have a better understanding of how this whole process works. With regard to section three, the specific timelines, my recommendation would be that we use Petroli Sole and Sablefish as examples over the next year to flesh out the timeline, see how it works in those two example processes. And perhaps while doing that, consider how it, those timelines might be different for different FMP groups, but focusing on the, the two example species. Um, with regard to the risk evaluation, I, I do think we could again consider some of the advisory group recommendations, better flesh out those risk tables with better definitions, and importantly, consider what's missing from the risk tables, for example, fishing pressure. And then with the last bullet, um, I think that that goes to the same thing as the, the bullet before that. Um, so, so I think I, I, again, I'm I'm feeling like we need more definition and example of how this process would work, and then move forward with considering further implementation and timelines. Thank you, John. Does that answer your question, Frank? Good. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer, and um, thank you, Mr. Lockhart, for putting this um, up. I think it's helpful, too, and I, I appreciate the comments from, um, from Mr. Ugaritz. I, I feel like, um, well, I feel like there's um, a really strong interest to bring this ecosystem information into the council process, and I feel like we're on the verge of doing it and have a, a bit of an opportunity um, to get that ball rolling, uh, see what it might look like with these draft uh, petroli and um, and sablefish risk cables, um, but also uh, cautiously wanting to be um, careful about um, how we do that and, and where we spend our time. Um, it seems like a really good starting point here um, because there is some uncertainty about how the risk tables might be used um, of starting out by making sure that they 
um, that we hear from the ecosystem um, and the groundfish uh, folks. So maybe making sure that this information is considered by the SSC at their September 21 meeting and, and brought to the full SSC in November is might perhaps a good place for us to start um, and hear from them and, and then see where this goes from there. Thank you, Heather. Further discussion? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, John and Heather, for that. Heather, I just wanted to quickly um, support that idea. Um, I had it in my notes when thinking about the risk tables portion of this larger discussion to have that go to the SSC um, and reconsider this in November uh, when we have the Ecosystem Subcommittee and the full SSC's um, thoughts on this. Thank you. Lynn Mattis. Thank you, Vice Chair. And I'm on similar thinking to Ms. Writings about review by the ground fish subcommittee of the SSC and come back, <coughs> come back in November with more information. Okay. Look around for hands. Uh, Executive Director Burden. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I, I do want to be sure that we are uh, setting appropriate expectations <laughs> and uh, have a clear way forward. Um, one, one of the things that, well, there are a couple of things that are really stuck in my mind as I think about this issue. One is, uh, personally, I'm fairly excited about it. I think it's uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, I think one of the most important aspects of something like this is that we are all uh, clear about what we're doing and we have a very good understanding about its implications and that the council is able to make good decisions. Um, it's hard for me to imagine uh, fitting this into the current specs process and making decisions that everyone is comfortable with and knows what's going on um, when we get through the spring and our June meeting. Um, maybe there's a way. Uh, it's hard for me to see that from where I sit at the moment. Um, what I would propose is that, yes, let's have the SSC um, consider this at their upcoming meeting, provide some more feedback. I, I have a lot of reluctance in setting the expectation that we try to fold this into the current specs process. I think there are some workload considerations. That's a big consideration on my mind. It's probably not the biggest one. The biggest one is that Everyone around this table knows what we're doing when a decision is made. And it's hard to see that at the moment. If I'm wrong, I'd appreciate being corrected, but um, that's where, that's my observation where I sit. Thank you, John Ugaritz. Thanks, and I couldn't agree more with what Merrick just said. Um, we need the details before we can decide how this will work. Um, there's also the question of the proposed TNC workshops. Um, I, I just, I, I don't see we're ready to dive into CPS, HMS, and salmon at this point in the game. Um, I think the workshops would be much better served to further flesh out the, the process and give us a better understanding of the how um, using those example species. Thank you, John. Frank Lockhart. I, I must admit, I'm <laughs> given what is up on the screen right now and kind of given where I thought things were going, I really am not that sure of kind of what the kind of the, the sum total of the comments we've had under discussion is actually leading to. And I'm wondering if we could call the the EWD G chair up to kind of give the, uh, the interpretation of what she views uh, as the, you know, what, what is she, has she heard sufficient guidance, I guess, and then maybe point out if we're missing anything and some important things going forward. So if I, I don't, if with the chair, vice chair's um, permission, maybe invite Yvonne up. 
Thank you, Frank. I think what I would like to do first is ask Dr. Dahl what he's heard in terms of uh, a workload or process moving forward and some of these recommendations, and, and we can look for clarification too. So, Kit, can, can you summarize where you think you, we are? Um, yes, I can try. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So what I've, I've heard so far is it, it seems at least uh, uh, Mr. Uger has expressed a strong opinion to hold off on so that EWG in their report has laid out this species selection process. It's both a method and a, and a process to, to hold off on that. Um, the EWG had some recommendations, as you can see, around putting out that methodology for public review and having the council uh, adopt it as an ongoing thing um, in March, and but that not to move forward with that right now and and um, instead really focus on some specific examples around uh, the methodologies uh, like the risk tables. So. Um, uh, doing more work on those uh, specific applications to get gain a better understanding of how this might uh, these types of things might work in uh, different FMP processes. Um, and then I also heard a, uh, uh, some comments. Um, maybe there isn't total consensus here, but about asking the so the SSE ecosystem subcommittee is already queued up to take a look at those risk assessment tables uh, for the two species uh, that they have a meeting scheduled for that. And then there was a suggestion that that move on to the um, full SSC in November. And then where things, I don't think there's consensus is, would that then be brought forward in some form in November, presumably through the harvest specific specifications agenda item or is that too much to ask at this stage so um that's what i've heard i don't know that i captured every comment but uh it's kind of my attempt at summarization uh, executive director burton yes thank you mr vice chairman um to add a bit to what kit is uh, saying in response to mr lockhart's question uh, what I'm hearing, Frank, are uh, we're essentially we're having, or, well, there are two ways to think about the discussion that's happening. One is um, I'm, I'm hearing and what I'm weighing in on personally is what is the council's process as it relates to uh, our groundfish FMP process? I don't think that's a question for the EWG. The EWG does have some valid questions, and I think that's a almost a separate discussion from the one we're having now. No, thank you. And, and Frank, um, if, if you desire, we can have the EWG, but I guess uh, my preference is the council be clear first on what they would like the EWG to do or how the process goes forward. Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, Merrick, thanks for your comments. Um, I agree. I think in my head, what you described is actually what we would hopefully get some clarity on um, if we could hear from the SSC and sort of get their perspective on it. And then if it in November, if we were to move through the SSC ecosystem meeting that Kit just referenced, as well as the full SSC's thoughts in November, um, what that could look like, if it's appropriate to add to the specs. It, what's the workload like, you know, having side conversations with people involved in groundfish, the workload could be incredibly small or it could be incredibly large. And that's a huge difference about whether we're able to incorporate that or not. So um, I just wanted to sort of voice my perception there um, that I think that hopefully we can actually answer those questions as part of moving through to the next meeting and hearing from the SSC. Thank you. Looking around uh, before we find out if we have enough, uh, I guess I'm not sure on the workshop if 
Kit, if you need additional input, I heard Mr. Ugaritz make uh, a recommendation or a suggestion on what might not be in there and what could be. I, I did see a head nod in the back from part of the steering committee, um, but uh, how the council feels about that process going forward. If there's any suggestion or comment on that, or will the steering committee continue to work? So Kit, I'm gonna ask you again to summarize. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yes, so we had uh, the comment from Mr. Ugaritz about um, having those, rather than those workshops, kind of really z uh, zero in on specific applications of the N FMPs, again, to take a step back and, and uh, take a, a broader look at our processes. So that's the one comment I heard. I hope I characterized it correctly. And certainly uh, the Nature Conservancy and the steering committee can take that on board and kind of rethink, you know, what the substance of the workshops uh, would be. And I think we've heard also some comments. Well, we heard a comment from the uh, GMT about the timing of the workshops and in regard to their their workload. So, so that's another very specific comment that uh, the steering committee can take on board and and you know look at you know, alternative dates, I guess um, that might work better for the for that for that group. So, yeah, that's what I've heard so far as far as as recommendations on those proposed work workshops. All right, thank you. So our task was to provide guidance as necessary. Look around and see if everybody's comfortable. And I, I can I'll ask you, you Kit, if uh, you've heard enough here from our discussions on this one. This was a process update. Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> Are we talking about the workshops and closing out that discussion or about this entire agenda item? Um, I'm thinking about the entire <laughs> agenda item. We've gone through a lot, but uh, if there are, I don't wanna cut off discussions here. May I? Yes. Okay, thanks. Sorry, apparently I'm a little slow this morning. Um, I, I just wanted to, thinking about what I think I heard John say, um, and John, please correct me if I'm wrong, just trying to work through this. Um, the EWG prevented, uh, presented us with some species selection process and criteria, um, and I and asked that we consider putting that out for public review. Um, I, I think it would be beneficial to put that out for public review. Um, get more information on that, see if it resonates with people. Um, I personally, looking at a couple of the advisory bodies and public comment, think about that as uh, could we consider thinking more about that in the context of the stock assessment prioritization? Um, so I would like to see that work move forward as envisioned by the EWG. All right, thank you. John Ugaritz, I see your hand up. Thanks, and um, I think maybe to clarify, I am not ready at this point. I'd rather see and hear what the SSC has to say. Perhaps after November we'll be ready, um, but uh, no, I'm not ready at this point to put this out for public review. <laughs> Uh, Chair Penninger. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer. Um, I'm not sure what we'd be putting out for public review if people would. I don't know if there's a detail here, what, it, what it all it would entail yet. Um, you know, I think we're pretty, uh, I think folks are pretty uh, excited about the work that's being done. Um, I know certainly, um, I think everybody looks forward to the California Current Ecosystem Status Report every year. I think that's probably one of the favorite probably reports that we, we see, see what's happening. Um, I think the gap statement really speaks to me as far as kind of where we're at in a perfect world. It'd be great to kind of plug and play and you get your, your information and 
you'd be uh, off you go. A friend of mine who got a risk uh, um, discussion, I guess, or a, a seminar, um, worked for a towboat company, and the um, I think Digital, Digital said that um, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you think you know that ain't so which gets you into trouble. And with that, I think that I'd like to have more work needs to be done here, and I'd hate to have a to incorporate go too far down this path until we know what we got and how accurate it is. Um, I think there's just too much. I mean, we have. I look at the uh, the tables on the um, for salmon and ground fish and uh, CPS. I don't think there's no huge rush here. I mean, uh, we only have one fishery. I guess this really uh, potentially is the anchovies and CPS. And that's, I think we set the quota far lower than what it should have, it could, it could have been. I think about 1%, I think, is the ACL from what the biomass is. Uh, the ground fish, where we have, you know, these stocks are long lived, and uh, one or two bad years does not affect ground fish as far as their viability because they, they are so long lived. So uh, then you have salmon with all the different variables there. But so these are a rush. I think we ought to do whatever you're doing, we ought to do it right. And we ought to be a very measured approach to it. And I think we need to take care of the spec cycle we have right now and get it done because we're, as uh, Executive Director Burton uh, indicated, um, there's not much else we could add on to that. And uh, we risk uh, not making that date and I think we're well prepared to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair Hassmer. I just uh, wanted to uh, maybe express how I'm thinking about things so we attempt to wrap this up and see if I'm on the same page as everyone. And I think the, the next step is to uh, get some understanding from the SSC on these draft risk tables by hearing from them in November. And then um, in looking back at the ecosystem working groups report number two, um, where they describe that there um, is more work to be done on the process. They have suggested coming back to the council in March of 2024 with more detailed proposal and that the information from the SSC, the information provided in the really helpful advisory body and management team reports at this meeting, I think um, can help the, the TNC workshop in January can all help bring that all to the next phase. And I'm not sure if I'm missing anything. Maybe that's a question for Kit, um, but that feels like the, the path forward. Thank you, Heather. So there was a, a summary of a path forward. It's still the question, I guess, we heard about the species selection criteria um, going out for public review, not being ready for that. So just want to make sure we're clear on where the council is on this. Corey Ridings. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I think um, maybe this is a moment just to, to seek some clarity around um, what is going to be part of the SSC Ecosystem Committee agenda. Um, would you, could, could we ask Kit about that? Kit? Uh, I wasn't, are you sorry, asking did, me? I wasn't sure. Yes. Merrick's hand signals confused me, but. Um. <laughs> so it, it was a question. There was talk about the ecosystem, uh, the SSC ecosystem subcommittee. Uh, meeting in September, reviewing, I believe, the risk tables and coming back in November, what the SSC agenda would include or look like. And I see you have Marlene next to you to help also. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Unfortunately, the agenda for that meeting is posted on our website and I managed to open it while you're speaking. Um, so uh, essentially, uh, the agenda items are to just, uh, an, I think, a general presentation discussion of the approach to developing the risk tables and then a look at these um, pilot examples for petroleum sablefish, uh, 
a fairly fulsome discussion of those. I'm sure that they would, you know, kind of provide a, a bunch of guidance on uh, maybe what would be needed to, to improve those or further flesh them out. And then um, the final agenda item um, is uh, just a, a broader discussion on potential use of risk tables and other ecosystem information in the council process and then how that intersects with SSE determined category designations, scientific uncertainty buff buffer, and review process. So sort of, I, I take that last part as, you know, making that connection between the results of a risk assessment and the methodologies um, that are in use for um, uh, setting ACLs, I guess you'd say, or determining the uh, uncertainty buffer that is used to arrive at the a ABC. So um, uh, that's what I have. All right. Thank you. Does that help? Okay. So again, I, I realize there's a lot of moving pieces here, a lot of information. I, Heather summarized what the process was. A uh, piece of that is the SSC subcommittee meeting in September, um, full SSC review in November, coming back to us. Uh, potentially, I know the dates are uncertain, but a workshop at some point and that agenda is under development. What am I missing? Bill Anderson? Um, I'm not sure what you're missing, if anything, but it would, I still think it would be valuable, as Frank had requested earlier, to have our chair of the EWG um, come up and uh, that group asked us for, for guidance in a number of different areas, heard the discussion. Um, if they have uh, questions of clarification or, or perspectives, I think it would be valuable for the council to hear from Yvonne. Excellent. Good time for that. So Yvonne, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Anderson, members of the council. So I will first say that uh, it is my practice and I assume the practice of a lot of other advisory bodies to re-listen to the council conversation after it's happened through the uh, wonderful council staff and contractor recordings. Um, so sometimes I don't understand what you guys are telling us and need to re-figure that out later. I think um, looking at our page two, um, you are declining to provide guidance on section two and appendix A and leaving that to the SSEES and SSC to perhaps comment on whether those are ready to go out for public review. Uh, you are asking as far as timelines and on-ramps for more specifics for when those might come into the management processes and um, how they might work in the management processes. Uh, it sounds like you are uh, declining to provide comment on Appendix C, um, although there is some guidance on petroli sole and sable fish in the current ground fish cycle. Uh, um, and let's see. So, and then in, in our recommendations, uh, it looks like we have been given the opportunity to um, have meeting times with other advisory bodies that you will not be sending out the species selection criteria unless we hear from the SSCES and SSC that that's doable, um, that you're not assigning us any additional species under the species selection criteria. And uh, I didn't hear whether you were going to consider any of the climate and communities initiative tasks as potential 
um, tasks for the TNC workshop, but I thought perhaps not. So that's our list and how it sounded like it jived with your list. All right, thank you, Yvonne. So does that help everyone? Okay, not seeing any hands, I'm gonna turn back to Kit um, and ask, uh, maybe just summarize the path forward again. Uh, I may have gotten it wrong. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Renye um, did a fairly focused uh, summarization based on what they were asking, which is was projected on the screen from that second page of their report. I don't know how much I need to re reiterate what she said uh, beyond generally sort of putting a hold on the species selection criteria method and um, process for the time being. Perhaps uh, Ms. Duranye suggested perhaps you would um, see if the SSC would look at that and once they, um, if when and if they have some comments, maybe revisit that that proposal. Um, and uh, so, and then in terms of uh, kind of generally um, having the the specific application of the risk assessment tables for petroleum and sablefish go to the SSC and potentially hear from them in uh, November um, on any uh, comments they have, have about those. And um, let's see, what else am I missing? I think you endorsed the <clears throat> EWG meeting with the advisory body, specifically the GAP GMT, CPSMT and CPSAS this fall, as those um, advisory bodies have um, <clears throat> agreed to. And um, um, pro didn't as uh, missed and had some discussion around uh, kind of recommendations for what the T TNC Council workshop could could take up. So that's my perhaps less than stellar summarization, but I think it's I, I think Mr. Renier would gave a focused response to her understanding on behalf of the uh, EWG so we can uh, sort out how we move forward with this uh, this initiative and come back in March with additional information. All right, thank you. So I'll look for any other hands on this that uh, summarizes our path forward and see if there's any further questions, comments. Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Kit, for that. That sounded right to me. Um, I just had one additional bit that we didn't get to in discussion, and that was uh, recognizing the on-ramps portion of the report that the EWG provided to us. And I just wanted to thank them for providing that. I thought they were useful. Um, we had a couple comments. I think they could be improved to be easier to understand, but I think they're a nice foundational sort of educational product that can help us get through that. So I just wanted to thank them for that and recognize that a couple advisory bodies um, provided input on that and um, not to lose that and just if we can update those. So. Thank you. Yes, lots of comments in our advisory body reports. Phil Anderson. Well, let me admit up front that I'm not clear on much of what we've talked about, but I'm not sure there's enough time left in the day to get me clear on everything. So I'm relying on my colleagues around the table who have a better uh, grasp of what we're doing here. But what one of the of the um, components here of this that I thought we were making progress on, and I'm not clear if we are, is um, trying to look at moving forward with these two, with with uh, these two species, petroleum sole and sablefish, 
in doing a trial. We looked at 25 and 20, uh, for 25 and 26, we looked at, we talked about both doing it proactively and reactively in the, in the looking at it and trying to incorporate our um, ecosystem information into those two species and into that process for 25, 26. And then we also, there was some discussion about not doing that, but looking at it more in the rear view mirror of if we had done that, what would we have done differently than what our normal process is and what I'm not. And, and that was a piece that I uh, was feeling pretty good about that we were, we were moving, we were moving forward and doing a test case here uh, so that, uh, and we would learn about um, maybe have some more refinements about where the on ramps were in our process for these two species so that we would kind of test drive this and then uh, over time build in, bring in additional species, assuming that we had some success with those two uh, and most likely would learn as we go and the next time around maybe do some additional things or not do some things. And that it's that piece that, that I'm not sure I'm left unclear as to whether we're making progress uh, in doing the, the, what I'm calling the test drive of this to see whether or not we can be effective in building those ecosystems considerations into our management through a management cycle using these two species uh, as a as as a test. So if somebody can help me understand where we ended up with that, um, or if we have, or if there's some additional uh, work to be done between with the SSC piece and and when we come back in March. Um, to find out what, ex kind of exactly what kind of a path that we are going to take uh, in in pursuing that, that would be helpful to me to understand that. So if, I'm not sure who to ask that question of or who can provide some clarity to me on that, but if someone would be willing to do it, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So I'll... Look around first and see Corey Ridings. You want to respond? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Phil, for that. It sounds like you actually do have a pretty good handle on this. Um, I'll, I'll do my best shot to respond to that. Uh, my understanding is that we want the patrol isole and sable fish example risk tables to go to the SSC ecosystem subcommittee which I believe is happening next week or the week after that just, I didn't get scheduled ahead of this meeting, unfortunately, but is what it is to have them take a look at it. And then they can provide their examples or their recommendations to the full SSC in November. And from there, be able to take that advice and hopefully also hear from the GMT and potentially the gap, if they can do that as well about how that might look moving forward. And Phil, I thought you just said it well, is that proactively? I mean, if it ends up being in a great case, you know, maybe we can use it. Maybe we can't. Um, if we can't, can we do a dry run or do a test case and see how that would have worked through if we had used it in 25, 26? And to me, you know, that could elucidate for us, where do we need more information? You know, what's not working? You know, again, maybe the workload is huge. Maybe it's not. And so we can gain information from that to use it down the road um, for what you suggested is in my mind as well, which is depending how this goes, you know, can we use this process in other species? Can we use risk tables as a tool on other species? Um, in this case, we are just looking at petrolli and sablefish, data rich, both ground fish. Um, it'd be nice if we could use this to figure out, does that work for other FMPs? Does it work for data poor stocks? Um, and that's kind of that's kind of the long road I'm looking at, and how this connects to it. Thank you, Corey. Phil is that was very helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right. 
so with that, um, we, we have an understanding, uh, some understanding. Kit has summarized that. Yvonne summarized the EWG uh, perspective for the EWG, their perspective on that. Kit, I will just turn to you and ask if is there anything else we should do here? Oh, yeah. uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, we'll move forward. I think in the, the near term, uh, we've heard about, you do want to have this taken up through the SSC and um, at least here in November, presumably as a component of the harvest specifications agenda item um, from the SSC, perhaps some input to the degree they have the capacity to do so from the GMT and the gap um, uh, on their perspectives about the the use or potential use of this these methods and the specific application. And then, um, you know, that could lead to further consideration down the road, um, you know, and maybe uh, if they say we just don't have the capacity to think about this right now, then there's the other concept that was discussed of a sort of uh, retrospective evaluation or assessment of how they could be used or could have been used once the uh, dust settles from uh, the specifications process and people have more breathing room to, to think through this. So that's the short term. There are a number of other things I don't need I don't feel the need to kind of try and summarize and repeat them for a third time. So, um, but just to be clear on that most proximate aspect of what your discussion was about. All right, thank you. And we'll be hearing back likely in November on some of this then. So with that, not seeing any other hands, final comments, I will go ahead and close out this agenda item and return the gavel to our chair. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer. And uh, with that, we'll be going to uh, G1. Let's wait for people to get uh, situated here. I would like to, uh, I missed it yesterday morning, but I'd like to thank Bob Dooley for the, uh, the donuts yesterday morning and, uh, and uh, Andrew Torres for this morning. Um, and also, we're looking forward to. Uh, more uh, delights for our uh, waistline tomorrow from uh, Chris German. So it's so far, it's been a good week for donuts here at the, the council. So, <laughs> okay. okay, I think we're we're situated here. So, Todd, welcome. You want to start us off on. Uh, on G1. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Council. Uh, we have for you right now the agenda item G1, which is the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. So under this typical agenda item, the West Coast Region and the Science Center are here to provide information for the Council in consideration of what's going on in the groundfish world in, in NIMPS. So for example, the National Marine Fisheries Service West Coast Region is here to provide updates on such things as rulemaking, notices, and is also expected they're going to talk a little bit about this uh, humpback whale stipulated agreement our settlement, excuse me, which is agenda item G1 attachment one. And they also have another report for you um, regarding their, their rulemaking process and workload. Uh, the Science Center is here and is expected to give a presentation on current uh, survey, um, things going on with the surveys, as well as um, present some information for the two reports um, from the center, which are on the groundfish mortality. Um, I'll note that there is also a gap report for your um, your review and hearing and that there is a single public comment as well. Um, looking forward into your um, action, there is just council discussion and any guidance that you would like to give. So if there are any other questions, I can answer them otherwise. Thank you, Todd. Uh, questions for uh, Todd on his overview? Okay. Seeing none, I'll go to uh, Keely and uh, the next report. Keely, welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Keely Kent. I'm the Groundfish Branch Chief with the NIMS West Coast Region. Um, I will be speaking to um, agenda item G1A, Supplemental NIMS Report 1, as well as I have a few other updates um, off that report. 
Uh, we submitted our, it's our typical rulemaking and workload report. Um, we published a number of federal register notices since the last time we met. Um, that information is included in the table on page one. Um, the only addition that I have is um, after we submitted that report, we published the proposed rule for Amendment 32, which is our non trawl area management action that published on August 30th. The comment period is open for 30 days, so it closes on September 29th. Um, and in general, across all of those rulemakings, we're still on track with the timelines that we've previously committed, um, communicated to the council. Um, and, you know, we're, we're on track for January 1 for most of those um, that are aligned with January 1. Um, the second page of that report, um, I'll use that as um, the jumping off point to share that we've had some staff changes since the last, last meeting. Um, Mr. Brian Hooper has left the branch and he is the new West Coast Region Strategic Planner. Um, so the branch is now down a regulation writer and we will be looking to backfill that position. Um, Generally, those timelines sometimes are longer than what we would like. So we are in a position um, in the branch where we are down staff and we are reevaluating the ongoing work and what we can support. So you will see some changes in the workload chart, who's staffing what and what will remain unassigned for the time being until we are able to backfill that role. That is what I have, you know, very closely related to that report. So maybe I'll take a quick pause and see if anyone has anything on that report. And then I have a few other updates. All right, questions for Keely? I think you're good. Okay. Um, I wanted to give the council a quick update on the non troll logbook. Um, we've um, provided some, some information kind of all along the way in this first year of implementation. Um, but we are at the point in the year where we need to make a decision about whether or not we would offer the optional paper logbook off of Washington and California to continue for a second year. So recall we had set it up that right now um, all three states are allowed the first year. We've already agreed with Oregon because there was an existing logbook that we didn't want to disrupt that that paper logbook be, would be available for two years. But off of Washington, Washington and California, we set it up as a choice. Um, where we're at right now is that the electronic logbook is working well. It is available across smartphones, tablets, um, laptops. People can switch back and forth between those three. Um, we've been periodically addressing bugs um, that have come up in the app, but generally it is working very well from our perspective. We'll continue to you know, take any errors um, and make updates as needed. Um, we have good use of the electronic logbook. There are people using the paper logbook. Um, I should have calculated these as percentages, but I just have the numbers um, off of the state of California from the beginning of the year through um, mid-August. We've had 66 vessels use the electronic logbook versus 24 vessels use paper logbooks. Um, the Oregon numbers are a little bit squirrely just because those paper logbooks are still going to ODFNW, so we're not tracking them specifically, but generally for the federal logbook receipt, we have four vessels that um, have done electronic logbooks and two that have done paper where that logbook came to us versus ODFNW. And then in Washington, we had one vessel use the electronic and four use paper. Um, so, you know, we certainly understand removing that option will have an impact. But because we're seeing um, good utility, good use of that logbook app, we continue to help people navigate through that. Pacific States has invested a lot of time and energy helping people. Um, but we are interested in having that data in hand as soon as possible, which is what the electronic logbook allows us to do. Um, as we will go through the ground fish items in this meeting, um, the challenges that we've been having with pullback, we have been digging into that logbook data and trying to put it to use right away. That paper logbook data is just not available on the same time frame, and it has a lot more errors that we just don't have the time to go back and correct. So right now, we would like to move people to the electronic logbook quicker. Um, I, I am open to that feedback. If the council has feedback today, we've we've discussed this in the gap in the GMT, and I think the gap will speak to their thoughts on this. Um, so I'll take input, but generally the agency sees a lot of value in moving more quickly to the electronic logbook, um, and so that's that's our position until we we hear otherwise um, to reconsider. Um, I will pause there again before I move to the um, humpback settlement. If if everyone wants to have questions on that. Okay, questions? Gilly? 
You're still good? Okay. Um, my last major topic. Um, so in the briefing book, um, we did share the um, settlement agreement for our humpback um, whale uh, litigation um, with the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, so where we stand now is that the court has remanded the MMPA 101A5E permit for the stable fish pot, pot fishery for further consideration without vacatur. And then NIMS intends to issue a scoping notice by November 1 of this year that will be seeking information relative to a take reduction team establishment. And at a minimum, we'd be considering setting that up for the sablefish pot fisheries. But as part of that scoping, we would consider expanding to other fisheries that interact with um, our two humpback whale stocks off the West Coast. That scoping notice will be open for 30 days, so there'll be an opportunity um, to share feedback on that. That will also be an opportunity um, to start thinking about uh, who should be on these team on this team. Generally, um, we'll issue the scoping notice, but then it'll be about a two-year period. So we are planning on establishing the take reduction team by October 31st, 2025. Um, in advance of that first um, take reduction team, which will occur um, in November of 2025, there will be a lot of pre-work and things like that that are happening, um, but just kind of noting the bookends of the work that will, will start taking place. Um, in general, um, take reduction teams consist of a variety of um, participants. Um, usually we're looking for a balance. Um, we have representatives from tribal organizations, from the fishing industry, from the Fishery Management Council, from interstate fishery commissions, state and federal agencies, scientists, and environmental organizations. Um, you know, each team um, is has a different makeup amount of people that are on them, um, but generally those take reduction teams, you know, have a short amount of time to do a lot of work. And so I think that's um, one of the big take homes is this will be a new process um, for us in Groundfish um, because we haven't had a take reduction team on the West Coast before. Um, and I'm, I'm certain there's lots of questions um, as we go through this process uh, and, and that we'll be able to answer more questions as we go along. Um, that's the overview right now. Happy to take more questions if there are any. Okay, anybody? Oh, Lynn Mattis. Uh, thank you. Uh, now it's my turn to forget who you are. Uh, Chair Pettinger. Um, <laughs> Keely, I know I asked you this uh, in our in a chat in a call we had before, but thought it might benefit the entire group about how does this relate to um, I think it's G4 later today with the gear marking item. I'm sure there's some interplay. Um, does this play into that or should that play into this? Just some guidance about how the two interact would be helpful. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, there is overlap in terms of um, the considerations where we are looking to better understand the fishery impact um, on humpback whales um, relative to gear marking and then also um, look for ways to reduce our entanglement risk. Um, as I noted, the timeline for the take reduction team, that team would start its work in the fall um, of 2025. We, soon, we see no reason to wait on the work that we are doing right now. I think that will only benefit us as we go into the take reduction team, that here are the measures that we've taken thus far in sablefish pot gear, um, and, th and that will certainly be acknowledged as part of that process. It, it's possible, maybe even likely, that, that the work that we do in this council related to sablefish pot, you know, that that would be... Um, mirrored in the take reduction team, it would be reflected that, you know, depending on how far we've gotten, either the council has made its decision or possibly we're even in the rulemaking process that in the 660 regs, you know, we've taken these actions and that is helpful and useful in terms of our impact on humpbacks for the take reduction team. So those regs could be mirrored in the new plan and regs that come out of a take reduction team. So I think they're, they're related, but I see no reason for us to pause or slow down the work that we're already doing under G4, um, and it will be taken into consideration as we walk into that take reduction team process. Thank you. That was really helpful for me and hopefully for some others. Thank you, Lynn. That was all I had. Okay. I guess, Marcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for that update, Keely. You mentioned the public comment period and the release of the um, 
what is it a proposed note or it's a notice right um if the council were to provide a comment to nymphs on this topic in that comment period um what content might it include Thank you for the question. Um, I think it would be helpful um, to hear from the council rela related to the stable fish pot sectors. So early information, you know, something that we are thinking about is this, the, there is no one stable fish pot fishery. We have several different sectors that operate differently and um, they operate differently in different parts of the coast. That sort of feedback in terms of thinking about representation on the team would be helpful. Um, that is something that I have raised with the gap is trying to understand, um, you know, with all of the different representation on these teams, there will be limited numbers of each seat. And so how do you think about these sectors and who can represent what segment of the fishery? Um, if there is a limited number of seats that we have for stable fish pot, um, I think that's helpful. For the council as a whole, um, as I mentioned, you know, there is a seat um, for the council um, in most take reduction teams. I understand that to be a council staff person. I, I recognize that is not always the case, and I believe in the Pacific Offshore, it was a council member, but that is something for the council to think about in terms of that particular seat as well, and whether that's a council or an executive director type guidance, um, you know, NIMS will be looking for that information and feedback. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Keely. With that, we'll go to... Um, by Craig Russell and the Science Center Report. Welcome, Craig. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Council members. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my computer just logged me out, so give me one second. I will be speaking today on uh, two items. Uh, one is our ground fish survey, and the other is, was mentioned by Todd, the uh, Mortality and bycatch reports. And I want to thank Sandra, who will be advancing slides for me. Okay. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please, Sandra. Thank you. Yeah. So, again, the two topics here are 2023 surveys and then our estimated discarding catch of groundfish species in 2022. Next slide, please. So in short, uh, we are on track. Uh, I should say for the record, I apologize. Uh, for the record, I am Craig Russell. I'm the director of the Fishery Resource Analysis and Monitoring Division at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in NOAA. We are on track for executing our FY23 groundfish surveys this year. Uh, and that includes the full four vessel West Coast groundfish bottom trawl survey. Uh, pass one concluded and pass two is underway and will conclude uh, in Long Beach, California on October 24th. Uh, also includes the uh, NOAA ship Shimada portion of the U.S. Canada Integrated Ecosystem and Pacific Hague Survey. Uh, that survey concluded Saturday, yesterday, uh, September 9th, while the Canadian Coast Guard ship Franklin continues its survey through uh, September 16th. Planning for the Southern California Rockfish Hook and Line Survey uh, is also on schedule, and the survey it will begin mobilization on September 17th in Oxnard and we'll conclude October 6th. As always, we'll keep you posted if anything changes with our surveys um, and welcome any inquiries on those. Next slide, please. Okay, and now I'd like to share some information on one report that was developed by our Fisheries Observation Science Program. I wanna thank uh, Drs. Kaylee Summer, Kate Richardson, as well as uh, Vanessa Tuttle and John McVeigh for their work on this and providing this information. The source info for these next few slides uh, can be found in G1B NWFSC Report 1 and Report 2. Next slide, please. So this figure is also Figure 3 in the report, uh, and it shows the harvest goal attainment for ground fish species that are highly targeted and or attained, as well as species of concern. Looking at the legend on the right, the color blue indicates attainment above the five-year range, Green indicates within the five-year range, and the gray points are the 2017 to 2021 estimates. Attainment of all these species were above or within the five-year range, and none were below. Attainment of black rockfish in California, widow rockfish, black and blue rockfish in Oregon, and nearshore rockfish north of 40, 10 degrees 
uh, latitude were above the previous five-year range. Attainment of Dover sole, yellow eye rockfish, Pacific hake, uh, petrolei sole, and sablefish north of 36 degrees latitude were all within the previous five-year range. Next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, so this is figure four from the report, uh, or this info from this figure comes from figure four, uh, which shows more species and groupings. Um, the slide shows the fishing sector contributors to mortality and bins the percentage discarded to help understand how the species or groupings are utilized by that sector for the four highest attained groupings, as well as the still rebuilding yellow eye. Uh, and the x-axis shows the contribution of each sector, which is listed on the left side of the chart. Um, to the total mortality percentage, which is indicated at the top. And so the color of each dot shows the bin percentage of catch discarded by the given sector, with yellow being zero to 25%, orange 25 to 50%, and red 50 to 100%, and gray and charcoal is unknown. Overall, the patterns are similar to previous years. Three species and groupings attained uh, greater than 85% of their ACL. This includes sablefish north of 36, I'm um, sorry, north of 36, which achieved 95% of its ACL, with most, most of that mortality attributed to non-catch share fixed gear landings, followed closely by catch share and bottom trawl landings. Black, blue, deacon rockfish in Oregon attained 94% of its ACL, with mortality primarily attributed to recreational landings, followed by non-catch share fixed gear, uh, fixed gear landings. And then widow rockfish achieved 88% of its ACL, and nearly all mortality of little rockfish was from the midwater rockfish landings. Yellow eye rockfish reached 69% of its ACL, and about half of that mortality was from recreational discard, and the second highest contributor being non-catch share fixed gear discards. Minor nearshore rockfish north of 4010 exceeded its ACL at 113%, with high contributions from blue deacon rockfish in California, copper rockfish and Quebec rockfish, I wanted to note that the observer program has been engaged with the GMT and others on this issue and has done further investigation into these estimates um, and are confident that these observed encounters and discard rates uh, are representative and do not indicate any lightning strikes or results in any inflated estimates. Discards in the open access hook and line fleet are the primary source of mortality and much higher than in previous years. There are currently no approved discard mortality rates uh, for rockfish in this sector. And uh, due to the depth of much of this effort, uh, discard mortality rates uh, would be unlikely to significantly impact uh, mortality estimates. I also want to note that effort in this sector has increased in recent years, uh, and our observer coverage reflects that increase. We have seen greater numbers, uh, greater encounters and discards of minor nearshore rockfish species in these sectors. Uh, these higher discard rates, along with the greater effort, result in uh, higher fleet-wide discard estimates. And looking at observer information and talking with program staff who are familiar with the open access fleet, it appears that many of these discards are coming from a new kind of effort in the sector utilizing pole gear, similar to what is used um, in the nearshore fishery, but heavier duty, heavier duty for use uh, in deeper waters and often with more hooks. Uh, and so this effort starts to show up in our 2020 data uh, and targeting lingcod, uh, as well as nearshore shelf and midwater rock species. Um, that's all I've got on that report. I encourage anyone who's interested to uh, reach out to Dr. Summers and Richardson. And if we've got additional questions and it's okay with the chair, I'd like to invite Dr. Kaylee uh, Summers up for any of those that I can't answer as well. Uh, and I think that concludes my update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and council members for your time. Okay, thank you, Craig. Uh, questions uh, for Craig on the Science Center report? Chair or, or Grelnick. <laughs> I know you were calling on. <laughs> Craig, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, here's a question I'm sure you're expecting. Um, what is the status of Science Center preparations uh, for a fishery independent survey of species not accessible by trawl? Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Grenlick, thank you for the question. Uh, I mentioned the last time I was here that we did conduct a survey efficiency workshop uh, earlier this, this year, uh, which did produce some information that will help us plan that. Uh, we also are planning to try to do a workshop this winter uh, to bring together uh, industry and other stakeholders to help identify and collect inputs on target areas and methods to uh, tackle that. 
Uh, as I've mentioned before, we're not resourced beyond our current surveys to do that. Uh, we continue to try to look at where we can find cost savings to bring funding together for that and make requests for that funding. Um, so uh, we continue to try with the staff that we've got, make progress on that, um, but have our constraints as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That brings us to the gap report. And uh, Gary Ricker. Welcome, Gary. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. Be reading from agenda item G1C Supplemental Gap Report One, Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on National Marine Fisheries Report. GAP offers the following comments and suggestions. GAP recommends that the option for the paper form of the non-trawl logbook in California and Washington not be extended to a second year. The electronic logbook is working well compared to paper logbooks. Relative to the hook and line survey, GAP continues to express interest in extending the survey range north of Point Conception and to near shore areas because it would provide sorely needed fishery independent data to improve stock assessments and fishery management. It is also evident that Oregon and Washington would benefit from an expanded hook and line survey because the trawl survey does not cover the primary habitat for many rockfish. This includes nearshore rockfish and canary rockfish, amongst others. Mr. Chair, I like those nice short gap statements. Be glad to take questions. Okay, thank you, Gary. Questions for the gap report? I'm not seeing any. Cool. Thank you. All right, that takes care of the uh, reports for advisory bodies and uh, to public comment, I think we have one, Dave Kashida. Dave, welcome. Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, Council Member, Staff, my name is Dave Kashida. I'm a recreational fisherman and I'm representing some Northern California fishermen that are concerned about the status of uh, the surveys that have been going on. So anyway, let me go where I am here. Yeah, we're requesting that NIMS approve and fund hook and line surveys for those fish that actually fish in the rocks, especially the quillback rockfish in Northern California, because of the current trawl survey, which had catastrophic results to the communities. It was conducted in areas where quillback aren't living in abundance. This statement is based on on the water observations from recreational commercial fishermen who encounter quill, pardon me, <clears throat> encounter quillback rarely in areas where crawling occurs and they find them significantly in rocky areas using hook and line gear where trawling isn't occurring due to net and equipment damage if hung up on bottom structure. Therefore, we believe that the current assessment that was closed in inshore rock fishing in California, pardon me, north of Point Conception, is flawed and inaccurate and has resulted in horrible results for fishermen in the communities that rely on the money generated by this inshore fishing. Please take this into consideration so a closure like this can no longer be, happen in the future. So that's about it. Pardon me for getting flustered. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, questions for Dave on his uh, testimony? I'm not seeing any. Great. Thanks, Dave. Okay. That will take us to uh, council discussion and the guidance as appropriate. So I'll open the floor for anybody. Uh, Mark Relnick. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Pettinger. Um, thanks for the reports. I, I am um, concerned. This has uh, been a topic that's been elevated for the last year and a half, both within the council and outside the council, having to do with the need for a fishery independent data collection for stocks uh, that are not accessible by trawl. Um, there have been, uh, stakeholders have gone to Congress asking for money. Folks have spoken to the leadership at NIMPS uh, asking this be elevated. And I have to be honest, I've not heard anything from NIMPS yet that suggests that there's a need for this. Um, at, at the very least, um, I'm not. I'm not aware anyway. I may, maybe it's going on. I'm not aware of any internal requests for the funding. So, 
I do know that there is some funding coming to NIMPS through uh, the bipartisan bipartisan in infrastructure law and the uh, IRA. And it is my hope that some amount of that funding can go towards um, a hook and line survey, and not just for California, but throughout uh, the areas that are managed by this council. Um, I, I don't want to take anything away from the trawl surveys because those are also important to council managed fisheries, but there is certainly an imbalance in, in resources between the trawl and the non-trawl fisheries in terms of a data collection. Um, we have issues with quillback. We have issues with copper in California. There's issues with canary in other parts of the coast. I think Oregon and Washington um, having to do, frankly, with how the uh, mature females are distributed. Are they distributed in areas accessible to trawl or not? Um, and so I just want to take this opportunity to re reiterate the need for resources. And while I know the planning has to go into it and workshops may be part of it, um, we have an existing hook and line survey in Southern California. I don't think this is, I don't think this needs to be, it needs to be analyzed. It doesn't need to be overanalyzed. And I think that the sooner we can get this started, the better. And I'm hopeful with funding that's now in place, some of that can be dedicated to that purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well said. Anyone else? Executive Director Burton. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is, a, I guess, a question back to Keeley about the take reduction team and uh, that process. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we have uh, the policy directive, the integration of the ESA with Section 7, uh, Section 7 with the Magnuson-Stevens Act process signed by our uh, formerly esteemed uh, assistant regional administrator for fisheries. Um, and the, the process that you described moving forward just leaves some questions in my mind about how we would integrate the council in with the uh, ESA work and the take reduction team. It sounds like a very fast process once the agency starts rolling. Uh, I've always taken the policy directive to be uh, have more sequencing involving the council up front and specifying some of the actions and the range of alternatives and things of that nature. Um, could you help to close that gap in my mind, or is that still under development within the agency about how this process will work? Thanks for the hard question. <clears throat> um, my understanding is that um, because of the statutorily required time limits, all right, so how quick we have to move depends on which fisheries are on the team. Um, if it is sablefish pot only, then there is uh, more time because the fishery impacts um, aren't as severe. If we are pulling in the other category one and two, um, fisheries, which are the state fisheries that interact with humpbacks, there is less time to develop that plan. Then we move into the, we only have six months. Um, I think the timing of that is not flexible. And so that won't leave a lot of options in terms of ongoing council processes. My understanding though, is the, the, the goal of having that seat for the council liaison is trying to walk that line where appropriate, but generally, um, you know, the directive that you're looking at is ESA and what we're talking about is an MMPA process. There isn't a direct connection to council action per se, but there is interest in making sure that we are providing that connection point through that liaison seat. And so I think the council thinking about how do you want to fill that seat, you should be thinking about how you want to try to maintain a connection point with what will happen in that realm versus the, the more typical ESA things that we deal with in the council process. Uh, thank you, I might follow up some more later, but appreciate the answer. Okay, thank you, Keely. Um, then that is. Sorry, that discussion just brought up another question for me and you may not be the one to be able to answer it, but 
who, how, and when is it going to be decided which other fisheries, if any, need to be brought into this process? That's still very unclear to me. Who's going to make that decision? How, um, et cetera? Thanks for the question. Um, it is a NIMS decision. We are taking input through that scoping notice process. Um, we are interested in input from the states as the other possible fisheries are all state fisheries, um, but it is ultimately an agency determination which fisheries are involved in the team. Um, that uh, decision, I don't know the exact time frame beyond, you know, we'll go through scoping, evaluate the, the feedback that we've received. Um, that will play into that two-year period between the scoping notice and then when the team starts its work, um, you know, there's a long period of time of prep work. So I, it'll be on the earlier end that that, that decision is made because it will um, totally drive how we develop that team. And then there is a pretty extensive process of vetting everyone that will go on that team because the teams have such a short amount of time to do their work. Um, there's a lot of time spent on finding the people that can be on the team that are ready to come and make decisions and make compromises and make things happen quickly. So because I understand that that takes a lot of time, the vetting and then the compilation of all of the information that the team will need to use to make decisions, you know, all of the fishery information, the marine mammal information, I think that it happens on the earlier end. But in terms of an exact date, I don't know. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure when and how that gets communicated publicly. Um, I will go and ask for more information. I should have also noted that the overlap of that scoping notice will um, we're expecting will be open during the November council meeting. So if the council is interested um, in hearing more directly um, from our Office of Protected Resources and then the regional protected resources because they will have a more driving role versus uh, sustainable fisheries, I am happy to communicate that and, and look to get those folks involved and, and we can set up, you know, a more focused question and answer and we can have more of that discussion with the people who know more answers than I do. Appreciate that. That actually was really helpful for me. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Keely. Marcy Remco. Well, I didn't have this question until you gave that answer, <laughs> but I just want to clarify the situation with regard to Sablefish longline gear, which is a federal fishery. And earlier you had described that there are several sectors of Sablefish pot gear, but I just want to be sure I'm clear on understanding the situation with regard to inclusion or not including uh, Sablefish longline so the, that sector uh, within the TRT. So maybe you can speak to whether NIMS is wanting a recommendation on that, perhaps from the states, perhaps from the council, or if NIMS will make a determination on that point with or without advice. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Um, the fisheries that we'll be considering, including in a take reduction team and take reduction plan, that is going to stem directly from how they are categorized on the list of fisheries. So we are only considering currently listed category one or category two fisheries for inclusion on a take reduction team. The longline fishery is a category three, so it is not listed as an option. Um, so the sablefish pot fisheries are the only federal ground fish fisheries, and then the state fisheries are the only other options on the table right now. Right now, we are working with what is on the list of fisheries today, what are the categories in the future, you know, we would have that discussion of a fishery were to change categories, that's a different discussion. But today we have to work off of what we have in terms of the fishery impacts. Thank you. That clears it up. Much appreciated. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? Okay. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe that uh, you have heard both from the region as well as the Science Center. You've had discussion about a variety of things. Um, I would say that you have completed your council action, and I can answer any questions if you have them. Otherwise, you're good. Uh, Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't believe we provided feedback with regard to the log the logbooks. It sounded to me from uh, your initial um, 
discussion points that you were seeking input from the council and the states regarding the application of the non-trial logbook in paper form for year two for California and Washington. And just wanting to acknowledge the gap statement on that point. And certainly California concurs uh, with that recommendation that we don't need that second year of paper. Thanks. Thanks, Marcy. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands, so. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think Mr. Gramko hit on an item that we did uh, overlook, and I believe we are, we have answered the questions that McKeeley had, and you have given guidance and had good discussion. All right. Well, thank you, Todd. With that, that goes to G2. Um, it's 1130. Um, we could, um, we're on a break right now, um, but I think we'll go as long as we can. And if somebody needs, um, if we do break, somebody needs to go. Oh, so. <laughs> okay. Well, let's do a short break then. Ten, ten minutes because it is a long walk. Okay. And then uh, we'll come back at uh, 1040, 1140 and uh, go from there and we'll go till noon and we'll break at the right time. So, okay. Very good. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. All right, back in session, and um, I'll look to Marlene to start us off on G2 uh, stock assessments. Marlene. Thanks, Chair Pettinger. We're on a ground fish management agenda item G2, adopt stock assessments. Uh, this is where the council process, uh, in terms of setting ground fish harvest specifications, depends on periodic, periodic assessments of the status of the ground for stocks and reports from assessment review bodies or panels. Uh, the scientific and statistical committee reviews this information and makes recommendations on the best scientific inf information available, as well as the soundness for their use in ground fish uh, fishery management decision making. The, today, the council scheduled to review the assessments and the catch only projections that were conducted during the current stock assessment cycle. Um, as well as consider the advice of the SSC, other adv advisory bodies in the public uh, before adopting um, them for use in ground fish management in 2025 and beyond. Currently in the advanced briefing book, um, there are uh, full stock assessments for copper rockfish in California, black rockfish in Washington, Oregon and California, canary rockfish and petroli sole. There are two data moderate assessments for rex sole and short spine thorny head, as well as a limited sablefish update assessment and catch only projections for widow rockfish and yellow eye rockfish. Uh, the stock assessment documents, as well as the star panel reports, were provided in the advanced briefing book. Additional material are an SSC report and a gap report, as well as public comment for this item. Okay, thank you, Marlene. Questions for Marlene on her overview? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so the Dr. Holland come up and uh, give the SSC report. Welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you, Chair Pettinger. Um, before I get started, um, I'll just note a couple of things. One, um, this report is a little longer than the typical SSC report. Um, so ask for your patience as we get through it. Um, and um, the second thing is to, to note that uh, I do have uh, a couple of <coughs> um, Groundfish subcommittee uh, members uh, and um, star panel chairs uh, online, hopefully, um, John Field, and uh, Jason Schaffler should both be available online to help with questions that I might not be able to answer. Um, so um, just ask that to make sure that they're um, upgraded and able to talk when the time comes. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and uh, start with the SSC report. Um, Again, I'm Dan Holland, chair of the SSC, uh, and I'm reading from agenda item G2A, supplemental SSC report one, September, 2023, the SSC committee report on ground fish management adopts stock assessments. The SSC reviewed the benchmark stock assessments and stock assessment review star panel reports for copper rockfish in California, black rockfish in Washington, Oregon, and California, canary rockfish, and Petrali sole, as well as data moderate assessments for Rex sole and short spine thorny head. The SSC also reviewed recommendations from the SSC's ground fish subcommittee from their review of limited of, of a limited sablefish update assessment and catch only projections for widow rockfish and yellow eye rockfish. 
the SSC offers the following recommendations. First on copper rockfish in California, north and south, uh, assessment and the star report, star panel report. Uh, the 2023 benchmark assessment of copper rockfish in California included two sub area models split at Point, Point Conception, California, with similar structure but additional sources of information relative to the two data moderate assessments developed in 2021. Uh, both models were well-developed and well-documented, and the model results were robust to a fairly broad range of alternative model structures. The results of both models were also consistent with the results of the 2021 data moderate assessments. The California-wide stock status, when the results of both models were combined, estimated the spawning stock output was 36.6% of the unfished level. In the precaution, this is in the precautionary zone below the 40% management target, but above the minimum stock size threshold. However, relative spawning output in the southern model was considerably less than in the north. The SSC recommends that efforts to keep catches proportional to regional biomass would be appropriate to avoid worsening localized depletion. The SSC endorses the 2023 full benchmark assessments of copper rockfish in California north and south of Point Conception as providing the best available science, BSIA, and suitable for informing management decisions. The SSC endorses both sub-area assessments as BSIA. The SSC recommends that both assessments be assigned to category one with a sigma of 0.5. The SSC recommends that the next copper rockfish assessment in California be an update unless new data or research is available. On to Rexol. The 2023 Rexol assessment was a length based data moderate assessment. Rexol was last assessed in 2015 using an index based data moderate approach. The current assessment was structured into a single area with two fleets and used fishery independent data from the Triennial Survey and West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey. The survey assessment estimates the stock at 76.1% of unfish spawning output in 2023, which is above the 25% management target, consistent with the results of the 2013 assessment. Major uncertainties included natural mortality, growth, uh, the bottom trawl survey catchability, uh, research and data needs include additional age data to inform growth and longevity, along with aging air. There's also a need to better understand catchability from the bottom trial survey uh, and update maturity for kind of any other biological information. The SSC endorses the 2023 assessment as BSIA and recommends a category two designation with the default sigma of 1.0. The SSC recommends that the next assessment be a full assessment, assuming additional age data is available to inform growth and improve methods are developed for estimating uh, the Western, the, the uh, bottom trial survey queue. Uh, On to short spine thorny head. The 2023 short spine thorny head assessment was a length based data moderate assessment. It covered the entire US West Coast and used its fishery dependent length compositions and discard data, as well as length compositions and indices of abundance from the triennial survey. Uh, and the West Coast Bottom Trial Survey. Changes from the most recent ass assessment in 2013 include reducing the number of fishing fleets to three, including linked data from the fishery, from the survey and the fishery, updating estimates of catchability, growth, maturity, fecundity, and natural mortality. The current assessment estimates that the relative spawning output of the stock is in the precautionary zone below the management target of 40% of unfished level at 39.4% uh, in 2023. Although recruitment has been relatively stable, spawning output declined considerably from the 1970s to the late 2010s. Major uncertainties include insuff insufficient age composition data and a lack of reliable aging methods, both of which reduce confidence in estimates of growth, maturity, and natural mortality. There was also a lack of concurrence among model-based and design-based indices in the latter portion of the time series, 2021 and 2022. Uh, information about habitat associations, movement, and stock structure is lacking. The SSC endorses the 2023 stock assessment as BSIA and recommends a Category 2 designation with a default sigma of 1.0. The SSC recommends that the next assessment be an update assessment unless new aging information becomes available. Oh, on to black rockfish. Uh, there are three separate black rockfish assessments for Washington, Oregon, and California. Uh, for Washington, the 2023 benchmark assessment for black rockfish off Washington resulted in a relative spawning output of 45.1%, which is above the management target of 40%. 
The model had reasonable fit to data, lacked notable retrospective patterns. A major improvement since the 2015 assessment was a more refined assignment of historical catches to Oregon and Washington. Unfish recruitment uh, was the axis of uncertainty for the decision tables. There was no substantial changes to the assessment following the star panel review. And the SSE endorses this assessment as BSIA, recommends the stock be assigned to a category one with default sigma 0.5 and supports an update assessment for the next assessment. For black rockfish in Oregon, the 2023 benchmark assessment for black rockfish off Oregon had reasonable fits to the data, lacks notable retrospective patterns. Major modifications from the 2015 assessment were the improvement of aging errors, a shift from biological to functional maturity, and addition of an absolute estimate of abundance from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's acoustic survey. Catchability, uh, the cue for the acoustic visual survey represents, it represents the axis of uncertainty for decision tables. Research recommendations include a continuation of the AV survey, which currently provides a single year of data and can't be used to infer trends in absolute abundance. Relative spawning output was 45.2% above the target of 40%. The SSC endorses this assessment as BSIA, recommends the stock be assigned to category one with default sigmas of 0.5 and supports a benchmark assessment the next time this is assessed uh, to address tensions between the length composition and the AV survey data. Black rockfish in California. The 2023 benchmark stock assessment for black rockfish in California consisted of two sub-area models for northern and central areas to approximate spatial and temporal variation in size, composition, exploitation, history, recruitment, and other factors affecting population dynamics. The northern model represents the portion of the stock in U.S. waters from Point uh, Arena to the California-Oregon border, and the central model includes U.S. waters off Point Arena to the U.S.-Mexico border. Black rockfish are rare south of Point Conception, thus data informing the central model are primarily, primarily from the region between Point Conception and Point Arena. Natural mortality is the primary source of uncertainty in the assessment. The two sub-area assessments, estimates of 2023 and the 2023 OFL contributions uh, estimate that 2023 OFL contributions to be 203.8 metric tons in the northern area and 48.5 metric tons in the central area. The statewide, statewide following the stock definition of M31 for black rockfish, the stock is at 37.7% of unfish spawning output in 2023. This is in the precautionary zone below the 40% management target, but above MSST. The relative spawning output trajectory was very similar to that estimated in 2015 assessment and has shown recent increases. The current assessment is technically sound, draws upon multiple fishery dependent and independent data sources and results in robust estimates of depletion. The, the SSC supports the modeling approach and the basis for the decision tables. The SSC endorses the 2023 20, sub area assessments of black rockfish in California SBSIA. And the SSC recommends that both sub area assessments be assigned category one with the default sigma of 0.5. The SSC recommends the next assessment be a full assessment to account for migration rates between northern and central areas and spatially explicit life history if available. Okay, on to canary rockfish. The 2023 benchmark assessment for canary rockfish encompassed a single area along the US West Coast. This is a modification from the stock assessment conducted in 2015, which was spatially explicit and reflected different distinct areas for California, Oregon, and Washington. Five fleets per state and three fishery independent indices of abundance, the triennial survey, the West Coast bottom trawl survey, and the rockfish pre-recruit surveys were included in the model, most with sex-specific selectivity. Natural mortality was updated to be age invariant. The relative spawning output is estimated to be 35.1%, placing it in the precautionary zone between the management target of 40% and the MSST of 25%. This assessment estimates a lower ratio of current to unfished biomass, uh, known as depletion, than the 2015 assessment and suggests that the stock never achieved the rebuilding target. Sensitivity analysis indicates that, di that differences between the 2015 and 2023 assessment models were primarily, primarily due to how natural mortality and selectivity were parameterized. 
parameterized. The SSC supports modeling, the modeling approach and agrees that the model fits the data well. The SSC endorses the 2023 stock assessment as BSIA that supports a category one designation for canary rockfish and a default sigma of 0.5 and recommends that the next assessment be an update assessment unless new information becomes available to redefine natural mortality or, or steepness. Okay, um, petroleum sole. The 2023 petroleum sole assessment a benchmark uh, <coughs> petroleum sole benchmark benchmark stock assessment modeled a single stock with fisheries stratified as North Washington and Oregon and South California. The last full assessment was in 2013 with update assessments in 2015 and 2019. Historical catches were updated for Washington state and these combined with reductions in more recent discard estimates were key contributing factors to changes in stock biomass relative to past assessments. The fraction of unfished spawning output is estimated to be 33.6% uh, in 2023, which is above the management target of 25% for flatfish stocks. The primary axis of uncertainty is female natural mortality. Spawning output is projected to decline in the future, but remains above the MSS. ST under all production pro projections from the high and low states of nature. This decline is due to poor recruitment in recent years, which contrasts with high recruitment events in 2006 and 2008 that resulted in rebuilding of the stock from overfish conditions. An environmental index of recruitment for a trolley soil was developed, but required additional review and was not included in the base model. The SSC supports the modeling approach, agrees that the model fits the data well, and agrees that with the conclusions of the 2023 petroleum soil assessment. The SSC endorses the 23 assessment uh, of, of petroleum soil as BSIA and recommends the stock assessment be designated as category one with the default sigma of 0.5 and suggests the next assessment be an update assessment. Okay, on to sablefish. Um, the 2023 stock assessment update for sablefish was motivated by observations of higher recruitment in 2020 and 2021 in the West Coast uh, Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey, uh, which observes age zero and age one sablefish. The update was limited in scope and includes ages from the Bottom Trawl Survey, but not from the commercial fishery. The assessment incorporates an environmental index for recruitment, which was also updated. The assessment estimates the stock is 63% of unfished biomass in 2023, above the 40% management target. Fishery information and anecdotal accounts regarding high bycatch of small sable fish support the existence of one or more strong cohorts entering the population. However, there is greater uncertainty in the strength of these recent year classes than for older year classes with more years of observations to verify the year class strength. The SSC endorses the 2023 sable fish update assessment as BSIA. SSC recommends the stock assessment be designated as a category one assessment with the default sigma of 0.5. And the SSC recommends the next stable fish assessment be a full assessment given the uncertainty and limited observations of recent cohorts, additional age data from the fishery and the potential effects of density dependence at high abundance. Uh, we also have two catch only projections for widow rockfish and yellow eye rockfish. The SSC discussed the catch only projections for widow rockfish and yellow eye rockfish and had no technical concerns. The widow rockfish catch only projection was based on the 2019 update assessment. Given the small differences in actual versus assumed catch, the percent of unfished spawning biomass in 2025 only increased slightly from 75.6% to 81.1% with the updated values and the acceptable biological catch, ABC, increased from uh, 10,533 metric tons to 11,237 metric tons. The yellow eye rockfish catch only projection was based on the 2017 rebuilding analysis. Differences between actual versus assumed catch were small, and there was a correspondingly small increase in the 2025 projected acceptable biological catch from 76.5 to 87.2 metric tons. The rebuilding target of 40% on fish spawning biomass is projected to be reached in 2028. Uh, the SSC endorses both catch projections as BSIA. And that concludes the SSC report. And I would be happy to take questions um, as well as potentially get some support from uh, my colleagues that are online to answer any questions that I'm unable to. Thank you, Dan. And um, I don't see them online, so.
Uh oh. They might have abandoned you. So, <laughs> with that, um, questions of uh, the SSC? Lynn Mattis. Thank you, Dr. Holland, for the thorough report. Did the SSC have any discussion or was it brought up at all that? All of the rockfish stock assessments this cycle have the biomass uh, scaled downward and what the trend might be, why that might be happening. Uh, any discussion about that? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Mattis. Um, I don't think we, we didn't have a discussion about it in those terms to, to you know, say why all of them were, if there was a, you know, a pattern um, in this. There were certainly discussions for each individual stock assessment um, in cases where there was a decline. Uh, and, um, you know, there are different reasons for that um, for each individual case. Um, some of them relate to changes in data. Some of them re relate to changes in assumptions in the, in the, in the assessment. Um, but we did not, I don't recall a discussion about sort of an overall pattern. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the, that answer. Thank you, Len. Um, I was uh, I was wrong. I, I see John's name there, so. so. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> My heart's beating again now. Um, let me take one more question, but I think it, it is noon, and I think we pretty, probably should break here shortly and go to lunch and come back and finish this. Uh, I'll, I'll probably have a lot of questions for you. So. Marcy, your room go. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, question on the petroleum section. Uh, your statement indicates that the SSC agrees with the conclusions of the 2023 petroleum sole assessment. And I just don't see that similar language in any of the other assessments. And I'm just wondering if you don't agree with the include the conclusions of some of the other assessments or if, if there was something unique or special about Petroli. Uh, thank you for the, for the question. Um, I do not believe um, that, 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 that lack of that language elsewhere is reflective of, of a lack of, of um, support for, of the conclusions. I think each of these sections were written by different, uh, we divided up the, the effort here uh, amongst the SSC members. And uh, so these sections were written, we tried to try as much as possible, um, keep them uniform, um, but that maybe is something that slipped through the cracks. Uh, and um, as far as I can see, um, the, you know, there was support for the conclusions of all of these assessments. And if you, in fact, if you look at the star panel reports and the ground fish subcommittee reports, um, that that is reflected, I think, uh, in each case. Great, thank you for the, the clarification. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Um, Dan, we're gonna break here for lunch. And so we've been asked uh, Jason and John to uh, come back at uh, one o'clock and uh, we'll pursue, uh, I'm pretty sure, further questions from the uh, SSC here. So with that, we'll break till, till one, okay? Great. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Might have to read. Okay. And we're back, and uh, I've been notified that everybody should check their internet connection because um, the system was rebooted, and to make sure you're you're hooked up appropriately. So, okay, with that, we were in the middle of the SSC um, report, I guess, to, on the uh, dealing with the questions to the SSC. And so uh, with that, um, we'll open up the questions for uh, Dr. Holland and uh, SSC report. So, Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Dan. I'm, I'm gonna have a couple questions. And the first one on Petroli, more of a process question. And uh, on the on the matter of the environmental index, um, you know, I think the I had the chance to listen to the in on the star panel and um, understand the issue was main was mainly there wasn't a, wasn't as much time as hoped to have looked at that given some changes in, in the oceanographic models or or, or some such thing. But um, that one has been a candidate for for bringing an environmental index to it for a long time, and so it was somewhat disappointing to, um, in, for understandable reasons, to see it not come together this time. Um, and, and so there was some discussion at the star panel about how could that be um, looked at, short of having to wait for the for an, another full assessment, which could be you know years and years from now. Um, did you did you all discuss? Just my question is where. Did you discuss it? And if not, if the council was interested in the SSC having that discussion of how could like how could your normal process might be modified to um, consider adopting that index in an update assessment or or otherwise, where would we ask you to do that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Niles, for that question to the chair. Um, we did not. We I mean we did discuss that. The absence of that index um, and you know why it wasn't used, um, which, as you noted, was due to the fact that this there was this discontinuity in the ROMS model that was needed for that um, 
which we didn't have for the sablefish one because that is didn't rely on a on, on that uh, oceanographic model. Um, I believe my understanding was looking at from my review of the of the um, petroleum assessment was that they were they did use uh, an index. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it was parameterized given that discontinuity in the oceanographic uh, model. Um, that did look at that with a sensitivity, use this, do a sensitivity analysis and, and, um, it did have some impact. Um, but, um, so I think that was evaluated by the, by the star panel. Um, but, um, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of trying to, to include that in an update assessment, whether what, what that process would be, um, <clears throat> Uh, I can might this might be a good one to to um, see if we can get some from help help from um, John Field or who was the star panel chair on that one. Um, but let, let me see if I can if I can get some some help from uh, John Field. He might be able to give you more of an answer on that. I see John is up and his uh, mic is open. So John. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pedregger. Thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question. Um, we did talk about process-wise what it might take. Currently, within the terms of reference, it would, in theory, require benchmark uh, assessment and review to fold in an environmental index. But we write the terms of reference, so it's not entirely impossible to consider that we could um, find a way to perhaps have a ground fish subcommittee uh, more in-depth review of an update assessment that in included the potential for an index like this to be included uh, in a future assessment. So I think we had discussed perhaps considering this more at the um, process review, formerly known as postmortem, that we do following every assessment cycle to discuss whether or not an option like that might make sense in light of the fact that you know, people were feeling fairly good about the index to a point, but not quite to the point between the, the stat and the panel that they were ready to include it in the base model. So hopefully that helps to address your question. I can uh, try and elaborate if not. Great. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks, John. Perfect. Sounds like you're um, slated to discuss it already. So you're definitely interested in hearing the um, outcome of that. Okay. For the questions for the SSC? Corey? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll try to get this one out. And I guess I'm looking at the, the um, canary, the paragraph on canary. And one of the things we heard this morning and, and in discussions coming into this meeting is just, um, you know, despite having, you know, the uh, top stock assessment scientists in the world and, and uh, you know, thorough peer review process, these these assessments jump jump around, and as I think Lynn got to in her question, um, a lot, the trend this time was um, down, and at least in scale for a lot of the stocks. And you know the you know it's from the I think I think I remember hearing Steve Ralston say back when working on the, the Sigma question that the biggest source of change between assessments is changing assessors. Um, so and you have a sentence here in. In the, in the canary paragraph again, and I guess the, I'll try to ask the question here more succinctly, but how much of that change and hope is because of new things we learned and collecting data from, from 2015 versus, um, I think you highlight here the changes in, in uh, selectivity and some maybe natural mortality. Yeah, and Dan, I made this one one's for John, but and maybe it's not a fair question, but you probably get what I'm going at and um, if any, any, getting at and any thoughts just on, 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 on these change assumptions and how much they affect the result versus the new information coming in. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Niles. Um, I will uh, go ahead and, um, and uh, ask John Field to weigh in on that um, question. Um, I think he can do probably a better job than I could. Uh, and he was the star panel chair for that. So John, are you still there? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question. Uh, it, it's a good question. 
Uh, it's definitely hard to say exactly. Uh, a lot of things have changed between 2015 and now, but I, I would say that the 2015 assessment, as noted, was a, a spatially explicit assessment. This one is not. And the 2015 assessment dealt with female natural mortality in a very different way um, than this assessment did. This assessment assumed that natural mortality was age invariant. The 2015 assessment uh, assumed that it increased quite a bit uh, for kind of younger female canary rockfish to try and understand why there seems to be a dearth of uh, older female canary rockfish relative to male canary rockfish in many of the data sets that we see. So I would say that probably uh, changes in the modeling uh, a bit more than changes in the data contributed to that change in perception. But that said, uh, in 2015, uh, the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey kind of suggested a bit of an increase in biomass that didn't kind of continue. If you look at the fits to the survey data, there are, is not an indication of a sharp increase. Um, in some sensitivity analyses we did during the star panel week, that survey was not terribly influential. There's two ways of looking at that. It, it, it's not terribly influential or it's consistent with the structure of the model. Um, so what I would say is that there's no information coming in that suggests that the, the trend is off or that we're underfitting an increase uh, that's inferred from the best survey data that we have, recognizing that that survey is not ideal, as we've discussed many times for um, species like canary that um, are mostly associated with untrollable habitat. So, you know, a long-winded way of saying that it, it, it's definitely a bit of both. Um, one thing we also discussed, though, is we are starting to see more older females in some of the data sets, uh, particularly for some of the fixed gear fisheries, which is consistent with the idea that uh, these older canary are often found in untrollable habitats. So there's some hope and potential as the fishery develops to understand a little bit better how best to deal with natural mortality parameterizations, but I, I, I would say that both the assessment team and the panel were very comfortable with the decisions that were made um, for this model in this round. And I hope that mostly addresses your question, but I'm happy to follow up if not, if that's not the case. Corey? Yeah, thanks, John. I guess just a, a follow-up question that you might not have a lot of thoughts on now, and maybe it's a topic for our next agenda item, but kind of on the lines of my last question on Petroleum, and how do we if we're interested in, in a discussion happening, how do we encourage the uh, stock assessment community and SSC to start it? And so I'm, I think um, there's been some good discussions about, you know, uncertainty between, you know, um, within a model, but then the uncertainty on, on, on different models. And you've seen, for example, the Halibut Commission use ensemble models to, to get at some of that uncertainty between various assumptions and models. And um, just if we were interested in, in getting you all to discuss how we might think about it maybe differently than we go for this best model approach here at this council. Um, do you think that's something you, you might all be discussing as part of the, uh, what, what we're not supposed to be calling the postmortem, or is there a way to, uh, you know, wonder if, um, you know, think about methodology reviews or workshops and if, that we could, we could, you know, pose the question to you all if, if that's a, a topic that, you're interested in, in, in discussing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question. Um, I'm not, I know that we've discussed ensemble modeling approaches in the past. Uh, some time ago, there were, we did also receive a presentation from Mark Monder and other staff at the IATTC about the, the approaches they're using with ensemble models for highly migratory species. And I think there was a lot of interest that's certainly a, a very promising approach and, and something that um, we should be thinking about as we move forward and move ahead. It adds to the complexity of both developing the models and uh, conducting the reviews. But um, if it ends up with more robust products, then that's probably a direction we should be heading. We didn't explicitly talk about it at any of the panels or subcommittee meetings uh, during this assessment cycle, but I would certainly agree and, and flag this for something that we could discuss at the process workshop uh, later on this year, early next year. Thank you, Corey. For the questions? 
Okay. Actually, I, I do have one. Um, uh, John, um, I was at the star panel uh, for a couple of days and, uh, and last night, I know it came to me last night, but uh, about the dearth of um, older females, given that the stock assessment shows that in 2000, there was less than 10% of the biomass in the water. Um, and the fact it's understood, it's understood like, for the most part that the females tend to be in the untrollable habitat. Um, how many older females, truly old females do you expect to see given the stock where it was at 20 years ago? And um, the second part of that question would be, you say that some of the hook and line information we're seeing is starting to see some of that. And uh, we hope to get more information as that fish redevelops. Um, the stock assessment as we will likely ap approve it today, uh, will probably suspend any uh, activity in that fishery. So what might you say could we do to backfill the information gathering from the for canary rockfish? So, two part question, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pettinger, for the question. Um, that's a good one. We did talk about, so essentially, when, when the fishery was dramatically scaled back in the early 2000s, one thing we talked about was, you know, landings were very low, and consequently, so was the flow of data, age samples, length data, um, all, all the data that helped, the fishery-dependent data that helped inform the assessment. Uh, following the 2015 assessment, catches increase in data started flowing again. And there was some discussion that we're now getting this nicer glimpse of what the age structure is, is looking like for Canary. And this is gonna be very helpful in trying to address these questions in the long term. Those, those fish are now in their early 20s, which is close to the time at which previous analyses have suggested that there's, you know, they either become less available to the fishery or perhaps are dying at a, at a higher rate. Um, so the hope is certainly that data will continue to flow from some fisheries and help better inform and understand sort of that process and, and what's truly going on uh, with the biology of the species. In terms of constraints on future fixed gear, yeah, I, I would definitely be sympathetic to the idea that it's a double-edged sword um, and it, the consequence of a more pessimistic perception of this stock might be that the data flow is reduced as fisheries are increasingly constrained. I don't have a solution for that, but perhaps there are opportunities to do um, cooperative surveys uh, using similar hook and line gear uh, to some of the fixed gear fisheries to help kind of address or alleviate that that paucity of data. Obviously, as discussed earlier, you know, a, a better hook and line uh, fishery independent surveys coastwide would be helpful for quite a number of stocks. And there's certainly a lot of interest and hope that we could do more of that to better understand these questions. I, I hope that answers your question. I'm happy to try and follow up if helpful. Oh, that, that's fine, John. Thank you. Okay, further questions for the SSC? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you all. Thank you. Next up will be the gap report. Gary Richter. Welcome back, Gary. Thanks again, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Good afternoon. Be reading from agenda item G2A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on adopti Adopting Stock Assessments. Gap offers the following comments and recommendation on the adoption of stock assessments. The current assessments appear, on average, to be more pessimistic than the prior assessments. As we note below, funding for an expanded hook and line survey and or survey coverage in shallower depths would provide a more complete picture for several important species. For full assessments, California copper rockfish, GAP supports the SSC endorsement of the 2023 full assessment of copper rockfish in California as providing the best scientific information available suitable for informing management decisions for 2025 and beyond. GAP notes that the Northwest Fisheries Science Center Hook and Line Survey is the only long-term fishery independent survey in untrollable habitat in the Southern California Bight, but that this survey has traditionally focused on shelf rockfish species. Funding ex and expansion of this survey into shallower waters in the Bight should strongly be considered so that more near shore species such as copper rockfish might be better sampled to inform future assessments. 
Future near shore assessments in California would also greatly benefit from additional California Department of Fish and Wildlife remotely operated vehicle surveys, which could increase the power of these data to better inform assessments. SCAP strongly supports the stock assessment team's 14 recommendations suggested under the research and data needs portion of the copper rockfish stock assessment. For black rockfish, SCAP supports the SSC endorsements of the 2023 full assessments of black rockfish in California, Oregon, and Washington as providing BSIA finds it suitable for informing management decisions for 2025 and beyond. For canary rockfish, GAP accepts the SSC endorsement of the 2023 full assessment of the Canary Rockfish Assessment as providing the BSIA and suitable for informing management for 2025 and beyond. Anecdotal information shared from participants in coastwide fisheries during the GAP's discussion indicates higher canary abundance seen on the grounds than is reflected in the results of the assessment. The GAP notes there continues to be a problem with the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey having very low encounter rates of canary rockfish, which is likely because the survey has limited access to rocky habitat. GAP believes most of the large spawners tend to congregate in these large areas, in, excuse me, in these areas of rocky habitat. As was suggested in the STAR panel report, there is a need for non-trawl coastwide fishery independent surveys to improve abundance indices. GAP recommends funding an expansion of the hook and line survey into northern waters to sample canary rockfish in those non-trawlable areas. GAP also strongly supports the STAT's seven recommendations suggested under the research and data needs portion of that uh, canary rockfish stock assessment. For Petroli Sole, GAP supports the SSC endorsement of the Petroli Sole assessment as providing BSIA and is suitable for informing management for 2025 and beyond. GAP notes that the petroleum stock is healthy and nowhere near minimum stock size threshold, but there continues to be questions about recruitment strength. GAP notes the survey may be missing areas where the juveniles are found, which is less than uh, which is shallower than 40 fathoms. An environmental index has been developed that could be used to better inform estimates of recruitment and cohort strength in recent model years. Both the STAR panel and Petroli STAT agreed that this promising tool needed more evaluation before using it as an index of abundance. GAP strongly encourages continuing the development of this index. Uh, data moderate assessments for Rex, Sole, and Short Spine Thornyhead. GAP supports the SSC endorsement of the, both the Rex, Sole, and Short Spine Thornyhead data moderate assessments, BSIA, and are suitable for informing management for 2025 and beyond. GAP notes there continues to be an absence of aging methods for short spine thorny head, and that makes it very difficult to estimate growth. GAP hopes that the National Marine Fisheries Service will continue to pursue aging methodologies for short spine, as it is assumed to be a very long-lived long -lived species. Uh, Sablefish update assessment. GAP supports the SSC endor endorsement of the Sablefish assessment as BSIA and it's suitable for informing management for 2025 and beyond. And lastly, uh, catch only projections of widow and yellow eye rockfish reports. GAP reviewed the widow and yellow eye rockfish catch only projections report. The GAP understands that, uh, I changed the wording here a little bit. Uh, GAP understands that rebuilding has been shortened one more year following the correction to the P-STAR values in the harvest specifications. And my thanks to Keeley and Chantel for straightening me out on that terminology there. Be glad to take any questions anybody has. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Questions on the GAP report? Bob Dooley. Thanks, Gary, for the good report there. Just real simple question. I noticed in almost every uh, every one of the stock assessments, you say the GAP supports, but in Canary, it says you gap, the GAP accepts. Was that, is, is that a, is there a difference there? Should I, what did, is there any, is there a reason you chose the word accepts rather than all the rest of them say supports? Mr. Chair, good catch, Bob. Yes, it was intentional. We had quite the discussion in the gap about canary rockfish. Folks aren't happy, fixed gear, trawl, recreational, round the table. Everybody's seeing those fish catching a whole lot of fish and they're not buying into the assessment. Um, the biggest thing was what came out of that 2015 assessment, obviously, you know, where it said that stock was in great shape and we saw these giant ACLs for all these years and stuff. And all of a sudden the new assessment is saying that we were never rebuilt or we were never overfished. So 
uh, it's just hard for people to accept. And I would say yours truly included, but I've been doing this a long time, so nothing surprises me anymore. So thank you, Bob. For the questions uh, for Gary? Marcy Urimko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Gary. On the uh, environmental uh, index that is in development for Petroli, um, I know you're supporting uh, continuing development of the index. Can you talk a little bit about the potential application beyond Petroli, or is this a one species type of a thing? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Marcy, yeah, I, we didn't really talk about that. Did, I mean, it's not the same. Is it the same as the Sablefish one, Marlene? It's not. No, okay. Yeah. Um, no, beyond, I mean, I, I'm assuming it could be used for other flatfish, but I, you know, can I phone a friend? Is John still on there? John could probably answer it, but, you know, we just, it looked like it was really driving the stock upward for whatever reason, um, you know, when we did look at it. But I think it just came down to a time series. Uh, just, you know, we just didn't have the data accumulating across the time series for it to be usable in the assessment yet. That was my understanding. Uh, John does have his hand up if you'd like to. Oh, good. Thanks, John. John, can you <laughs> help us out here? Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ramco, for the question. Uh, I think a brief answer would be that the index was more or less developed uh, specifically for petroli um, and is, is kind of thought about that way. Petroli uh, larvae are in the water column for much shorter period of time than uh, larvae and pelagic juveniles of rockfish and many other flatfish. So it is kind of a species specific index, but this type of index and type of approach would all but certainly have potential to be developed and to help inform other assessments, but they would be newly, they would be different indices. I, I hope that covers the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thanks, Thank John. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fields. So, okay, Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Gary. I think this, this is probably going to be a tough one, but maybe John can help you out again. But maybe you got the explanation. But I was just just cluing into the your statement there about the T target for yellow eye going back a year, based on this correction to P star. Although the catch has been under the ACL continually somewhat if, if catches lower the the t target has usually been based on an assumption that of acls being caught in full um, it, how can the how did the rebuilding slow down did you hear that explanation and i look someone else might have an answer mr chair Corey, i botched this thing up so badly <laughs> I'm going to have to defer to somebody because, yeah, I, I totally misunderstood. For some reason, I thought we were T target was originally 2027 or rebuilding was 2027. Boy, did I botch that. I missed something somewhere. So I will defer to someone, anybody. Keely? Thanks. Um, yes. The current T target for yellow eye rockfish is 2029. I think several of us have forgotten the change that we made back in 2019 where we extended the rebuilding time. We bought more catch by extending the rebuilding analysis by two years. So it used to be a T target of 2027, but it has been a T target of 2029 for quite a bit of time now. So the SSC report says that because we've been under attaining, it looks like it will rebuild one year faster than what we've been working on now but everyone's had that 2027 number in their mind so it's that's the confusion does that help okay thank right. you thank you keely okay further questions for gary okay thank you thank you gary. all right okay that uh, that is our uh, our reports management and advisory body reports takes us oh It takes us to a public comment, and um, I think we have three people signed up at least. I'm waiting for the list to come up. And there it is. And Merritt, you are you are correct in your uh, standing to approach the bench. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, council members. I have a uh, presentation. Um, we too noted, as other council members have, 
that there was a general trend across all stock assessments for the current stock assessments to, to shoot under the previous stock assessment for the time of the previous, for the ending date of the previous stock assessment. And so I put together a few slides uh, of excerpts from those stock assessments. Um, the, the graphs themselves are um, designed to show different things, but these are the ones that I picked because they did show the uh, current base model and the previous base model. Um, next slide, please. So here we see the, um, the copper stock assessment. It's the uh, previous 2013 copper stock assessment um, as the red line, and then the data moderate um, length-based copper stock assessment of 2021. And it's here that you can really see the, the change where the, um, at the time, and in this case, 2013, um, that um, stock result was considerably higher than where the trajectory of the current or the 2021 stock assessment uh, put it. And I, I'm going to stop with the um, more dis the the more complete description and just go through the rest of the slides fairly quickly. Next slide, please. So th this is a 2013 or 2023 stock assessment. Um, the red line here is north and the blue line is south. And basically the point here is that um, the 2023 and the 2021 stock assessments are fairly similar. There was a downward tra trajectory in the 2021 and it's continued and uh, we lost a couple of tons in the south. Next slide, please. And here's Oregon black rockfish. Um, we have in the red, um, Oh, that typo still exists. That's 2015. And in the blue, 2023, once again, the current one shoots underneath the end of the 2021 or 2015. Next slide, please. And here we have Petrali Sol. We see the same thing. Uh, the red line is 2019 and the black is the 2023. Notice for the 2019 year, the black line is uh, cast underneath it. Next slide, please. And here's canary rockfish, and, and you guys, the council members have already spoken about this. Uh, blue line is 2015, and the red is a 2023 base model. Once again, far underneath the 2015 stock. Next slide, please. And then we have um, Rexol, and it's hard, harder to see because there are so many lines here. But the black line is 2023 uh, base model, and the red is our 2013 base model. It's hard to see the small print. And then um, the red is 2023. And I understand that the typos are fixed in what's in the briefing book now. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a um, sablefish. So it's this one's even harder to see. Yellow is 2021 and red is 2023. And this is a stock assessment that had very positive results. Um, both stock assessments follow essentially the same track line with 2023 ever so slightly above 2021 along its course in the most recent years. And I think that's the last slide. And so I'd be glad to take any questions, but quite honestly, John Fields would have to save me on pretty much anything because all I did was notice the trend and I, I have no way to explain exactly why it might be. All right, questions for Mary? Lynn Mattis. Uh, thank you, Chair Pettinger, and maybe more of a comment. Um, thank you for providing this. Um, I am somewhat relieved to know that I'm not the only one wearing the tinfoil hat on the how all of these assessments the last two cycles something seems to be pulling the scale down of the biomass um, bless sean dr wetzel for uh trying to help me with this um but uh i'm gathering you didn't get any real you haven't been able to find any real reason to explain why all of these are happening um trying to frame this as a question and not get into discussion yet <laughs> um 
but you, you didn't find anything that explained all of these overall, just that you noticed them. And that's what you're trying to point out to us, I guess is what I'm asking. That's, that's pretty much the case. I did ask John Budrick and he did provide an answer, but I, I'm not even going to dare to summarize what his answer was. Um, you might ask him if you would like. Um, Thank you, Merritt. That's about where I am with Dr. Wetzel's answers to me. Appreciate the, the feedback. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Thank you Merritt. Anyone else? And Merritt, I'd just like to say that uh, in MRAP, we were, were told that, uh, so, or at least understood that all assessments are wrong, some are useful. So uh, I'll leave you with that. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up will be uh, Michael Gudowski. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Good afternoon to you. For the record, my name is Michael Kaneski, and I'm just representing myself. Um, I'll be speaking on canaries specifically, and just kind of give you a view of what happens in the processing end when you have a lightning strike. When lightning strikes occur, it can dramatically impact processor operations and have a ripple effect for markets. This happened to Pacific Warrington about 10 years ago when one of our fishermen went over his annual quota limit for a bycatch species. Our Warrington plant shut down operations for 30 days, or the whiting operations, I should say. We lost the entire crew and we couldn't find a replacement vessel, I think for a little bit longer than that even. But, or full-time one, I should say. If the fishermen reports for canary are correct, the chance of an individual plant shutdown or even an entire fishery are a realistic possibility. This may be unnecessarily pessimistic. Hopefully there will be no shutdowns. Even so, bycatch avoidance maneuvers are costly. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Questions for Mike on his testimony? Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Jeff Lackey. Welcome, Jeff. Yes, thank you, Chair and Council members for your time. My name is Jeff Lackey. I manage two trawl vessels out of Newport. I have two points about the canary stock assessment, one on the assessment itself and one on the impact. Uh, the assessment, uh, the the old canary stock assessment showed a five plus biomass above 30,000 metric ton estimated in 2008. The new stock assessment doesn't estimate above 30,000 metric ton level until 2034. Th that is a difference of 26 years. These are very different results. Which assessment is closer to reality? Anecdotally, from all three states and across fisheries, canary biomass is very healthy and has grown and continues to grow. The gut reaction is the older assessments much closer to reality. In fact, many of us advocated for canary to be assessed this cycle because we thought the anecdotal would translate to a result of greater abundance of this species, so important to so many fisheries in many areas. As far as the impact of the canary assessment, the pr projected reduction in canary ACL could be very impactful. Canary is rarely a trawl target species, but 60 to 70 trawl vessels need to have and use canary quota pounds. Canary catch events can be random and large as the stock has seemingly been growing over the last several years. Available canary quota pounds to lease have become more difficult to find the past two years, uh, 2022 and 2023. A significant allocation reduction could worsen the situation significantly. The smaller the quota supply of a universal bycatch species gets, the tighter people hold on to it because they are one lightning strike away from being in a deficit that they are uncertain about covering. And that could have a big impact on fishing, especially if that species population is healthy, as is anecdotally the case with canary. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff? Okay, I'll see you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, with that, that uh, concludes public comment and takes us to uh, council discussion and action.
So with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Lynn Mattis. Let's see. I sort of alluded to this when Merritt was speaking. Um, this has nothing, my comments have nothing to do with our stock assessors or our stat teams. They're some of the most intelligent and diligent people I've ever worked with. They have done everything they can to try to ensure that the best information, the best model is being used. But I have some concerns and Again, I appreciate Dr. Wetzel for trying to help alleviate these. She and I have exchanged a number of emails. Um, I don't know if I'm just being daft or if it's so complicated, uh, and this is not a slight against her efforts. What, one issue that comes up in addition to something seems to be pulling everything down as far as the scale of the biomass the last two cycles is how complicated stock synthesis has become. Spoken with uh, somebody within ODFW who uh, has worked in stock assessments in other places, and he said stock synthesis is not used in other arenas because it's too complicated. Again, these are the some of the most intelligent people I've ever met, and at least once an assessment, I hear somebody say, oh, I don't know what that does. I don't know why that's there when referring to stock synthesis. Rick Mathot has to get contacted uh, for help by some of those every now and again to, for help with stock synthesis. What happens when Rick retires? Who are we going to call? And I don't think it's gonna be the Ghostbusters. So has stock synthesis, the model that we're using become overly complicated? Two cycles ago, it seemed everything was hinging on rec deeds, which it took me two assessments that year to learn meant rec uh, recruitment deviate deviations, not recreational development. This year, everything seemed to be, a lot of stuff seemed to be relying on Sigma R. I asked for a definition of Sigma R, and it was copied directly out of the SS handbook to me and sent to me. I understand the individual words. I do not understand the sentence of those individual words combined together. I cannot go and talk to my public or the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission and explain to them what Sigma R is. Sigma, I think, means change, and R, I'm assuming in this case, means recruitment, so to, it's likely something to do with change in recruitment over time. But again, this process has become complicated, so complicated that good, bad, or in between, the results are difficult to explain to people who are not immersed in this process. I'm trying to figure out how I go to the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission in December and explain to them, we're going to be looking at a 40% cut in black rockfish for 25 and 26 and beyond. When every indication within the state of Oregon says rock fit, black rockfish is healthy or increasing. Same thing with canary rockfish. How do we explain to them a decrease in canary? The assessments are what they are. I don't think we can legally do anything other than adopt what they are. But there are concerns, um, myself, as well as other staff within ODFW, about stock synthesis itself and how complicated this process has become. And again, this is nothing against our assessors. They are hardworking people trying to do the right thing, using everything they have at their uh, fingertips to try to come up with the best results, of it, or the most accurate results available. Uh, with that, I think I'll end. Thank you, Lynn. For the discussion. Marcy Rimko. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, certainly, uh, there are several outcomes here that I think are going to be um, difficult for us to work through um, allocation schemes, reductions, and opportunities. Um, a number of challenges I think we see ahead. Um, but I guess I would like to take the opportunity here to think a little bit um, about the process that we undertook this cycle with stock assessments. And um, there was a silver lining um, in the sense that there were a number of advances um, and developments in our public process and the um, availability of data 
and a lot of public review. I want to really shout out a big thank you to Chantel and her team for spending so much time with California on the copper assessment um, meetings uh, weekly to go through data, data streams, trends. Um, we put a lot, a lot of energy and blood, sweat, and tears into this collectively, and um, certainly um, a lot. There was a lot of leadership, and I want to acknowledge it. And while we don't necessarily like the outcomes here in many cases, um, the commitment to the pre-assessment data workshops, um, discussions uh, after those workshops about um, assumptions. And, you know, just working uh, step by step with the assessors as they um, developed um, the drafts, I, I think has just been, um, uh, it cannot go unnoticed. So I just really wanted to, to thank um, the whole crew involved and want to um, compliment council staff on the development of the PAM site and the ability for um, information to be posted uh, in advance of meetings with, you know, opportunity for everyone to follow along and participate remotely. So um, thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Further discussion? So Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, at the risk of piling on a little bit. Um, this will be my last chance to do this. So on stock assessment. So, um, one of the things that has been the most frustrating for me, at least over the years, is that um, we don't have any way to evaluate the effectiveness, effectiveness of our management measures because we're, we never get a chance to compare apples to apples. From one assessment to the next, there are so many changes from assessment to assessment um, you have no idea whether what you have been doing as managers in terms of managing to our ACLs are being effective or not. Um, and I used to live in a, well, maybe sometimes I still do in a land of panacea that we would get to a point where we'd, where we would be able to assess whether our management measures were achieving the management objectives by use of stock assessments. I don't, I don't ever see that happening. And um, I, I like uh, in many ways with, with Lynn in, in the Black Rockfish assessment in Washington, the only reason Washington isn't facing a similar situation that Oregon is is that our fishery shifted offshore and is we are we are catching far more yellowtail and canary now than we did a decade ago and fewer black rockfish otherwise this black rockfish assessment and the acl that goes with it at about 240 we were catching 350 and plus and we a decade ago and we would be in that same the only reason we're, we're going to probably squeak by without having to have a lot of major restrictions is because of that shift. Otherwise, we'd, we'd, we'd be in serious trouble. Um, and I, um, I, I think like Lynn, are, are hearing and observing that our Black Rock Fish resource has not demonstrated that kind of a reduction in the biomass that the assessment indicates. So, and I think the um, points that Lynn made about the complexity and the ability to explain, let alone understand some of the variables that are in uh, our, our assessments and with the slightest tweak of one dial like natural mortality, you can completely change what, you, what, the, what that stock looks like. And um, so it's, I'm just voicing frustration. Um, I know I, it doesn't do any good. Um, I, I, like others, have a tremendous respect for our stock assessment authors and all the hard work that goes in 
to these assessments. And I know that they're trying to give us the very best scientific information they can about these stocks. Um, uh, but that said, it's, it's very frustrating to come to this, a point like this every other year when we get new assessments. Thank you, Phil. Further discussion? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Phil, for those comments and kind of same, same line of thought. I guess everyone hears me incessantly talk about MREP. And over my experience with MREP, I've come to know our stock assessors. I've come to know all, of, all the people involved in making the soup. And they're top notch. They're just the best. And I recall it's been five or so years ago, we had an EBFM workshop through MREP, a national workshop that was in San Diego, actually La Jolla. And it was, um, it was, a, it was about EBFM. And the conversation that struck me was there was a conversation between Jason Link, who's probably the premier EBFM person from the East Coast at Woods Hole, and, Je and uh, Kevin Piner, Southwest Fishery Science Center. And they had nearly a debate, nearly an argument about the validity of that in the room. And what stuck with me was that, yes, if you can only afford one thing, if you only had money for one thing, would you put it in EBFM or would you put it into science stock assessments, more science to, to uh, get the data. And unequivocally, it was, we need the data. And I see us going forward and trying to create new machines to give us an answer. The new, the new slot machine, you put a quarter in and it gives you 50 cents. And I think I hear just this, throughout this whole conversation, that we're short on data that we need to have the data to make these assessments. And they have a bigger effect than all the machines we're trying to create. We have limited budget, we all know that. And I think it, it, we really need to get the data from these places we can't survey. It's hurt us in copper, it's hurt us in canary. Those are gonna come back and haunt us for years here. And we, in, in more ways than we even know, how this is going to affect us. And I think we need to start thinking in that direction that we need to focus on getting the missing data so that we know. And then I'll, I'll drift a little bit here again. Um, I, I worry about this whole process when that because of the last Magnuson reauthorization, the whole, the, the, any control over these stock assessments has been taken pretty much out of the con, uh, council's hands that we, we're innocent, we're bystanders. Once we commission a, a stock assessment, it's however it comes out is that. And I, I've mentioned this before, but I think there needs to be a place where we can go back and say, the data is not there to make this work. It's going to be faulty. We know that. So let's not go forward. But I think it, it, it gets to a point, we've seen it a couple of times here, more than that, where it's best available science. And, and no fault of the people doing it. It's, it, it is what it is, and, and it's the system we're dealt with. But I'm really concerned that we are hampering our fisheries so badly that by doing this, and we need to step back and rethink this, because it's, if this continues, we're, we're all going to be in big trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Mark Grelnick? Uh, thank you, Chair Pettinger. I just wanted to add a note of solidarity with the comments of, of Lynn and Phil. Uh, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about Quillback. And <clears throat> we the data produced um, by CDFW showed uh, no reduction in harvest, if anything, an increase in harvest slightly um, over a period of time where effort, uh, if anything, had been reduced. It's not a stock that can be targeted. Uh, for all practical purposes, it's in a mixed stock fishery in the near shore. Other stocks around it are doing well. How did this one stock suddenly fall into trouble? Um, not to say that it's impossible, but it, it's not apparent from 
the objective data that we as for my speaking for myself as a layperson can can observe. Um, and then we're seeing the same thing now with some of these stock assessments. So, so it is it is a source of frustration with regard to um, the stock assessments being the best available scientific scientific information. That's 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 no doubt true. Um, that doesn't necessarily as 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 uh, Chair Pettinger mentioned, um, all stock assessments are wrong, but some are helpful. And and I'm not sure that these will prove in the long run to be helpful because they're producing such different results than than past models have and we were we we built stocks over those past models so that, that's all i have thank you mark anyone else corey niles <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I can't articulate all all the thoughts going right around my head right now, but I think, um, yeah, I guess I just in, in in respecting all the frustrations and having watched this, I don't. This, this might be my eighth cycle. Just you know, never surprised by all these changes, and I'm, it, it it is way more volatile than anyone would like. Um, I guess it being complex um, isn't isn't the problem in my in my mind. I mean, I don't an airplane's complex. My computer's complex. I want them to be complex, you know, I want them to, to do the best, the best they can. And it's just the nature of trying to figure out how many fish there are, how many, how productive they are. Um, and, and a lot of the issues that you, I believe come from lack of collecting data back in history and we're never overcoming that. Um, but I just, I, I think as, as you heard, um, yeah, I want to echo what Marcy said too about just the excellent communication between the states, I mean, the stats in the states and everyone this cycle, I got to see how the, you know, Washington Black Lockfish worked. And it's, it's really hard to keep everyone in the loop and, and collaborate. And, um, but the, the efforts were like by uh, Dr. Cope, Jason Cope are great. So, but I'm, I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get here is I think, I think as Dr. Field said, they're hearing this, they're seeing this too. And how, how, like Phil said, just small changes to these assumptions can, it's not just, parameters it's weighting the data differently slightly differently changes makes big differences and is, is there a way that they can have um the estimates come out of be more robust to that and i think that's going to be a topic that the stock assessment community is um going to be thinking about and we should encourage them to think about it like in the halibut commission ian stewart who's who i don't know if he started here but was an assessor in our process and does an ensemble model with with halibut and thinks you know it took a lot of effort to to uh, to get it going but he thinks it's less effort now than to do it the way we do here so yeah point here i i i hear our, our stock customers wanting to help with this issue and um, when the time comes i hope this, the council continues to uh, encourage that but yeah I, the, the frustrations and the volatility in in, in how the goalposts move is it makes this makes this you know tough on managers tough on the fishery um, but I, and also, yeah, collecting data. We don't have a time machine, but yeah, collecting data, more data, you know, now is um, is something we should also be continuing to sound uh, to, to um, call for. So thank you. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, then Mattis. Uh, well, so if there's no other hands, I do have a motion ready. One word, we get there if we're there. Okay, um, I think we're ready. Um, I sent it to Sandra a little while ago. Hopefully she'll be able to pull it up. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. So I move the council adopt the following stock assessments, stock categories, and sigmas for use in 2025 and beyond, uh, provided in the council September 2023 briefing book under agenda item G2, as recommended by the SSC in their supplemental report one. For full assessments, copper rockfish off California, north and south, category one default sigma of 0.5 for both. Black rockfish on, off of Washington, Category one, default sigma of 0 0.5. Black rockfish off of Oregon, category one, default sigma 0 0.5.
black rockfish off California, north and central, category one, default sigma 0 0.5 for both. Canary rockfish, category one, default sigma 0 0.5. Petrali Sol, category one, default sigma 0 0.5. For data moderate assessments, Rex Sol, category two, default sigma one. Short spine thorny head, category two, default sigma 1.0. Limited update assessment, Sablefish, category one, default sigma 0 0.5. And two catch only projections for widow rockfish and yellow eye rockfish. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, sir, it does appear to be so. Thank you, look for a second. Second by Bob Dewey. Thank you, Bob. Please speak to your motion, Lynn. I know based on the discussions we've been having, um, or, or wait, is it for clarification or actual discussion? Just wanna make sure I'm in the right spot. We got it seconded? Yep. Okay. Sorry. You're great. Clutch in my brain slipped for a moment. Um, based on the discussions we've been having here for the last little bit, I don't think, well, I think many of us are uncomfortable and maybe not even, and maybe even unhappy with the results of some, some of these assessments, but these are the assessments we have. And I think legally we have to adopt them and this is what we have and we have to work with. Um, the categories, categories and the sigmas are what the SSC recommended uh, in their report. And I believe the GAP uh, recommended those as well. I don't have really any other discussion points at this point on this. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Questions for the uh, motion maker? Okay, discussion on the motion? Okay, I'm not seeing any, then I'll, I'll call for the question, so. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstentions? Okay, motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Lynn. Marlene? Thank you, Chair Pettinger. Uh, the council has um, heard from the SSC, its advisory bodies in the public. Um, you've had a robust discussion and um, had a lot of good uh, points to make, a quick question to answers. Uh, you had a motion and have currently completed your task in adopting the current stock assessment information in front of you. Okay. okay thank you, Marlene. Whew. Okay. All right, with that, uh, we'll go straight into um, G4. So, We'll wait for a few moments here to get people changed around. And is Jesse in here by chance? Oh, we oh. oh, my bad. We'll go to G2. G3. 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 What am I looking at here? This is where we're Okay. All right. It's G. It's G. <laughs> Whichever G, Marlene, take us, take us away. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair Pettinger. We are on agenda item G3, and this is a stock assessment methodology review final topics under groundfish. Uh, the Council Operating Procedure 25 is involved in reviewing proposed new methodologies to inform your management decisions. There are two types of methodologies that are addressed here, uh, depending on whether it's an odd year or an even year. Uh, we're in September of an odd year, so we're looking at those methodologies proposed for use in ground for stock assessments. Uh, the Council should consider the recommendations on any new proposed methodologies and schedule a formal methodology review next year during 2024 uh, for any of those proposals that you deem merit a review. We did receive uh, one proposal from the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Uh, that is under this agenda item in the briefing book. And so that is the current um, piece of information that is being proposed. Uh, that proposal, you also have um, several advisory body reports on this item. And just a moment, I'm not sure. Okay. 
All righty. Questions uh, for Marlene on the overview? All right. Seeing any? With that, we'll go to the SSC and uh, Dr. Holland. Ma'am? Thank you, Chair Pettinger. Uh, Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC. Uh, and I'll be reading agenda item G3A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, September 2023, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Stock Assessment Methodology Review, Final Topics. The SSC reviewed a proposal for ground fish stock assessment methodology review from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center and the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission regarding the use of Fourier, Fourier transform nearshore infrared spectrophotometry, uh, FT-NIRS is the acronym there, um, to increase groundfish aging throughput. The Northwest Fisheries Science Center and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers have begun processing samples for analysis, including species from other regions. This is part of a National Marine Fisheries Service national initiative, which brought up the question of whether a more national forum for review is more appropriate. In the interest of evaluating the species for which the method is applicable, analysis of a broad suite of species encompassing varying life cycle Varying life histories would be beneficial. While the focus of pr the proposal with stocks planned for assessment in 2025, the list of species could be expanded to encompass the diverse life histories of round, round fish, rockfish, and flatfish, as well as including short and long lived species and easier and more difficult species to age. Understanding the factors that affect aging with the FT and IRS may help inform the, sp the species for which the method can be successfully attempted in the future. The SSC supports the review of the proposed methods, while a review of the methodology in June 2024 was has been tentative, tentatively proposed. It can be delayed until late summer if additional time is needed to process otoliths and analyze the resulting date, data. That concludes the SSC statement. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, questions on the SSC report? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Just kind of a question on um, the sentence about this being a national initiative and shouldn't be national in scope. But to be clear, are you all saying we should have a local, we should have a West Coast review, but others should be doing it elsewhere? Are you saying we should also be looking to have the review here be national in scope? Um, sorry to, if, if I'm overly confusing things there. But. Uh, thank you for the question, um, Mr. Niles. Um, I think the idea was that there could be a national level review meeting, um, uh, potentially in, instead of having just a regional one. Um, but um, it's, I guess it's, it's not clear, you know, that, you know, when that would be organized or how that would be organized. Um, and, um, you know, maybe with a little bit more time to look into this um we'd know a little bit more about that but um i think um regard regardless there's an interest in moving forward okay thank you corey corey yeah and think it's like the bigger picture sequence process here um our last agenda item I had a back and forth with you and, and Dr. Field about um, follow up things from this assessment cycle, which John said was there's going to be that post assessment review. So, and, and maybe this is a question for Marlene. Um, yet, I guess the question is why, you know, we'd expect that post assessment review to come up with ideas that we would want reviewed methodology wise. Um, but is the idea that those ideas are not going to be? Um, taken up until we do this two years from now. I'll stop there to see if you what I'm at. So basically, I think the review would would spotlight um, areas where we'd want new methodologies reviewed. But this is how, we're doing this before we hear about that. The results of that of, of the, the introspection on this year's assessment cycle. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Niles. Um, I. Um, I think this is the time of year when we usually make the decision about what's going to go into a methodology review. I, I don't know that, that would completely preclude the possibility of 
them choosing something, you know, bringing something up later. I, I, I'm looking at Marlene here to see if you, you uh, have yeah, anything thank, to add there. Thank you. I'll try to address the question just from what we're planning currently um, for that. Uh, the review at the end of the stock assessment cycle, which is being um, tentatively scheduled for sometime in January. Um, the goal there would be to talk about um, outcomes of the current process, and those would feed into the next council items on uh, stock assessment prioritization for the next cycle, as well as change to the terms of reference. And so I think those are sort of the two, the debrief from this cycle, as well as moving into prioritization in terms of reference changes for the, the coming cycle were the things that we were particularly planning on for that um, review meeting. So I'm not sure if there's an avenue for additional, I'm sure discussion will occur, but in terms of your question relative to how we would merge that into something for this process, that I'm unclear. Executive Director Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Niles. That just made a very good point. And um, while our COPs call for a one-step methodology review, uh, I, we have done more than one in the past, is my understanding. And so just as your executive director, I would say if during the item formerly known as the post-mortem, we raise something that we think should be evaluated further, I think we should evaluate it further. Thank you, Merrick. Okay. Marcy Urimko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Holland. Um, first paragraph, the last sentence uh, discusses that processing, uh, sample processing has already begun, including species from other regions. I'm hoping maybe someone can explain for us um, the, the time commitment uh, that's already been invested um, into the use of the new technique. I, I, I recognize the goal here is to increase throughput, but um, it sounds to me like we're um, taking up uh, analyzing species from elsewhere. And I'm, you know, very concerned, just generally speaking, about our aging capacity uh, to work on our stock assessments uh, or species that will be you know assessed uh, in the next cycle. Um, we have a, a, an awful lot of um, priorities and it's I, I just want to make sure that this uh, activity can be accommodated without um, infringing on plans for completing the necessary aging for the next cycle. Uh, okay, thank you for the question, Mr. Uremko. Um, uh, you know, my understanding is that um, while this technique is um, very promising um, and probably um, can be particularly promising for um, for processing large numbers of otoliths from species um, that are relatively easy to age, um, but have lots of otoliths, um, that it has a lot of promise uh, to, to really reduce the labor uh, and speed that process up. Um, however, it seems that um, there's uh, a lot of variation in how, how useful this method is. A lot of, not, it's not a lot of, um, it's not clear that it's going to, to work um, for all species. Um, and the purpose of this is to get a wide range of species and try and understand what factors, um, what types of, of species it's going to work for, what the factors are, um, so that they know best how to use it. And I think that's why, you know, you're looking at some, some samples from other areas as, as well. Um, I don't know, you know, how much um, time this is taking off from, you know, otherwise aging samples. Um, it seems like it's probably a pretty good investment if it, if it is able to, you know, enable us to have a lot, a lot higher, a uh, lot more aging done in the future. Um, I don't know if John Field is on the line. He may be able to add a little bit more about that. I don't really have a lot of information about, you know, what what work is really being done and how much effort is being. We, you know, didn't really discuss that. Uh, how much work has been done uh, on these samples, and particularly from out, out of the area. 
Dr. Fields. Thank you, Mr. Pettinger. Thank you, Mr. Rampico. For the question, I'll try and um, fill in a little bit. I think Dan described the situation pretty accurately. I would note that with respect to species from other regions, the intent there was really to try and calibrate uh, the machine and the diagnostic approaches used to analyze the data that come from the spectrometers. Um, the intent is not to have people on the West Coast invest heavily in, in trying to develop criteria or, or develop a bunch of age estimates for species outside our area. I'd also just note that because this was a no, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service wide initiative, additional resources were provided to the science centers to develop and push forward this resource. So the diversion of existing resources um, should be relatively modest or minimal with respect to, uh, you know, the age determination efforts that we do have ongoing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Field. That's very uh, good to know. Appreciate that. Um, if I may, I have a second question um, for Dr. Holland. Uh, the very last sentence of the report just kind of follows on Corey's theme regarding um, methodology review. Um, sounds like uh, tentatively thinking June of 2024. Um, I'm just concerned about the number of priority methods reviews that we have been talking about being really critically necessary. Um, development of our new indices and reviewing them for use in upcoming stock assessments. I'm thinking about um, new ROV surveys and techniques uh, to incorporate uh, those data streams uh, using various methods. So I guess I'm, I'm struggling a little bit here with how this particular methods review fits in the, the SSC's priority list. And maybe you can just speak to that um, generally because we've heard an awful lot of um, need for workshops, um, need for um, additional reviews um, on other topics. And so I'm just curious to know how this fits in the mix. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Umko. Um, well, I think this was the only topic that was put forward uh, for consideration for methodology review. Um, so um, in that sense, um, it, it was prioritized because it was the only, only topic that was put forward for national methodology review. Um, there are other topics um, for workshops. Um, it was also noted in our discussions that there's not a lot of clarity about, um, about how, what, what the process is really uh, for, for um, scheduling workshops. There's not a sort of a similar, um, it's not well described in the COP, I guess, um, like, like this process is. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I, I'm not on the ground fish subcommittee. Uh, and um, uh, so I'm not sure where this, where this would fit, you know, in terms of their, of their priorities. I think it is um, certainly something that's been a concern for a long time that, that, you know, that there's a lot of time spent on aging and that can be a constraint. Um, and it has been a constraint and, or, or caused delays in assessments having to do that. So if you can't, if you're are able to do this, it could be pretty significant boost. And, and in addition, there is, there are these resources that are available. This is a national, uh, level, uh, initiative that NIMS is putting money into. And that, so it seems like it's a good time to, to move forward with it. So I think there's a lot of support for that. Um, but how it compares in terms of other priorities, um, I'm not sure that I could give you a good answer. Again, we've got um, John Field on the line. I, I, I don't, it's possible um, John Budrick is, but he was flying back, so he may not be, he would probably be in the best person to, to, to um, respond to that. Okay, not see any hands up here, so anyone else? All right. Well, thank you, Dan. All right. Next will be the gap report. And uh, Gary Richter returns. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman, Council. 
be speaking from agenda item G3A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on Stock Assessment Methodology Review, Final Topics. The Gap wholeheartedly endorses the new methodology that will estimate ground fish ages much more rapidly than the current method of manually reading the number of otolith rings. Age data are critical for estimating recruitment strength of our ground fish species that can determine abundance trends, which are used for management guidance. GAP appreciates being kept informed of these important methodology changes that affect our fisheries. Love those short statements, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Questions of the GAP report? You get off easy. So. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. All right, that's finished our, our um, reports and takes us to public comment. I believe we have one individual signed up. That would be Chris Howard. Is he on the line? I don't see him. Chris, are you there? Nope. Okay. Well, that takes us to uh, council discussion, I guess, if we can't get him on there. So there we go. All right. With that, I'll open the floor. Keely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've had an opportunity to, to email a bit with my Science Center colleagues, so I'd like to try to summarize from their perspective a bit of the prioritization question. I will do my best not to butcher it. Um, so from the agency perspective, we would like there to be at least a tentative plan to do this review um, because it is possible that this method would be used for aging and that data would be incorporated into 2025 assessments. And what we what we would not like to see is have the 2025 assessment and the star panels be the first place where that is really seen. And I think that has the possibility of, of um, certainly disrupting the, the star panel process. Um, th that is still, there's still a possibility that um, one, you know, we wouldn't have a suitable set of results to go through with that process or two, that the stocks that we decide to assess in 2025 aren't the right stocks for this method right now, but we would rather have the placeholder for this review in advance of the 2025 assessment cycle, um, and, and then we could cancel if needed. So, so that's you know the perspective that's been shared with me on, on, on their view of the prioritization, and I'm, I'm happy to try to um, talk that through further, but I wanted to share that with the council. Thank you, Keely. Okay. Anyone else? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, um, Mr. Chair and Keely. Not maybe you don't have this information, but since you were in contact and, and not super relevant, maybe for what we're doing here. But in terms of this being a NIMPS priority, I guess I'm just wasn't clear on um, you know council budget wise what the, what the council is sponsoring versus what NIMPS. Um, Dr. Holland mentioned that NIMS putting forth the resources. Is this something that is being funded by by NIMS, or is this, um, or is this something that the, the council's goes with the council's budget? And again, it sounds like a good idea either way, but more of a curiosity question. Okay, Keely. I don't have an answer, but I can look into that, and I can also talk further with Director Burden about that. Executive Director Boone. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Pettinger. Um, we are, as I think you all know, we are just getting started on a very preliminary view of our 2024 budget. Uh, I don't have a good sense for the council resources this would take, so I think it would benefit from a conversation with Ms. Kent and others as well. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, Lynn Mattis. If we're to the point, um, I do have a very short motion for this to help us move forward. Okay, thank you. Please. Okay. Uh, send it to Sandra with the other ones, hopefully. There we go. Um, 
I move the council adopt the fish age estimates developed using four year transformed near infrared spectroscopy methodology for review in 2024. Okay, is the language of the screen accurate? I, I believe so, yes. Okay, we'll look for a second. Second by Corey uh, Writings. Thank you, Corey. Please speak to your motion. Thanks, Ellen. I, I'm assuming that the NIMF staff and council staff will, could, will have discussion about the budget pieces and whether or not this review, where this review would fit in. But in the interim, um, this would let our folks get started on this review. Um, having uh, just the capacity and budget to have otolith readers is getting more and more difficult, I think, for the science centers and Pacific states. So if there's a way to have some better production methodology, even for some species, I think it's worth looking into. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Questions for the motion maker or discussion on the motion? Marcy, go. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I will support the motion. Um, I appreciate the discussion that we've had around this topic. Um, I would note that um, the objectives here are well-intentioned. We want to reduce the burden ultimately on our age readers and try to uh, improve our efficiencies. Um, it does appear that the method may only be appropriate for certain species and probably not appropriate for many of the species for which we have the most concern with age data um, and that take the most time to age or that we have uncertainties surrounding age data uh, like we've learned with uh, short spine thorny head this cycle. So um, I would trust that uh, as this uh, work uh, proceeds that we um, keep in mind our objective is to improve efficiency um, and that we you know at, at an opportunity to um, or that we we proceed but that um, if it becomes clear that the cost benefit does not pan out here that we keep that in mind um, what our end goal is here because I wouldn't want us to spend a lot of time developing this method um, and at the end of the day have it ultimately detract from the limited aging capacity that we have at the moment. So um, it's good to hear that there is special funding that has been provided for this work and that it is a coordinated uh, national objective. Um, but certainly I think we need to keep our bigger priorities and our uh, needs for our 2025 20, assessment cycle uh, at the forefront of our thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. For the discussion, Corey? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Lynn, for the motion. Um, I w won't repeat what was said about the importance of otoliths and, and being able to process more of those. Yeah, yes, um, for sure. I guess just tying, Marcy brought up the good question about priority and um, just thinking ahead, you know, always introspective about our process and what our priorities are. And, you know, we have a limited SSC attention, limited expert attention, limited funds. And I'm just kind of thinking back to last year um, and with some lingering disappointment when we had hoped to have a workshop on the stock definition issue. Um, and then later realized that we'd already spent our workshop budget, so to speak. So, yeah, just that's thoughts. Um, just want to get that thought out there. But yeah, thanks, Lynn, for the motion. You know, supportive of this for sure. Thanks, Corey. Mr. Hasimer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is one I probably should keep my mouth shut on, but um, in in addition to does it work? There's a piece of that that I assume is part of this review, is it better than what we are doing? There's a, a speed component or efficiency, how many can you read? Um, and this is where I, I shouldn't say it, but I had a little experience with um, this type of technique, um, Fourier transformations, fast Fourier in, in these signals, and it'll work. Um, when you apply the transformation to the signal, it's going to tell you something. It's going to give you some significant components, but is it better? And uh, so that that's the part that questions me is um, you, you can apply this tool and it's going to give you a lot of stuff, but is it going to be better than what we have? And I think that's what Marcy was getting to in her comments. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Pete. Okay. 
Anyone else? No, I see any hands, I'll call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Marlene, how are we doing here? Well, you've heard from your advisory bodies and had a robust discussion again, as well as adopting uh, the current proposal for review during 2024. So with that, I think the council task has been completed. Okay, well, good work, everyone. Um, we've been out for an hour and a half, so we're gonna take a 15-minute um, break, actually. Yeah, 15-minute break. And uh, when we return, uh, Vice Chair Hessemer will have the gavel, so. Thank you.
Recording stopped.
All right, one minute warning, one minute to find your seats. Recording in progress. Right, thank you all. We look pretty well populated around the table again. This is agenda item G4. Before I turn it over to Jesse Dorpinghouse to tell you what the long title of this is, a couple of new faces at the table who haven't been uh, with us yet this week. Caroline McKnight for California, welcome. And Maggie Summer over in the NIMS chair. And I, I think that's all the new faces here. So with that, I will turn it over to Jesse to give us the introduction to this agenda item. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Yes, this is agenda item G for fixed gear marking and entanglement risk reduction and the limited entry follow on actions. Give me just one second to share my screen. Awesome. Okay, um, so if you recall back in June, uh, we had discussions regarding fixed gear marking and entanglement risk reduction and the LE fixed gear follow-on packages. Um, these were separated out as two different actions, um, but for this meeting, they're, they're still combined and we will be discussing uh, later on um, in the presentation about the two individual packages that you can take action on today. So in terms of just an overview, in terms of briefing book materials, in attachment one, you have a proposed schedule for each of the packages, and attachment two provides a proposed purpose and need and range of alternatives for each package. There are supplemental uh, GAP, GMT, and EC reports, as well as public comments. Your council action for today is to adopt a purpose and need along with a range of alternatives, if possible. And um, after this, I'll be going through the presentation, starting with the fixed gear marking and entanglement risk reduction item. So for this item, as outlined in attachment one, uh, the proposed timeline by council staff is we're obviously here in September, 2023 with the purpose and need and range of alternatives if possible. And we have tentatively scheduled March 2024 for PPA and June 2024 as FPA. This was noted in June as a priority um, during the discussion on this item as a priority for NIMPS. And um, the council uh, did speak to moving this on a faster timeline than the other package. So on your screen here is the proposed purpose and need that NIMPS brought forward in June. Um, council and NIMP staff have modified it to cover the remainder of the items that were included in the June written council guidance. And in bold, I highlighted some of the keys to this action, with the purpose being to expand fixed gear marking requirements and risk reduction measures for entanglement and bycatch. And then for the need, there are a couple parts um, to positively attribute protected species entanglements, understanding and reducing the risk of protected species entanglement, and improved bycatch reduction of the currently required biodegradable escape panels and fish pot gears. So before we start in, I wanted to note a couple of things on the terminology and the items that we're gonna discuss today. So the items and the range of alternatives presented in the document are specific to bottom long line, trap and or pot gears in federal ground fish fisheries. So they're not applicable to other fixed gears like we have in the open access sector. 
So when we say fixed gears, we're talking about these gear types, um, the long line trap or pot gears and vessels that utilize these gear types. They can, those vessels could be in the open access, limited entry fixed gear or IFQ gear switching fisheries. Also, these alternative discussed are not mutually exclusive, exclusive. So you could select an action alternative for each item. There are five items for consideration under this package, buoy marking, line marking, entanglement risk reduction, the escape panel, and a best practices guide. And we're gonna go through each of these individually. Starting with item one on buoy marking. So under no action, and you'll note that I've shortened the full description, but you can find them in the attachment too um, for the full details, but these are the main elements. So under no action, fixed gear must be marked at the surface and at each terminal end with a pole, flag, light, radar reflector, and a buoy. No line marking is required. The buoy must be marked with a number clearly identifying the owner and the operator of the vessel. There are two action alternatives proposed under this item. One would be gear-specific buoy marking, and alternative two would be sector and gear-specific buoy marking. So on the first one, alternative one, this would be identifying the buoys with pot and long line specific tags. And then the alternative two would be thinking of things like having different identifiers for LE pot or LE long line, for example. For each of those alternatives, we have two sub options presented for each. Um, sub option A would be uh, to have sable fish specific patch, shape, letter um, on the polyform buoy. And sub option B would have to have cattle tags attached to the molded eye of the buoy. Based on conversations with um, the councils and the advisory body should consider the need to distinguish across sectors or if just having individual gear tag or gear identifiers would be sufficient. And based on preliminary conversations with NIMP staff, we do believe the gear specific alternative may be sufficient given that other information like the buoy number would be able to potentially identify the sector. For sub option A, the type of, um, when it comes to the sub option, the council may want to put the specifics in a best practices guide, which we're gonna discuss a little bit more in detail later, rather than the regulations. This way, if methods of marking prove to be better than others, the regulations wouldn't have to change, but rather the more formal practice of updating a best practices guide. So for sub option B, currently the color and shape of cattle tags used in state Dungeness crab fisheries changes each year to help with derelict gear cleanup programs. Therefore, if the council includes the sub option, you may want to consider if the tags are the same annually so that it's easier for fishermen and easier for the states to not pick that color or style. Item two is line marking. So under no actions, line are not, lines are not required to be marked in any sector for any gear authorized for use in the ground fish fishery, including pot and bottom long line gear. And for our action alternatives, there are three main decision points for consideration. The portion of the line marked, the distance of the line marked, and the method of marking. So for the portion of the line mark, this would be to require that some or all of the line be marked in a unique color scheme and method. Alternative one would be all the line be marked, so the surface, vertical, ground line, and anchor line. Alternative two would be only the vertical line. And then alternative three would be the surface and the vertical line. For distance of marking, this would be to require that lines be marked in a unique color scheme for a specified length of the vertical line, starting where it attaches to the buoy closest to the ground line, with three alternatives being at least five fathoms, at least 20 fathoms, or at least 50 fathoms. For the method of marking, so for the portion and the distance a line would be required to be marked, the line would be marked in one of the following ways. Alternative one, manufactured in a unique color scheme. Alternative two would be temporary markings at specific intervals from the surface buoy, with sub option A being at least every five fathoms, B at least every 20 fathoms, and C every 50 fathoms. And then alternative three would be a transition from alternative two to alternative one, 
um, as those lines need replacing. So in terms of line markings, we do suggest that the lines would need to, um, the attachment two describes how the markings would need to follow the same scheme as item one. So we're looking at likely having buoy markings and line markings that are either both gear specific or gear sector specific. So, um, excuse me. For the portion of the line mark, after some discussions with NIMS protected resources staff, we did add alternative three from the June written guidance, um, which would be to mark the surface and the vertical line. The state, um, so as previous discussions have appeared to be just around the vertical line, but we may wanna consider adding that to help identify entanglements without buoys. And I'll note that the state ginger crab fisheries are considering, and I believe have started marking the surface line. So this would be in line with that practice as well. For the distance marked alternative, the EC in June noted that having continuous marking for the first five fathoms at a minimum would help to evaluate compliance. In regards to the method of marking, there are some things to consider with the temporary methods. And you may want to consider that the different styles of marking, so paint or tape, for example, be in included in the best practices guide rather than regulations. Some sub options may also not be compatible with the distance of marking. For example, it doesn't make sense to mark every 50 fathoms if you're only going to mark the first five fathoms. With regards to alternative three, um, needing to determine that time which we would transition from temporary to manufactured line would that occur. We want to balance the timeliness and cost to industry and are looking for some feedback for options at this meeting. Item three is entanglement risk reductions. And there's one item um, currently in here, and that is right now under no action, fixed gear vessels are required to use surface gear, buoys and flagpoles at each terminal end of the ground line. And the proposed action alternative is that fixed gear vessels would be allowed to use surface gear on only one end of the ground line. Now, while this was the only item moved forward by the council in their written guidance in June, staff did wanna note some in the doc other items in the document um, and here in case there is interest as we are trying to establish that full ROA if possible. So some other items that have been brought up through public comment and other methods have been time area closures, the use of pop-up gear and surface gear limitations. So for alternative one, which would be to allow surface gear on only one end, the gap noted that in June that it should be left to the operator, so this wouldn't be a requirement, but rather a choice to the vessel operator. The EC, however, was not supportive of this in June because they said it was difficult to enforce in closed areas. For those other items, um, again, not a full list in the document, but highlighting a few. For time area closures, these could be based on historical or real-time data or models regards to pop-up gear. Um, this one has a lot of different thoughts. You know, there are some that think it's most effective in reducing entanglement, but it does have potentially high cost. And there are some uncertainties about the reliability of the technology. For surface gear limitations, this is um, would include measures such as limiting surface buoys or the amount of line that can trail surface buoys. And surface gear limitations are being considered in Dungeness Crab as well, and could be considered in a best practices guide rather than putting um, limitations in regulation. So item four is the skate panel. And this was a report um, from NIMS in June, 2023 to address an issue with this skate panel regulations that don't currently align with the purpose to reduce bycatch as the way the regs are written, the skate panel could actually be on the bottom currently. So in the alternative, it would be to modify those regulations so that the position of the escape panels may not be on the bottom of the pot with an exception for collapsible pots or slinky pots. And we had some proposed language for discussion on page seven of the attachment two. And our last item to, for consideration is a best practices document. 
And this is a new addition from staff based on comments in June and other state efforts uh, regarding gear marking. And as I've noted through the presentation thus far, examples of information that could be included in a best practices document include temporary marking methods and surface gear limitations, as well as any other items that maybe don't meet that needing to be in regulation. And before I move on to the LE fixed gear follow on section, I think I might pause here and see if there are any questions on this first item. Thank you, Jesse. Are there any questions on this first section of information? The gear marking and entanglement risk? It's perfectly clear there are no questions. Please proceed. Okay, so our second uh, item is the LE fixed gear follow on actions. Again, here is the proposed timeline described in all attachment one by staff. Um, we're here in September, purpose and need an ROA if possible, and a potential June 2024 PPA and a September 24 FPA, noting that this timeline is, of course, subject to change like any of our council actions, depending on other competing priorities at the council. I'm not going to read this whole purpose and need here, um, but this was drafted up by uh, NIMS and council staff and comments and feedback um, were welcomed by advisory bodies or council members. There are six items for consideration under this package um, that I'm going to walk through similarly as I did for the gear marking. Um, that includes the LE fixed gear permit endorsement, fourth permit stacking, base permit designation, permit price reporting, season start time, and cost recovery. Before getting into the different alternatives, I wanted just to give a quick overview of the LE fixed gear sector as different, uh, some of the items apply to one portion or to all of the LE fixed gear sector. So to participate, vessels must be registered to a fixed gear endorsed permit, whether long line or pot. Um, and there are two sectors within the LE fixed gear sector. There's the trip limit fishery for vessels um, and then the sable fish tier fishery in which vessels have to have a sable fish endorsed permit. Vessels are only allowed to fish with the gear on their registered permit or would need to declare into the open access fishery. And I'll note that one exception that will be coming is the non-trawl area management measures package or amendment 32, which will allow LE fixed gear vessels to use those two non-bottom gear types in the RCA, in the non-trawl RCA to fish up to their trip limits. And you can see here on the screen our different gear endorsements and then the number of permits that we have that are um, general LE fixed gear permits and then sable fish endorsed permits and the numbers that were registered of each in 2022. So item one is the LE fixed gear permit endorsement. So as I said, um, under no action vessels registered to an LE fixed gear permit would only be able to harvest their limits or quotas with the gear endorsed on a permit, noting those exceptions forthcoming under amendment 32. For alternative one, this would allow long vessels registered to long line endorsed permits to also use slinky pots to harvest their quotas. Alternative two would create a single LE fixed gear endorsed permit. In other words, removing the specific pot line and pot and long line endorsements. And then alternative three would create a single LE non-trawl endorsed permit. So in terms of discussion on this item, so you'll note that each alternative provide more flexibility for participants with gear usage. Starting with alternative one, this would allow slinky pot use for longline vessels for all limited entry fixed gear vessels uh, registered to a longline permit. And I'll note that a majority of our permits are long line endorsed as seen in that overview slide. Currently, those vessels using pot that are pot endorsed can utilize slinky pots. Um, one thing to consider with alternative one is that this would just be another exception to the allowances. So we're getting into um, regulations where we have, you're allowed to do, you know, either pot or long line gear, and then we have our amendment 32 exceptions, and this would be yet another one on top of that. So something to consider. 
And due to that um, growing number of exceptions, alternative two and alternative three came out of the June written guidance and discussions with uh, that came out of the NIMS report, staff discussion, and the GMT and GAP. And so alternative two would create a single gear endorsement, um, but still leaving those exceptions as proposed under Amendment 32. In other words, vessels participating with a limited entry fixed gear permit could utilize either pot or long line gear and would not be restricted um, to one or the other. I'll note that this type of endorsement was considered during the original um, discussions under Amendment 6, but the Council did choose to go um, with the separation of gear endorsements. So that'll have to be considered in a forthcoming analysis if included in the range. For alternative three, this would allow LE fixed gear vessels to operate like open access and IFQ gear switching vessels. They would be able to utilize any legal ground fish non trial gear. This would reduce regulatory and enforcement complexity um, and could actually encourage a shift from open access to limited entry because open access participants that might use other gear other than pot or long line could purchase LE fixed gear permits, which we do have latent LE fixed gear permits, and then move over to access those higher trip limits with the gear that they're used to using. This would definitely be the most significant program change for Amendment 6, and so there would be a significant uh, level of analysis with Alternative 3 and considering going to a non trial gear endorsement. So item two is the fourth permit stacking. Currently, primary tier vessels are limited to registering three Sablefish endorsed LE fixed gear permits or stacking on their vessel in a given year, regardless of the owner on board exemptions. Under the proposed alternative, primary tier vessels would be limited to stacking four permit Sablefish endorsed permits on their vessel in a given year, as long as at least one of the four permits was subject to that owner on board requirement. In other words, not owned by someone with an owner on board exemption. So while the alternative described in June was focused on the stacking limit and the owner on board provision, there is a third element that comes into play with this item, the own and control limit. So under the own and control limit for the tier fishery, no individual person, partnership, or corporation in combination may own or hold more than three Sablefish endorsed permits, either simultaneously or cumulatively over the primary season. And control is, can be seen as vessel owners that have permits registered to their vessel, even if they aren't owned or considered to hold that permit um, and control that permit. So in the gap in 2023 noted that the four permit stacking limit was assuming that we would be able to maintain that three permit own and control limit. But since permit owners and holders are subject to the three permit limit, we would need to actually increase the four permit own and control limit for this alternative to occur. And we did provide revised language to that um, on page 11 of attachment two. So in terms of the stacking impacts, um, as a reminder, the owner on board means is a part, is a key part of the primary tier program. And it means that the permit owner must be on board the vessel while har harvesting quota, unless the permit owner has an exemption. And in June, the preliminary scoping analysis discussed how many vessels would currently be likely to be affected by this action in terms of being at that three permit limit currently. And about 28% of vessels have had three permits stacked from 2018 to 2022. But beyond being at three permits, I wanted to dig a little deeper to determine how the owner on board provision would impact this as currently described in the alternative. And as a reminder, at least one of the four permits stacked is subject to the owner on board requirement. So I have a little graphic here. This helped me kind of work out um, how this would functionally um, happen on, under this alternative. So you see our vessel here and apologize for the neon green that is a little bit hard to read on the screen. Um, so this vessel in this case is registered to three owner on board exempted permits. 
So under alternative one, they would be able to go out and get a, another permit to stack, but that permit would have to be subject to the owner on board requirement in order to be put on the vessel. And this kind of meets that scenario that the gap had brought up when they proposed this alternative. So in other words, a crew member already operating on this vessel could purchase this permit. It could be registered to the vessel and they would be on the boat while harvesting. So the operations of this vessel actually wouldn't need to change because they would have their three permits as usual. And then the crew members permit, as long as they're on board while harvesting. But this alternative would also allow a vessel, for example, that has three stacked permits, two of which are an owner on board exempted permit or owned by someone with an exemption. And then the third permit is um, requires the owner to be on board. They could go out and purchase or lease a fourth permit where, again, it's owned by someone with an owner on board exemption and stack their that fourth permit on board their operations would not need to change either because they are meeting that one out of four permits being having the owner on board and they'd be able to stack that fourth permit. So in some um, of the vessels with three stacked permits, about half could add a permit if the permit owner was on board and then the other half would be able to pick up a fourth permit owned by someone with an exemption in the last about five years on average. For item three, the base permit designation, under no action, NIMS designates the base permit as the permit registered to the vessel for the longest period of time, so long as its length endorsement is sufficient for the vessel and unless the vessel requests a different permit. And the alternative would be to remove this designation and associated regulations. This item was highlighted during the tier review that this regulation isn't necessary as we already have regulations requiring a vessel to have at least one permit that meets its length requirements. And so this is really just an unnecessary administrative burden. For permit price reporting, uh, currently we don't collect any permit price information when LA fix gear permits are sold. There are two alternatives here. Uh, alternative one would be owners of stable fish endorsed LA fix your permits would be required to close that price upon sale to a new owner with alternative two being all LA fix gear permit owners, stable fish and non stable fish endorsed would be, would be required to disclose the prices. The gap noted in June 2023 that this should be an easy addition to the permit forms and this information could help with future reviews and analysis. Item five is the season start time. Um, this was brought forward by NIMPS in June as an administrative action. Um, currently, the regulations state that the sable fish primary season starts at noon on April 1st and closes at noon on December 31st. Um, so the alternative would be to just simply remove the start and end times in the ground fish regulations. And you'll note that there's a slight change from the June um, description to remove all time references um, just to make it a little simpler. Finally, cost recovery. Um, currently, there's not a cost recovery for the tier program. Um, so alternative one to, would be to develop a cost recovery for the LA fixed gear tier program. And while I don't have the details for that program, they're outlined in the June NIMPS report as a proposal. Um, what I did want to key in here is the two sub options on who's responsible for paying the cost recovery fees. It was initially proposed by NIMPS to have the vessel owner pay, but the GAP made the recommendation in June to add an option where the permit owner would be responsible for paying. And they recommended that because the permit owner, um, that the permit owner be responsible because many vessels lease permits in the tier fishery. And I went back and looked at our work on the LE fixed gear tier review. And from 2011 through 2020, 60% of vessels were thought to be registered to permits that were thought to be leased. So that's this kind of larger shape on the bottom um, compared to 15% being owned and about a quarter of the vessels were thought to have a mix of owned and leased permits. 
So the idea with the permit owner, if the vessel, the concern is if the vessel owner was responsible and didn't pay the fee, then the permit owner might not be able to utilize the permit in the following year. So again, your council action for this meeting is to adopt a purpose and need along with a range of alternatives if possible. And I'm happy to take any questions on either the Slack last section or if anybody thought of anything on fixed gear marking. Thank you, Jesse. Look around and see if there are any questions. Chair Penninger. Not a question, just an observation. Um, this might be the best presentation I've ever seen. And I think the clarity it brings to the subject matter is just outstanding. And I think that uh, you just did a fantastic job laying this out for us. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Further questions for Jesse on the presentation? And not seeing any, let me look at what we have here. Um, that takes us to our management entity and advisory body reports. Uh, we will start with the GMT report and Whitney Roberts is here to give that report. Good afternoon, Whitney. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Whitney Roberts and I'll be reading Agenda item G4A, Supplemental GMT Report 1, Groundfish Management Team Report on Fixed Gear Marking and Entanglement Risk Reduction and Limit Entry Fixed Gear Follow-on. With regard to the Fixed Gear Marking and Entanglement Risk Reduction item, the GMT supports the draft purpose and need proposed in Attachment 2 and does not propose any revisions. The GMT does not see a strong management need to include sector-specific buoy and line marking in the range of alternatives at this time, but we provide the following considerations to aid the Pacific Fishery Management Council in decision-making, recognizing that the timeline for this action may be limited. If the intent of sector-specific marking would be to take action to restrict individual sectors in response to entanglement events, the team discussed the likelihood that any such, such action would lead to equity concerns. For example, if a whale entanglement was attributed to the open access sector and the council chose to take action to restrict the open access sector from fishing with pot gear within a certain area to minimize whale entanglements while still allowing the limited entry fixed gear sector to continue fishing with pot gear in the same area, there could be concerns that one sector was being unfairly restricted more than another, despite the impacts from both sectors being similar given similar gear types. On the other hand, if sector specific marking is used and NIMS identifies that one sector is consistently resulting in more entanglement events driven by a different level of risk, the council could take action to restrict only that sector and thereby reduce impacts to other sectors that did not contribute to impacts to the same extent. Furthermore, if differences in sector specific operations other than just gear type pose different levels of risk to whales, sector specific markings may be justified. Some examples of these differences may be line thickness or type, soak times, total time of gear in the water, et cetera. Additionally, the council could consider developing risk reduction measures that address sector specific operations that pose substantially different risks. The GMT recognizes sector specific identification of entangled gear might be gained through information or markings required on buoys, but also is aware that it can be difficult to discern this information and markings in the field, for example, blurry photos and faded markings. If temporary line marking is allowed, the GMT seeks clarification about how long each segment of line would need to be marked if methods such as dipped or spray paint are used. The GMT also suggests adding a sub option under alternative two of method of marking for an interval of at least every 10 fathoms. Under item two, method of marking, the GMT also discussed the potential impacts to fixed gear participants required to use manufacturer marked line in the event that one or more of the facilities manufacturing line closes or is severely limited in capacity. The GMT also notes public comment offered during the June 2023 meeting, which emphasized the resulting inflexibility for individual vessels should manufacturer marked line be required. The council should consider those potential impacts if alternatives one or three are included in the ROA whether that means including a suboption provision allowing for flexibility in the event of manufacturing constraint, or whether that means considering such a flexibility when writing the rule. 
The GMT continues to note that the council should be mindful of cumulative impacts from the combination of federal marking requirements and marking practices and or requirements in other state regulated fisheries. Being cognizant of existing state fishery practices or requirements while avoiding timeline overlaps could minimize those cumulative impacts to participants of both. Moving on to the limited entry fixed gear follow on package, the GMT supports the draft purpose and need proposed in attachment two and does not propose any revisions. In June 2023, the GMT provided comments and recommendations on the range of alternatives that have been incorporated into the current range proposed in attachment two. The, G the team did not see the need for any additional revisions to the range of alternatives. Regarding item one LEFG permit endorsement, the GMT requests that the preliminary analysis attempt to address the question about whether gear specific endorsements are still necessary to limit harvest capacity, such that the council is able to provide sufficient allowable catch while protecting the resource as outlined in the purpose of amendment six. This analysis, the analysis to support amendment six noted that gear specific endorsements, in other words, trawl long line and fish pot were established to place greater constraint on capacity. The analysis also noted that, quote, the connection between fish pot and long, pot, long line gear did not appear to be stronger than the connection between fish pot and trawl gear in terms of vessels switching between gears, and that with Amendment 6, quote, vessels would not be allowed to switch from a less powerful to a more powerful type of limited en entry gear, for example, long lining to trawling for rockfish. End quote. Thus, the council should consider whether there is still a need to limit capacity of specific commercial non trawl gear types within the limited entry fixed gear fishery. Preliminary analysis to address this question could inform further revisions to the ROA, such as alternatives or sub options that restrict traditional fish pot, in other words, not including slinky pot capacity if it is determined that conservation and or habitat concerns warrant continuing to limit capacity of that gear type. And that concludes the GMT statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Whitney. Are there questions on the groundfish management team report? I see no questions. Again, thank you. Next, we will have the groundfish advisory sub panel report. I have Poggy Lapham here and my sincerest apologies for any mispronunciation. Uh, Council, Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Jorgen Lapham. I'm known to you all as Poggy. I'll be reading uh, agenda item G4A, the Supplemental Gap Report 1. Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Fixed Gear Marking and Entanglement Risk Reduction, Limited Entry, and also Limited Entry Follow-on Actions. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel, or the GAP, provides the following comments on the fixed gear marking and entanglement risk reduction and limited entry fixed gear follow-on actions. <clears throat> fixed gear marking and entanglement risk reduction. The purpose and needs statement. While we understand the necessity of including the last sentence, the structure could be modified for clarity. The gap suggests the following. Action is also needed to improve the effectiveness of the biodegradable escape mechanisms currently required in pot gear. Under the range of alternatives, item number one, buoy marking. The gap supports the inclusion of alternative one, but recommends removing alternative two from the ROA. Marking buoys according to gear type, in addition to the already required vessel information, will align the fixed gear fisheries with other fisheries working to reduce and attribute whale entanglements. The gap understands that a gear sector identification alternative is not needed to attribute entanglements given the already required vessel information. The GAP recommends including both sub-options and on alternative one for the ROA. Item number two, line marking. This portion of the GAP discussion was diverse and included many references to the ongoing line marking discussions in the state-managed Dungeness crab fishery. In those fisheries, marking up to the top 20 fathoms of line has been recommended. It would be helpful to have more direction from nymphs about the distance of marking and mark spacing that would be adequate. The GAP is interested in the use of a custom color line and believes that acquiring funding is a good way to ensure continuity and take advantage of economies of scale. The GAP supported the various alternatives under this item with the exception of the following. The portion of line marked. The GAP recommends dropping alternative one because of the burden of marking all of the line used in the fishery is excessive. For the distance of marking, the GAP recommends the removal of alternative three because the burden of marking more than 50 fathoms of buoy line is excessive. Item number three, entanglement risk reduction. 
The GAP is in full support of including alternative one in the ROA, allowing the use of one buoy line per set, allowing the use of one buoy line per set. The GAP is hopeful that further discussions with enforcement consultants can bear out that the benefits of this action outweigh the risks. Through public comment, the GAP discussion and the GAP discussion, we searched for more ideas to put under this item. Some of those discussed include pop-up gear. The GAP was not in favor of suggesting pop-up gear at this time due to the technology's undemonstrated effectiveness, the potential for gear conflicts, lost gear, and the enforcement consultant concerns. These concerns far outweigh the potential benefits. Number two, time and area closures. There was no support for this in the GAP for many reasons, including that whale entanglements have not followed a specific pattern and environment, or sorry, enforcement consultant concerns about enforcement. Number three, surface gear limitations. This has been used in the Dungeness crab fishery and may have an application in the fixed gear fishery. The simplest form would be preferable. In effect, total allowable length of gear on the surface. The GAP recommends the council consider adding this to the ROA with two options of five fathoms and 10 fathoms as maximum length of gear allowed. Future discussions on the item should consider whether this should be in regulations or in a best practices guide. Item number four, the escape panel. The GAP is in, is in support of including alternative one in the ROA. Item number five, best practices guide. The GAP supports developing a best practices guide to include buoy marking, line marking, minimizing buoy line length, using a sinking top shot, identifying high whale traffic times and areas, et cetera. The GAP understands that the gear marking could help minimize the risk of entanglements, and it is best to disseminate these ideas and a best practices guide before implementing them into regulation as further testing of these ideas is needed. Moving on to the limited industry fixed gear follow-on actions. Purpose and need. The GAP recommends the council adopt the purpose and need in attachment two. Under the range of alternatives, we have item number one, limited entry fixed gear permit endorsement. The GAP sees value in all the alternatives, alternatives, but favors alternative three, and that it is the most effective of the alternatives at simplifying the administrative burden and provides the fleet the most flexibility to harvest the resource. Item number two, fourth permit stacking. The GAP was initially optimistic about this item, but after further analysis and discussion, recommends not moving forward this item. The benefits to the resource and the public are hard to identify. Additionally, the complexity surrounding permit control issues could be time consuming for enforcement. Item number three, base permit designation. The GAP supports including the removal of the base permit de designation in the range of alternatives. Item number four, permit price reporting. The GAP supports alternative two and does not see the need to limit the collection of permit price reporting to only stable fish endorsed permits. Therefore, alternative one should not be included in the ROA. Data collected will be useful in future council deliberations. Item number five, season start time. The GAP supports including the removal of season start times. Item number six, cost recovery. The GAP supports Alternatives one, sub-option two, placing the responsibility of the cost recovery on the permit owner and permit renewal will streamline cost recovery collection. The GAP recommends removing sub-option one from the ROA. Following that, there's a summary of recommendations. Thank you. Are there questions on the ground fish advisory sub-panel report? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you for the report. It was thorough and well thought out. I did have a question on the best practices. Um, that's something I'm familiar with through ISSF. Our, our members are buyers and make a commitment to not purchase from vessels that are not engaging in best practices. And I'm really wondering in terms of the discussion around best practices, were you envisioning that being fisherman driven, enforcement driven or buyer driven, or, or was that conversation had? That's uh, for the chair. Uh, the, that conversation wasn't had in the gap, no. Thank you. Further questions? Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Poggy, for the, the report and to the whole gap. Um, curious if the gap talked about timing of transition from temporary to permanent marking requirements. 
through the chair. Uh, yes, we did. And the general consensus was to not attach a specific time to our recommendations and try to convey that we'd like um, temporary instruction on what would suffice for temporary marking and the idea that we would get maybe the um, colored line, the permanently colored line at one time, you know, not that the colored line would be available, but that we'd have direction as to what would do in the interim and three years from now or some other time frame, um, we would be transitioning to having to have the colored line. And, and like we mentioned in the gap report that it would be nice to have some help as an industry uh, to get that accomplished. Thank you. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Poggy, for a good report. On the line marking, <clears throat> you guys are, I, I hear a lot of talk about um, manufactured line. Has there been any, have you done any research, or anybody done any research on what the cost of that line is and the availability of how many different choices of colors depending on all of that and what burden that might add? and availability, those type of things, the cost differences, is, it, is any of that stuff been looked at? Uh, through the chair, is it appropriate to respond? To, I'm gonna give public testimony and I was gonna address that there. I don't know if it's through in the gap, we haven't talked about it. You're asking as a personal question though. No, I, I was, if the gap talked about it. No, well, yes, sorry. The gap expressed the fact that uh, to order line, you, you, you might be able to walk in and get what they have and it's a certain color, but to get a color of line, a specific color takes a minimum order and might take a lead time of eight months or more, depending on where the line comes from. You know, there's manufacturer, the two main ma manufacturers are in Korea and Nova Scotia. And sometimes it, it might not be that uh, it takes that long, long to get here. It's that when you order it, there's a whole bunch of people ahead of you, so. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah, we're just asking for the, the gap. Yeah, right. Further questions? Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Poggy. Um, I'm looking at item three, entanglement risk reduction. And um, the gap kindly responded to some public comment and discussed about some ideas that were brought up. And I noticed you comment on pop-up gear. The gap was not in favor of suggesting pop-up gear at this time due to the technology's undemonstrated effectiveness, potential for gear conflicts, lost gear, and EC concerns. Um, those to me seem reasonable, but also like reasons that maybe it's it is worth exploring that in this process. So I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more background if um, the GAP discussed it to help us better understand um, why the GAP thinks this shouldn't move forward at this time. Yeah, through the chair. Uh, the GAP wasn't comfortable suggesting it because there isn't anybody that we have been able to talk to that has used this, you know, successfully. You know, we nobody on the GAP or had any experience with this technology. I mean, pretty much anecdotal information on people testing it out through the grapevine, but that was as far as we had, as far as information goes concerning pop-up gear. Yeah. Thank you. I'll do one more scan very carefully for hands and seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. That will take us to the enforcement consultants report. Captain Dan Chadwick is here to present that. Good afternoon, Dan. Thought the light was on. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. My name is Dan Chadwick. I'll be representing the enforcement consultants reading from agenda item G4A supplemental EC report one. The enforcement consultants have reviewed reports associated with G4 fixed gear marking and entanglement risk reduction, limited entry follow on actions, attachment to, and have the following comments. Regarding fixed gear marking and entanglement risk reduction, the EC is comfortable with the range of alternatives presented under item one, two, four, five. The EC recommends item three, which is marking surface gear only on one end, be dropped for further consideration due to the challenges that would create and enforce enclosed areas. On limited entry fixed gear follow-on, the EC is comfortable with the range of alternatives presented for consideration. 
short and sweet. Thank you. Are there any questions on the report? Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Captain Chadwick. Um, on the, um, I'll, the item three and dropping the um, alternative that would allow just one end to be marked. I know you talked about it on the EC relative to enforcement issues. Did you talk about it relative to any other issues that you see on the water in your experience just with derelict gear or that kind of thing? Yeah, thank you for the question through the vice chair. Again, thank you for the question. Um, in addition to the closed area concern for marking both ends, we we have seen over over the period of the, specifically the directed halibut fishery in two a um, the need for both ends to be marked just for gear recovery. Oftentimes, lines get crossed, gear gets um, separated, and the need to recover that amount of long line gear is is important so having that both ends marked is uh is something that we see that's important and, you know and we we have our coastal crab fishery that has 300 and 500 pot limits off of washington and um some of those crab fisheries are out to 100 fathoms and so those are long individual crab pot lines and so having the long line gear marked in the distance that it is on both ends seems reasonable thank you Further questions? Um, no questions, so thank you, Dan. Thank you. That completes our management and advisory body reports. We'll take us to public comment. We have three signups. We will start with Valerie Phillips. Valerie will be followed by Ben Entignap. Uh, Valerie, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. One second. Let me pull it up here. Thank you, Vice Chairman Hosmer. My name is Valerie Phillips, and I'm the daughter of Tom Falk, who is the owner of a limited entry fixed gear permit with a long line endorsement on the fishing vessel Aquileo, based out of Santa Cruz, California. My father's background in this fishery dates back to the 1980s and includes fishing both pots and long lines in the open access sector and under his limited entry fixed gear permit. I have been working full time with him for 11 years. And although I'm not a permit holder, I do have a vested interest in a limited entry six year fishery and its preservation for generations to come. There's a lot to be said about potential risk reduction measures that can be used in a limited entry fixed year fishery. And that arguably if the entanglement risk be posed warrants such measures. My comments today are not intended to validate the need for these measures, which I believe is debatable, but to urge the council to consider the long line and pot fishing industry as its own unique fishing method and not revert back to state-led risk reduction management plans used in the California Dungeness crab fishery or entertain experimental innovations that have no basis for being environmentally safe or less risky to protected species and the fishermen deploying them. I understand how one outside these two very different fisheries could be led to believe that because both use the vertical line that they could be used in reference to each other but that would be a grave mistake when pertaining to the management and development of table risk reduction measures. I would like to highlight a few key differences between these fisheries, but would like to use my allotted time today to advocate for why I feel line markings should be the first and primary mechanism to reduce entanglement risk posed by the long line and pot fishery. The key differences I feel important to note between crab and table fish fisheries are the amount of vertical lines deployed during an average fishing trip or season, the amount of time critical lines are in the water intended, as well as the key feature of one being a state-led fishery and the other a federally regulated. This last bit is an important aspect because of the geographical boundaries that management plans are intended to cover. I recently read data presented by Oceana that the sable fish pot industry account for 1% of known entanglements, but theor theoretically could account for more since the majority of entanglements are from unknown sources. This is a fact that has left all vertical lines, fisheries, and the agencies governing them vulnerable to recent scrutiny. Because of these facts, I believe line marking should be the first mechanism used to lower this industry's potential entanglement risk. I would like the council to note that in regards to the range of alternatives, I feel marking just the vertical lines and 20 fathom increments would be sufficient in making our stable fish gear identifiable. The range of alternatives that is the method used, these markings are made 
I understand the desire to make these line markings standard, permanent, and uniform. So I strongly disagree with this being done by creating a manufactured line specific to each fishery. My opinion of strongly disagreeing with this alternative of manufactured line being phased in as a means of identifying gear type is centered in the belief that no one should be forced to fish with rope that isn't their choosing. Fishermen have personal preferences in what type of vertical line is best suited for their operation based on strength, size, length of spools, price, and even how the rope feels and stacks into containers. To manufacture rope that every limited entry fixed gear fisherman has to use will create an inequity to all participants. I feel strongly that splicing and a unique twine into vertical lines will be an effective marking method. I would even go as far as being in support of a special colored twine being manufactured for this purpose. Which brings me to my second reason I adamantly oppose the alternative of imposing manufactured vertical lines, cost and timeliness. If the council determines the portion of and distance and type of twine these marks will be made, fishermen can readily implement this action. No matter if a fisherman has just bought all new gear or has worked the same gear for decades, fishermen can do the work to their current gear and know the work they do now is permanent and maintainable. I feel if you would like fishermen to commit to a temporary line marking that is short-lived and that they will have to buy all new vertical lines in the future, there will be more opposition to something that could be so beneficial to the preservation of this fishery. I see the complexity in creating these line markings and recognize the need to determine if the line marking will be universal to the stable fish industry or made to distinguish between sectors and endorsements. I would like the council to consider streamlining the line marking process with the limited entry fixed gear permit fishery by implementing alternative two of item one of the follow on actions, which is to create a universal endorsement for limited entry fixed gear permits. I submitted a written comment to the council to advocate for the need of this action in June. If the endorsements remain as is, I would feel it important to have differentiating colors among limited entry fixed gear sectors. Thank you for your time today. I feel passionately about matters discussed and appreciate the opportunity to be involved in this process. Thank you, Valerie. I'm going to look around to see if there are any questions for Ms. Phillips. Maggie Summer. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair, and thank you, Ms. Phillips, for your testimony. Um, I did not catch the last thing you said um, uh, about colored line for different sectors within the fishery, and I'm, I'm asking because I was listening to the reports provided by our ground fish advisory sub panel and ground fish management team indicating uh, they, they didn't see any need to distinguish between different sectors in terms of line marking just the type of gear used. Um, so I just um, wanted to ask if you could oh. repeat the last thing you said about colored line by sector, and then um, if you have any comments on um, whether you think it would be valuable to be able to distinguish between different sectors, for example, limited entry versus open access within the ground fish fixed gear fishery in terms of Yes. Um, what I had said is, um, if the endorsements remain as is, I would feel it important to have differentiating colors among the limited entry fixed gear sectors. Um, what I meant by that is both open access and limited entry, and even possibly long line and pots differentiation. Um, I believe that if one is getting identified, that that leaves another at a risk to be in, um, clumped into that uh, unknown entanglement sector that is exponentially higher than any of the pot um, entanglement risk. Did that answer your question? Thanks for your answer, yes. Right, thank you. Further questions for Ms. Phillips? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Valerie, for coming forth today and testifying. It's good to see our MREP graduates come forward and do such a good job, to be so clear. So um, my question, you mentioned vertical lines, and I think you were kind of alluding to the, the number of vertical lines that you use in a trip and, and that there was, you know, maybe a, a less than other fisheries or other sectors. And I was just curious, how many vertical lines on an average trip do you deploy? How many would, uh, that, are, that are in your, the, with what you do? Thank you. Um. For our operation, we never have more than four vertical lines deployed at one time. And even so, mainly it's just two. 
often will set our second set right before we pull our um, first. So there is a brief time that there's four vertical lines, but that's our operation as it stands. Uh, follow up, Bob. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, Valerie, I, one other thing I just that occurred to me, and I just wanted to get your opinion on that, was it seems to me when you mark both ends, it, it might lead to less gear conflicts with maybe other gear, like trawl gear, because you can see where the gear is. Has that been your experience, or do you have any comments on that? Yes, that's very accurate. Um, not only for other gear conflicts, but also our boundary lines, um, being able to see that both ends are where we want them to be. Thank you, and thanks for coming to today. Any further questions? I don't see any hands, so thank you again, Valerie. Thank you. Next, next we have uh, Ben Hentignap. Good afternoon, Ben. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm Ben Enticknap representing Oceana. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. We have a comment letter in the briefing book that has the full extent of our comments. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a very important issue, how to reduce entanglements in uh, fisheries here off the West Coast. And I'm, and I'm happy to be with you here today to be able to offer some ideas for developing a range of alternatives. Uh, next slide, please. This is a, a very serious issue. Uh, you know, going back to tw 2012, there have been 333 confirmed entanglements off the West Coast uh, in, in West Coast fisheries. Uh, this is an issue that's across multiple fisheries, net fisheries, various fixed gear fisheries. Um, it's primarily lately been affecting humpback whales, uh, which, next slide, please. Uh -oh. <clears throat> which, which is a big concern because these humpback whales are coming from populations that are threatened or endangered under the Dangerous Species Act. So the breeding population off of Mexico is migrating up the coast to feed in the California current, and that population is threatened under the ESA. The Central American population that, that breeds off of Central America is migrating up to foraging grounds off of California and Oregon, and that population is endangered. Next slide. And this is a big conservation concern because cumulative take levels, for example, of the Central American humpback whale population are exceeding sustainable levels. So cumulative take levels from the, the, the various fisheries that are interacting and catching these whales exceeding uh, potential biological removal. Next slide. And we also know that this is a extremely uh, painful and cruel uh, way to, to die for these whales. 75% of entangled whales that are not successfully, successfully freed ultimately do die. And then it can take up to six months for these animals to die after becoming in, entangled. They drag the gear it reduce, and it reduces their ability to, to feed. Sometimes it's wrapped in their mouth. Sometimes it's wrapped around their fluke or fins where the rope cuts into their flesh uh, and, and becomes infected. And they either end up just drowning or, or dying of their wounds. It's, uh, it's quite serious and painful, and it can take, uh, take months, as you can see from these, the picture here on the left of a whale that was observed off of California in California Dungeness Crab, or I'm sorry, was observed off of Mexico in California Dungeness Crab Gear. Um, and the one from on the right is actually footage from one of those teams trying to, to free an entangled whale. Next slide. And the purpose and need statement really speaks to uh, addressing this unidentified component. So over half of confirmed entanglements off the West Coast are in what's unidentified gear. And that's why we need that gear marking component. Gear markings not, doesn't reduce risk. That's not going to help reduce the number of whales that's entangled. What it's doing is uh, providing some type of accountability so we can better understand the problem of which fisheries are, are encountering these whales. And yes, right now, based on what we know, it's only about 1% of these entanglements are occurring in the sable fish pot fishery. The, the larger problem has been the commercial Dungeons crab fisheries, and the states are really working on that. 
in in California, Oregon, and Washington, all moving forward with take reduction plan or with with you know reduction plans and implementing management measures to try to get a, ahead of this problem. But we also know we we shouldn't be having any entanglements. I mean, really, the goal here should be zero, and I think you would all agree with that. So it's really important here to also identify risk reduction measures for the groundfish fisheries that are also known to take these animals. Next slide. So to that kind of that accountability measure, which is the gear marking, we do support the alternatives that you have uh, for line and buoy marking. This is a really important component for getting an understanding of which fisheries are interacting with the whales, reducing that unidentified risk. What we want is to have line marking that allows a positive attribution. So when it is groundfish fixed gear that you know it's groundfish fixed gear, and when it's not to have a negative attribution to be able to uh, definitively rule it out. So on the, the left in that photo, you see what is basically tape wrapped around the line, and that's a temporary marking uh, to be able to identify the gear. Ideally, we would go to a manufactured line throughout the full length of the line. Sometimes it's only a very small portion of the line that's, that's visible. And so the more frequent the gear, the, the marking is, and the more durable that is being it manufactured versus a, a temporary marking like tape or, or paint, that's going to help improve uh, the ability to identify which fishery is entangling these whales and make that, make that positive attribution or that negative attribution. Next slide, please. And so what we're asking here today really is not, we're not, we're not taking a final action, right? This is developing a range of alternatives. So we're asking for the development of a reasonable range of alternatives to reduce entanglement risk in the groundfish fixed gear fisheries. Right now, what's being offered is one alternative. Alternative one, a voluntary measure. That is not a reasonable range of alternatives. There are other reasonable actions that could be taken. For example, we are asking that you have an alternative that includes time and area closures, right? This is, this is something that's being done in the California ramp program. We know that it could be developed for federal fisheries management when there are times and in areas of increased entanglement risk or observed entanglements to close those areas that are hotspots for these whales. This was also a recommendation from the Endangered Species Work Group uh, that was made to you in, in their June report to the council. So we, we know that this can be done and this could be developed and be a reasonable alternative in this package that you're considering. The other is the, the vertical line reduction. Right now you have this voluntary measure. We're requesting a sub option to make that mandatory. And I know I heard from the EC that they didn't like this alternative, which it might be all the more reason to develop time and area closures, another alternative, right? But I think there's some things that aren't really being considered here, like virtual gear marking. The, these are solvable problems. And it's gonna take some you know, focused attention, leadership by the council and NIMS to help solve these problems. These are solvable problems. These are techn technological problems that can be solved, right? The other one is, is pop-up gear. And we hear kind of this adverse reaction, well, we don't like pop-up gear, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna try it. But this is something that is being developed it's, it's a technological solution. The problem, right, is the rope. Get rid of that rope. How are you going to do that? There are other, other ways to do that. So here's our, our recommendations for alternatives, but we'll go to the next slide for the, the just a little bit more on the pop-up pop gear. So there are different ways to do this. There's a lot of gear manufacturers around the world that are developing pop-up gear to solve this issue of entanglements. It's, an, it's a you know, big issue here on the West Coast. It's a big issue in the Atlantic and other regions of the world. I want to get rid of that rope that's, that's causing that entanglement risk. And so you can have acoustic signals that release uh, a, a float or a spool or an inflatable bag uh, at, at the pot, or there's also timed release mechanisms. And testing happening now for the, in the California Dungeons Crab Fishery, initial EFP, EFP testing is finding 99.7% reliability in to, in re recovering that gear and the price, it's relatively inexpensive. You know, some people are saying, oh, this stuff's way too expensive, $8,000 for a deck box. Well, you know, Subsea Sonics is selling them for 1,300. You know, it's, it, the, the price can come down. These are solvable problems. Uh, and I think there are, you know, people are now are thinking about how could you adapt this for the sablefish fishery. So we'd like to see some encouragement of pop-up gear now. So if you had one line 
uh, with surface gear, you could have pop-up gear on the other end to help address that concern of, of gear loss and then virtual gear markings to help address that issue for, for enforcement. Uh, so th these are things that, that that should be encouraged and developed. And I think you could even do it now without an EFP. You could put pop-up gear on the same side that you had the surface gear and start testing it now. Next slide. And and that just to conclude, you know this this is a solvable issue. Nobody wants to see whale entanglements. It's a conservation concern, and it's going to require a, a, a proactive approach now. We're asking not to just put this off to a, a future take reduction team, that the council will start getting ahead of this now. We know it's a problem uh, and, and we know that it can be solved. So thank you. Are there questions for Ben? Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Ben, for the presentation. Um, I do have some questions. Um, mostly on the pop-up gear, and I haven't uh, heard lately. I do know that it is being tested in the California Dungeness Crab Fishery. And one of the things that I was thinking about as we're thinking about its application to sable fish is if you are aware um, of how deep they're testing it in California. And that, that was one of the things that I was thinking might be more challenging for sable fish than it is for Dungeness Crab, but I also know um, Test, getting it tested is is part of the way of, of getting there. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Hall. That's going to be the big the, the, the big challenge is, is getting uh, the acoustic signal to reach all the way at depths for sablefish, you know, 200 meters, 1,000 meters down versus Dungeness crab, which is, you know, we know is much shallower than that. So that's one of the big challenges. One of the ideas is you could have a rope uh, or a, a buoy and have your pop-up gear suspended in the water column mm. so your the acoustic signal could get further down or or have time released mechanisms as another instead of acoustic signals again what i'm just trying to point is these are these are issues that can be solved it takes you know the the gear designers and manufacturers to sit down and start working on and testing these thank you i have another question if that's okay Go ahead. Thank you. And and I, I agree. I mean, just in the time that we've been working on this in state Dungeness crab fisheries, there's been a lot of changes to pop up gear. And um, uh, so which is an encouraging. And then on the bullet that says it could occur without an EFP. And I don't know if this is a question. This might be a question for NIMPS, but um, because current under current regs, I believe you have to have each end marked. You, you would have to have a EFP, wouldn't you? Because I was thinking the EFP would be an opportunity to try this. And um, anyway, I'll let you answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I, that would be my understanding too. So right now you have to have surface gear on both ends right. of your main line, whether it's pots or a long line. Right. You could have pop-up gear on the line with surface gear to try deploying right. that pop-up gear. And then if it fails, you have your surface gear as, as backup. Thank you. I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions? Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Ben, for being here. Um, I'm curious about the time area closures. We heard from the GAP that they didn't like this, um, but you also recommend it here um, and was noting it was a recommendation. Um, of the Endangered Species Work Group earlier. So I'm wondering if you can just provide a little bit more information about um, how that's been working for California, other areas, or a little bit more about how that works. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Writings. So time and area closures, I, I don't want to be glib. I don't know that any fishermen like time and area closures. <laughs> no one like, no, yes, they don't like it. But it's a, it's a, we know it's a tool for conservation and it's a tool that will re, will will get people out of the areas where humpback whales are are feeding and and migrating, and you want to avoid those periods of of high concentrations. So, for example, the Oregon in the Oregon Dungeness crab fishery, what they're doing is closing waters deeper than forty fathoms to the Dungeness crab fishery starting May one of each year, because of that springtime late spring, early summer is when the highest concentrations of humpbacks are off of the Oregon coast in those in those deeper waters. And in California, my understanding is they do have a risk assessment program where they're constantly checking in, evaluating 
uh, various information from NOAA and from the state on humpback whale concentrations off their coast and using that to, as a trigger for area closures by specific zone. So for example, maybe you have a block area closures that would close during periods of high concentrations or uh, the other one, the other trigger, I think in California is the entanglement, you know, where there are a certain number of identified entanglements confirmed in Dungeons Crab gear or uh, that were unidentified that gets like a partial attribution. So you can come up with a program. There's a model there to be used now um, and apply it appropriately for federal management. Thank you. We'll look around carefully once more. And I see no hand, so thank you, Ben. Thank you for your time. And last we have Georgian Lapham. Welcome back to the table. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Um, like I said, Jorgen Lapham, I have the fishing vessel Michelle Ann out of Newport. And I just, I don't have any exactly planned out way to go about this, but I wanted to uh, demonstrate how successful the fishery that I'm involved in, uh, long lining sable fish pots, has been at avoiding whales. I've hauled gear from off of Ensenada, Mexico, the US. Uh, Mexico border goes southwest out into the ocean and you can get down there pretty far. I've hauled uh, long line pot sets there in January and I've hauled long line pot sets um, off of the Straits of Juan de Fuca in just a few months later. And a conservative estimate of 2,500 sets in the last 13 or 14 years that I've been doing it. And I have not had an interaction with my gear with a whale. We've seen plenty of whales and we haven't had that interaction. Um, I wanna roll this into like uh, the best practices that we've been talking about. Like we as a business don't want to interact with anything but the sable fish. So we do everything we can to avoid all of these other things. And it would be really helpful to go down the road of a best practices with the council's help um, to try to disseminate the ways that we've avoided interacting with whales. Um, one of those things to share a story that uh, Alaska allowed pots finally in their long line fishery. And uh, several people got a hold of me because of uh, our experience using pots and asked, you know, how to go about doing this. And I helped them set things up. And on a long line boat, when you set hooks, you, you know, you put on a shot or another shot and the guy's yelling from the wheelhouse and maybe it's a little deeper than I thought. So put an extra one on there and you end up with floating line on the surface. And so in, in talking to these guys, I said, Hey, one thing we do is we never leave slack line. We short line our gear. And so the, the vertical line in the water is as straight as we can get it. There's a weight hanging off the bottom. Oh no, no, we can't do that. We'll sink our buoys. I said, just try it. You got two ends, go get the other end. And holy cow, it works. Not only does it work to avoid entanglements, I hope, but it makes it a lot easier for them to recover their gear because it's in the same spot they left it. You know, there's less of a watch circle, we call it, that the gear does um, in the current and the wind. And it um, makes it easier for other vessels to avoid your gear because there isn't anything floating on the surface. There's none of that um, extra. So also in the best practices guide would be um, what we talked about line marking and a uh, certain colored line or however we can go down this road. I understand the need to mark the line and identify where this entanglements are coming from. And in my experience, we've used, you know, when I got the boat, the line that came with it, the gear that came with it was probably half my age at that point, you know, 15, 12 or 15 years old. And we use uh, three different methods for marking the line for our own purposes to identify where we are at on the ground line and how deep we can go with it. Uh, we use colored duct tape. It lasts a few years. We use colored twine. It lasts as long as it'll stay in there. Sometimes it comes out. And one of the things I remembered yesterday is we used to use a, a webbing strap, a, a piece of webbing strap similar to a seatbelt tucked in there. It was red in color and the color lasted and the strap lasted. I mean, that, like I said, that was probably 12 years that that lasted. So full circle back to maybe we can get to a colored line at some point. There's a lot of other um, 
fisheries that are vying for that. There's only so many colors in the rainbow, but in order to expedite uh, marking our line, maybe we could go down the road of um, getting a best practices guide out there with options for people to do, like I mentioned. Um, I don't know if there was anything else I wanted to cover. I, I think that's it for my public testimony for now. And I wanted to follow up on a question that was asked while I was up here earlier, if I, if I may. As far as the availability of the colored line, I wanted to share a quick story. I went and asked I, I get my line from two different sources and I asked one source, I said, Hey, what about this coming down on us? And we might need this specific line. And he brought up the fact that there would be, if one manufacturer made a certain color line, the only other manufacturer won't make that same colored line because of copyright infringement. So there there's an issue. There's several issues with the colored line, not being one of them. And then also the fact that every fisherman, there's only so many sizes, but not everybody uses the same size line. And the lead time being eight to 10 months for my manufacturer to get me a custom line. So I hope that answers your questions. Thank you very much. Are there further questions? Mark Gorelnik. Okay, thanks for your uh, testimony. Um, could you repeat again the reason why um, manufacturers won't compete against each other for production of a similar colored line? If I may, um, it's if a manufacturer makes a custom line for a customer, his competitor is reluctant to make that same color because of infringement. Like I, it was given to me as a copyright infringement. I don't think they have a copyright on the color of the line, but it's a competition between a very, in a very small industry with only a few manufacturers. Thank you. Chair Penninger. Well, uh, thanks for coming for us. Um, talking about the lack of slack line as being the, the, the key to not catching whales, that certainly sounds like the, it works. Um, you said you short line it, but do you also put a club weight part way down so it keeps the line tight? Also, and through the chair. Uh, yes, yeah, that's exactly what we do. You know, if if we're in 640 fathoms, there's a weight hanging at 600 fathoms, and it's 70 pounds. Uh, we use a standard A4 buoy as our diver buoy, and that's 70 pound weight. Imagine an A4 buoy is this big, and if you fill that with water, that's as much flotation as that buoy has. So it's a lot more than 70 pounds. You know that the A4 buoy floats our 70 pound weights. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because I've been thinking about that. It seems like that would be a, I've heard anybody talk about that. So it's, it's interesting you come up and mention that. And have you mentioned that to anybody in this process before today? Uh, I, I had mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, cause Paul Clampett, the, the one person that had the real aha moment was Paul Clampett's son, Ben, like, Hey, you can do this and you're not going to lose your gear and it will help you in a multitude of ways. And, you know, Paul and Ben both came back and said, hey, that's a, that's a really good idea. I said, tell everybody you know, please. <laughs> well, I got something to certainly consider. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. All right. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Bob, you for coming back up. And uh, good to see you here today. i curious, I, I'd asked you too about cost difference. Have you given the information of like your standard line that you use that everybody probably else uses too, and the difference of when you order a custom line, uh, what, what's, you have any idea of what the difference in cost is? Nice, sir. Uh, there as, is no cost difference, but there's a minimum amount you have to order. That it was, you know, the last time I ordered a ground line, I asked for a different color and there was a minimum of eight coils, uh, coil being a thousand fathoms. So that's a significant amount when you're talking about Sorry, a coil is 400 fathoms. It was 3,200 fathoms line total to get a custom color. And just a follow up. I, I, you probably heard me ask Valerie about uh, one of the previous testifiers about the two markings, two both ends, and and possible gear conflicts with other mobile gear and other other gear. And it, do, you, do you? What are your thoughts on that, Vice Chair? Um, I hesitate to say that in reality, there are fishery participants that use one end. 
And um, to my knowledge, it hasn't contributed to any kind of negative interaction, uh, especially when there's a high traffic area. That's one less thing to run into, you know, especially in a transit area with ships, tugs, you know, they would rather see one in than two in because if they see one, they'll veer off one way and all of a sudden there's another. Um, but in other areas, especially um, with the Hake fleet, the Midwater fleet, it's, it's a really good idea. And the other thing uh, that's unfortunately not allowed technically is the AIS buoys. Those, you know, using, there's a time and a place for everything. And that's where I think a, a best practices guide would be helpful for the entire industry. Thank you, Paul. I, I was one of those whiting trawlers that, uh, and it was really useful to have a, a buoy on each end you knew how to avoid mm -hmm. because when you're towing a big net, it's easy to, we don't want to interact. So anyhow, thank you so much. Good information. Is there Krista Svensson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, one quick question. You uh, started your testimony talking about how many sets you'd made and that you had not had any interactions. Um, but I'm just curious, have you lost gear during that time frame, um, which could account for interactions that you obviously weren't aware of? To Mr. Um, I was trying to come up with in my head before I came up here with a, a number. I remember one specific trip where we we hauled somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 sets and we had to grapple seven, seven of them back. Um, nobody wants to lose gear. The, the idea that um, the gear will just disappear and we kind of go on with our lives. That's, it's a huge hit when we lose gear. Um, I have lost one set that I haven't recovered in my career. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> and any further questions? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. For Thank you. Your testimony. That concludes our public comment. We are going to, before we get to our council discussion and action, take a break. Um, let's be back here in 15 minutes.
All right, I'm going to channel NFL Football Sunday and give you a two-minute warning. We can begin start to moving back to our seats so we can get back to business. Which is getting nervous here. Right. Thank you all. We've had an uh, excellent presentation overview of the topic um, and some reports and public comment leads us to a discussion. So you've had a little bit of time to digest it. I will look around for the first hand to start the discussion. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I wanted to really appreciate the thorough um, uh, attachment provided by staff with a purpose and need and range of alternatives, uh, as well as the work plan that splits the items into two packages and the tentative schedule that reflects the priority for the gear marking and risk reduction items. Um, this is consistent with the priorities we have expressed previously. And I think the work on uh, developing the um, range of alternatives really sets the council up well to move forward uh, with a very solid position at this point. Uh, just a couple other um, acknowledgements really appreciate and support the GMT's recommendations for uh, analysis um, when, uh, when the analysis for the limited entry fixed gear follow on action component is taken up to attempt to address whether gear specific endorsements are still necessary to limit harvest capacity. Uh, and then I wanted to recognize the enforcement consultants comments on dropping a buoy line and some of the discussion we had uh, in, in public comment on that. Um, you know, I take very seriously concerns about the ability to enforce closed areas uh, and the potential for derelict gear. I also heard uh, some potential benefits of buoys on both ends in terms of operational considerations and that it can depend on specific circumstances. At the same time, you know, we, we are having this discussion because we want to reduce entanglement risk and reducing vertical lines in the water can help. So um, I would support keeping the option of dropping a line in the range of alternatives at this point um, and expect to further explore those trade-offs as we move forward with this package. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Further hands. Try to be fair looking left and right. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. And I just want to echo the appreciation for um, this really helpful attachment too with the information, the presentation today um, also was extremely easy to follow and understandable and um, the gap in GNT reports too. Um, I think I, I just would say a 
agree completely that we're, we're set up well uh, for the discussion this afternoon. In terms of um, line marking, I did have a question for um, Maggie, and this is has to do with, um, this is in um, the GAP report and their question to have more direction from NIMPS about the distance of marking and mark spacing that would be adequate. And just wondered, I think this is a question to protected resources division on how much marking is sufficient to um, uh, would be sufficient. It's an, and I'm asking it because it's a question we're asking in the Dungeness crab fisheries too. Um, how how much of a line needs to be marked to be considered adequate? Maggie Summer. Thank you very much, and um, thank you, Ms. Hall, for the question. Um, you know, I think first I'll, I'll just, again, make a distinction between the Dungeness crab fishery and the sable fish fishery. Um, obviously, we, we know a lot of the, the operational distinctions, um, and there's a lot we don't know about um, entangling gear. Uh, what, at this point, um, what we are, are looking for, and I guess let me just say up front, we don't at this point, I don't have a specific distance, for example, of line to, that must be marked to provide um, or a specific interval between marks. Um, we are, we recognize the importance of feasibility in this and some practical considerations. We want to make sure that whatever we end up with um, does provide um, a significant improvement in our ability to attribute entang observed entanglements to specific gear types. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we are taking into account uh, some of the, the practical considerations. So at this stage, what we were really looking for is to hear from the gap and from industry. Um, and I appreciate some of the comments that they have provided on some of the, the means and, and methods and um, what would be feasible. And we will continue to work with the council through this process to um, evaluate proposals for line marking distance and intervals. Thank you. Right, thank you. Further discussion, Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, first, I'd like to just say thank you for the staff report and the presentation today. I found them to be outstanding as well, but I'd also like to commend the GMT and the GAP for an amazing amount of content that they got through and provided uh, very clear reports. Um, it, it's been very, very, very helpful. Um, I, I have one question. I think it's gonna be for you, Maggie, relative to some of the comments that we heard today about not just limited um, manufacturing companies that make this line, but also just a limited amount of line that's being made, period, or that it may be custom orders only. Um, in looking at the line marking uh, alternative three and the discussion about transi transitioning from temporary methods of line marking to the manufactured line, is the intent here for it to be um, only manufactured line in the future or will there always be the flexibility to go back to some sort of temporary marking? And I ask that specifically in light of some of the concerns we heard about availability of getting it. Seems like it would be reasonable to, to leave some kind of backstop in an event of that kind of situation moving forward. Thank you. Maggie Summer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Ms. McKnight, for the question. Um, you know, certainly, the, the bottom line here is that we, we want the line to be marked. So maybe working backwards from the end of your question, um, we want to make sure that there is always some a feasible option for, uh, for line to be marked. Even, for example, if we were um, in, if permanent marking regulation or requirements were in effect for manufactured colored line, and that was not available. Um, I think all of that is, is still to be determined. 
I think we are um, early in the process. We are still working through, you know, we're still learning and working through our understanding of some of the aspects of this issue, some of the logistical and, and manufacturing and procurement constraints that we have heard raised here today. Um, you know, I understand there's probably been a lot of um, thought and discussion put into this by the states in particular as they have gone through this with um, Dungeness crab gear marking ahead of, of um, our process and our timeline and certainly without my involvement. So there's probably a lot of knowledge out there too that, that I don't have. But I think to answer your question, um, I think it's too early to say whether the certain end point at this time is that it must be manufactured colored line. We will be looking to flesh that out further through this process. Thank you. Follow up. Yeah, if I may. Please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Maggie. That that is helpful. Um, along those same lines, and given that this is early and this is you know moving things forward, I think one thing that is not entirely crystal clear for me is what. It, what meets the, the mark for a regulatory language development versus inclusion in a best practices guide. And so there, there's a little bit of talk ab about the effectiveness and usefulness of a best practice guide. I, I agree that, it, that there is a lot of merit there, um, but having some um, information, I guess, moving forward about if there's some standard or metric that needs to be a distinguishing factor between where something goes would be really helpful to know how we can provide guidance moving forward. So not, not that you have to answer that now, but just a thought moving forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll give you a chance for a response if you want, but you don't have to. Maggie. Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I, I will respond um, briefly. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, regulations need to be enforceable. Um, so it needs to be um, clear and something that's clear and measurable. Um, and I would say it needs to be something that is um, ready to be put into that status. So, um, measures that have been well tested and well developed. So, you know, there, there is some gray area. I want to recognize that. Um, and I appreciate the staff suggestion of a best practices guide and the gap suggestion of, of content for such a guide. I think that's um, a, a good path to, to go down for some of these items. Um, and again, I think which items are appropriate for that. I think we have um, a good range for regulatory alternatives laid out here um, in the staff paper. And then I think there are a number of other things we can continue discussing and, and um, however a best practices guide might end up being developed, um, that process can really work through with industry input on um, things that could be considered to for inclusion in that, which could provide some consistent guidance, consistent guidance to the fleet. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Gorelnik. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Hussmer. I just a brief comment. Um, I know that line that is manufactured in color is one of the one of the alternatives here. And um, there was a comment that perhaps <clears throat> there was uh, manufacturers would not manufacture it for more than one customer based upon uh, intellectual property concerns. Well, as the only IP attorney sitting around the table, I will say that that is not true. I mean, they may choose not to, but it won't because of any legal impediment. And in fact, I think if the National Marine Fisheries Service specifies a color scheme, I think I, I can't imagine uh, uh, manufacturers would have any uh, reluctance to uh, manufacture in those colors. Thank you. Is there further discussion? <clears throat> Chair Penninger. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's always good to mark lines so that when well gets entangled, we know what come from. But um, I think that the, um, the risk reduction here is probably more important. And I think what Poggy had to say in his testimony about the clump weight, keeping the line tight, I'm not sure where we insert that, but I think that there's it's a lot of value to that. It makes sense. 
slack line is what catches whales, I believe, right? And so um, I think it's somewhere in this process we need to maybe incorporate that. I'm not sure where, but uh, I think that's a, that's a that's just a big a common sense, easy way to minimize whale impacts. And I think we ought to you know, incorporate that somewhere in here. I'm not sure how to do it, but um, thank you for Poggy for sharing. And uh, I think I'm not sure of how many people know about that, but it's something that needs nothing else. Voluntary action needs to be taken, it seems like to me. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Looking around, Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I have a question on a different subject, but I did want to just speak in favor of ideas like that, best practices. I know um, we're we're working on tools to reduce entanglement risk and we're moving forward for with that. There's a lot that can be done with these best practices and they're supported by industry. They're using great information like Poggy shared with us that um, others can use. So I don't know how that works, but to the um, extent that we can support that, um, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, my question is about, as we're um, thinking about uh, risk reduction measures and um, the presentation from Oceana, I've been thinking about um, area closures. And my first thought is, um, it'd be helpful to understand where whales and the fixed gear um, fishery co-occur. Where is that a co-occurrence? And then we can focus any type of management measure in those areas. And so I wasn't sure if there's any work. Um, at the Science Center has been um, extremely helpful to um, the Washington Dungeness Crab Fishery in understanding that co-occurrence. And so I wasn't sure if that process has started using logbook data or fishery location data to explore that. And then uh, the second part of my question is, I know we have block area closures that are available to the fixed gear fleet, but I'm, I'm not sure if, um, if it can be used to reduce, reduce bycatch of marine mammals. And that might be a question for NOAA GC. Thank you. So I'll turn to either NIMS or NOAA GC, Maggie or Rose. Maggie Summer will take the first attempt at. I will, thanks, Vice Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Hall, for the questions. Um, we, we don't have BACs for fixed gear in place now. Um, we, you know, they are, will be developed as part of Amendment 32, and um, we, we would need to do some further evaluation to determine um, whether they could be used in, the, in fixed gear fisheries for um, whale interaction related purposes. Executive Director Burden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, just following on uh, our Chairman Pettinger's here question, uh, perhaps a question for Jesse. This might be a, a preference question or just a structuring of the analytical document question. But um, if this council were to desire uh, some further exploration of something like the clump weight and a taut line um, approach, um, is it your opinion it should be added to a range of alternatives or included as a best practices document, or do you have any thoughts on that? Jesse, I think that was to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Burden. Um, good question. Uh, I guess thinking, I kind of think about it like the surface gear discussion so we've been like the surface gear was brought up you know as a we could add it to a range of alternatives it could be a best practice but if it was something that you wanted to specifically look at i don't know how you would exactly write that in a regulation just off the top of my head so that's where i, I maybe lean towards a best practice would be my suggestion so it'd be something we could just scope out as a part of that idea um but in terms of analysis, you know, if you're developing a best practice guide, and I, I would think a lot of that would kind of like 
come down the line later when we're actually working on like issuing the, the best practices guide. So I don't know how much analysis would be incorporated at this point, if that makes sense. Thank you. And um, I guess I would take the opportunity to give a little assist and nod to Jesse on that. It, as I think about that, um, we heard, I think it was an A4 buoy and the 70 pound, and if we go to A5 or A3 and how many pounds and how far above the bottom and uh, um, NIPS is uh, thinking about all the regulations there, so best practices sounds good. So, other discussion, Lynn Mattis. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, follow up a little bit on what Heather was just asking about uh, spatial distribution of humpback whales. It seems to me there would also be a temporal component. Um, I know at least off of Oregon, we don't have whales on off of our coast year round, they migrate through. So having, if we're going to look at it, having a seasonal, some seasonal information might be helpful as well. Uh, not necessarily a question, just a suggestion as we move forward with some analysis. Thank you. Further hands, discussion on this topic. And remember, we do need motions. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thinking about the, the perfect world comments, you know, earlier in our agendas, that this isn't a perfect world. We don't know. There's a lot of variables here. And I think leaving some, putting things in regulation is scary because you close the box and you get a, 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 tend to go away from innovation. Or we've heard just today in public testimony some innovation that we didn't hear about before. And I think we need to encourage that. So I'm, I'm a best practices guy. You know, I always say that, you know, if you want something done, tell a fisherman he can't do it and he'll show you how it's done. So just, you know, I think I, I trust our fishermen. We give them the guidelines of what we're looking to achieve. And I think we'll come up with a lot of good ideas. But starting it down the regulatory road, I think puts us in a box and very difficult. We know how difficult it is to change regulations and the time and the cost. So, um, and then understanding with one of the graphics there that we're talking about this particular fishery that's responsible for 1% of the entanglements. And so keeping it in context that, yes, I get zero, but I don't know that we put that zero standard on anything. Otherwise we wouldn't have accidents on freeways. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Chair Penninger. Uh, just a kind of clarification that it's 1% of the known entanglements, but there's 50% we're not sure where they're coming from. So there's that unknown. So. All right. Further. Any motions? Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. I do have a motion. This, um, we're ready to move to that. I believe we are ready. I move the council adopt the following based on the reports by the gap in the GMT. <laughs> Fix gear marking, adopt the purpose and need with proposed changes, with the proposed change to replace the last sentence with action is also needed to improve the effectiveness of the currently required biodegra biodegradable escape mechanisms in pot gear. Adopt the range of alternatives presented in attachment two with the following changes. Under item one, buoy marking, remove alternative two, which is sector and gear specific, Number two, item two, line marking, remove alternative one, which is all of the line from portion of the line marked. Number three, which is also item two, line marking, add a sub option for alternative two method of marking to an include in an interval of at least every 10 fathoms. Number four, item three, add an alternative to the range of alternatives for surface gear limitations 
that includes two options of maximum length, five fathom and 10 fathom. Consider developing a best practices guide. For limited entry fixed gear follow on, adopt the purpose and need presented in attachment two. Adopt the range of alternatives presented in attachment two with the following changes. Number one, item two, fourth permit stacking, remove from the range of alternatives. Number two, item four, permit price reporting, remove alternative one, uh, which is Sablefish endorsed permits only. Thank you, Heather. Um, well, it's long, so I'll ask Sandra to scroll up and just let you peruse that. It, uh, as I followed along, it appeared accurate and complete. Is that correct? Yes, I believe it is. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Lynn Mattis. Go ahead and speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, again, this just goes back to the excellent layout of the um, attachment to um, staff report and the GMT and gap reports, which I think helped uh, walk through this very simply. I think that the range of um, alternatives for both of these items is comprehensive. And also wanted to say, I acknowledge that this is kind of a long motion and it includes both the fixed gear marking and the limited entry follow on actions. But I recognize that they uh, have two different regulatory timelines proposed and um, I understand that. Um, so I'll just kind of go from the start uh, uh, from the gap report um, and the purpose and need under the fixed gear marking and entanglement risk, risk reduction, um, their suggestion um, clarifies the range of alternatives relative to the um, biodegradable es escape panels. Um, under um, item one, buoy marking and alternative two sector and gear, whether that's sector and gear specific, um, this alternative is proposed to be removed. And I think the most critical information is the gear associated with entanglements. Less critical is the sector. I think the gap report described that well. Um, for item two on line marking, um, this removes uh, under the portion of line marked, it removes alternative one, which is all of the line. Um, that just is, is I can see being excessive and and um, extremely costly. Um, under uh, met, this is still item two method of marking. Um, this uh, the GMT did speak to um, removing sub option C, which was marking um, at least every fifty fathom. Uh, this gets at some of my questions to Ms. Summer about how much of the line does need to be marked, and it feels like we're unclear on that at this point. Um, so it's retained for now. Um, I completely appreciate the GAPS report that it is, an, it is a lot. Um, I know um, how how much 50 fathoms is, and so, but I just wanted to retain the flexibility um, by keeping that in at least for now. Um, under item three, the entanglement risk reduction, this adds a new alternative um, that limits the maximum length of the surface gear uh, at the five fathom and ten fathoms. Um, And uh, let's see if I've covered everything here. All right. So moving on to the um, limited entry follow on, there was very few changes to what was proposed in attachment two. Um, 
appreciate the input from the GMT on the analysis uh, relative to the alternatives for limited entry fixed gear permanent endorsements and the exploration um, on capacity um, as under amendment six. Um, removing the fourth permit stacking. I know we have talked with stakeholders a lot about the interest in that um, item over the time uh, during the uh, program review. Um, understand from the gap report and speaking to others that uh, just with the um, the fact that it modifies the three permit owner, own and control limit to four permits that that um, I think is where there's no longer interest in retaining that um, alternative and then uh, per the gap again under item four the permit price reporting uh, removes um, alternative one um, just uh, the gaps expression that it would be important to have owners of all limited entry fixed gear permits um, disclosing that permit price information would be valuable um, and then relative to uh, item six cost recovery um, I know the gap had supported removing sub option two on this and um, my motion does not include removing sub option two, it retains it for now. Um, just uh, under, I think the rationale that the gap provided was, was good, but um, it's not a lot of work. And it's, I think it's important to maybe leave that on for now until we get to PPA or another phase of the, this process. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Are there any questions to the maker of the motion for clarification? I do not see any questions. So I will open the floor then to discussion on the motion. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And thank you, Heather, for putting together the comprehensive motion. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment on the cost recovery Part, um, since we had originally suggested that vessel owner be responsible for paying, um, I wanted to say that uh, we we actually see the logic in the GAPS rationale for having the permit owner be responsible. Um, that that makes sense. Um, I just agree with the um, logic Heather laid out at leaving vessel owner in at this point for analysis, but wanted to say at this point, um, we certainly support the concept of it being permit owner. Thank you. Further discussion? Lynn Mattis. I just wanted to echo the thanks to Ms. Hall, as well as to both the GAP and the GMT for how they out laid out their reports and the discussions they had uh, and the information they provided us. I believe it was very helpful in our process. Uh, so it was just to say thanks to those folks. Thank you. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Heather, for the motion. Um, I will be supporting it. I, I also want to just um, comment that this really harkens from the feasibility workshop that was held earlier this year, where it was very stakeholder driven and uh, amazing input that I feel like it came culminated to this right here. And what I see on the screen is a tremendous amount of consensus with maybe just a few exceptions that um, encompass a, a broader range of, of an ROA. Um, and then just a last comment here is that uh, I do see that this is just the beginning or the tip of an iceberg. There is obviously a lot of work going through state fisheries to develop a, a whole multitude of um, risk entanglement, um, you know, principles and practices. And um, I think that this work is just starting for this council and it will continue to go. But for right now, in this moment in time, what I see on the screen is a great step, a leap forward, not a step. So thank you. Thank you. Scanning the room for additional discussion and not seeing any, I will call the question on this motion. It's on the screen before us here. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. 
Thank you. And with that, um, I have a suspicion that completes at least uh, our general action, but I will look to Jesse to see if there's something else we should do here. We have a few minutes to use up. Mr. Uh, Vice so, Chair. Excuse me, Jesse. Oh. I have a hand over here. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll, I'll take the bait on a little extra time to use up. Um, I just, uh, thanks for the motion, Heather. Um, and uh, I just wanted to add a few comments and thinking about um, like the time area closures that we discussed. Uh, we talked about gathering more data on co-occurrence, um, if and how block area closures could work. Um, noting that this fishery is different than D crab um, and fishes over a much larger amount of physical space and that doing that data gathering could be very helpful. Um, so I hope that it's something we continue to explore and can do some of that thinking and bring some of that data and analysis in so that it can be a tool that we can use in the future. Um, I may be speaking a little bit out of turn, but I'm vaguely familiar with the concept of EcoCast, which is something that was developed at the Southwest Fishery Science Center for HMS fisheries. And I think about those sorts of science and data tools that might be useful in the future for something like this. Um, thinking about pop-up gear, I wanted to appreciate uh, what Ben Entiknap brought to the council and talked about that. Um, pop-up gear is a real trigger topic. <laughs> There's one way to make someone mad at you real quick, say pop-up gear. Um, but I, it, I think it does hold real potential in the future. Um, and I wanted to echo what Ms. Hall said earlier about um, in response to her question and that line of discussion that you don't need an EFP uh, right now to add it to your gear and test it. Uh, um, Poggy said something earlier. I think it's really true that nobody is looking to lose gear. Nobody's trying to do this in any fishery. So if there are innovations out there like pop-up gear or something different than pop-up gear that helps us avoid entanglements, but also just helps us fish better overall, I, I hope that we can help contribute to that development and encourage that to move forward. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to echo what Caroline said. Uh, the states are doing a lot of work on this in the decrab space and thinking creatively and trying to find solutions. And as much as we can take advantage of that moving forward, um, I hope that we do that. Thank you very much. And it is not my intent to close off discussion on this. So in the context of our council action, I'll look around Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a question, an open question to whoever wants to answer it. Um, maybe, uh, maybe Heather. We, we let the, the gap that uh, talked about item number three, including the removal of the base permit designation, which I assume relates to the use of slinky pots. Is, is that, I think, no? Am I missing something? Okay, so that I get that. But uh, well, we didn't include that, so I'm curious. Well, I'm gonna, Jesse is trying to respond. You uh, threw it out as an open question, so you wanna take a shot, Jesse? So the gap was, uh, excuse me, Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Dooley. So the so the gap was supportive of removing the base permit designation, um, which is part of the range of alternatives, um, and that was identified in the tier review as an unnecessary administrative burden. It just is a is a length designation that NIMPS keeps, so it has nothing to do with slinky pots or gear endorsements. We already have duplicative regs that require that a vessel has a permit registered to a sufficient length. Wait, so clarify that. All right, thanks. Further discussion on this agenda item. I'm not seeing any. So Jesse, how did we do? Mr. Vice Chair, y'all did excellent. Um, you adopted a purpose and need a range of alternatives for both fix your marking and entanglement risk reduction and the LE fix your follow on actions. 
We have a lot of good suggestions for things to consider anal- to consider in the analysis and what a best practices guide might be and, and how to incorporate that into the analysis. And so the next time you'll see these items, they'll be in separate packages as you directed in June. And we're scheduled, I think, to be back with a PPA for gear marking in March 2023. And because I forgot at the beginning of my presentation, I just wanted to say a thank you to Maggie Summer and Gretchen Hanchu for their help in developing attachment to and really with the purpose and need developments and figuring out all the line marking nuances. So, but you've completed your action for today. All right. Thank you very much. With that, I will close out this agenda item and return the gavel to our chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer, and uh, I'll turn to Executive Director Burden for any comments about uh, tonight, tomorrow, um, outlook. So, Eric. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, I don't have any comments for us this evening. Okay. Well, job well done, folks. So we're just a little bit past five, but that's okay. And uh, we'll see you bright and early in the morning at eight o'clock. Thank you.